Section 53 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mina Anderson. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 53, Chapter 35. New York, Prostitutes and Houses of Prostitution. Part 1. First Class or Parlor Houses. Luxury, Semi-Refinement, Rate of Board, Dress money lavish extravagance instance of economy means of amusement housekeepers rents estimated receipts management of houses assumed respectability consequences of exactions from prostitutes affection for lovers second class houses streetwalkers drunkenness syphilitic infection third class houses germans sailors ballrooms intoxication fourth class houses repulsive features visitors action of the police first class houses of assignation secrecy and exclusiveness keepers, arrangements, visitors, origin of some houses of assignation, prevalence of intrigue, foreign manners, effects of travel, dress, second-class houses, visitors, prostitutes, arrangements, wine and liquor, third-class houses, kept mistresses sewing and shop girls disease fourth class houses panel houses it will not be out of place here to say somewhat concerning the manner of life among prostitutes how they occupy the time and what facilities they possess for mental or bodily recreation the domestic life of a number of women whose every action is contrary to all the rules of virtue who are living in the constant violation of the law with a daily subsistence contributed by those whose folly or passions make them visitors to their abode cannot but possess considerable interest to all who have followed thus far in this painful task in entering upon the subject the endeavor will be to give such particulars as will enable the reader to form satisfactory conclusions without recording what would merely minister to a prurient curiosity the object is to give information as explicitly as possible without offending the most sensitive delicacy wounding the most refined feelings or unnecessarily parading these poor women before the public eye the subject is invested with such an array of real and palpable horrors as to render unnecessary any endeavor to excite undue emotion by penetrating the mysteries of the saturnalia there is a wide diversity among the various grades of prostitutes in new york the first class are those who reside in what are technically called parlor houses these very seldom leave their abodes unless for the purpose of making purchases of dress jewelry or articles of toilet or taking an afternoon promenade on the fashionable side of broadway excepting when they accompany their lovers or visitors in a ride or to some public place of amusement these utterly repudiate the name of street walkers and very seldom perform any act in public which would expose them to reprobation or attract the attention of the police they assume to be and are in fact the most respectable of their class if any respectability can be associated with so vicious a course being almost invariably young and handsome and always very well dressed they pass through the streets without their real character being suspected by the uninitiated the houses in which this class of courtesans reside are furnished with a lavish display of luxury scarcely in accordance with the dictates 
of good taste however and mostly exhibiting a quantity of magnificent furniture crowded together without taste or judgment for the sake of ostentation the most costly cabinet and upholstery work is freely employed in their decoration particularly in the rooms used as reception parlors large mirrors adorn the walls which are frequently handsomely frescoed and gilt paintings and engravings in rich frames vases and statuettes add their charms carpets of luxurious softness cover the floors while sofas ottomans and easy chairs abound music has its representative in a beautiful pianoforte upon which some professed player is paid a liberal salary to perform even the bedchambers passages halls and stairways are furnished in a similar style in such an abode as this probably dwell from three to ten prostitutes each paying weekly for her board from ten to sixteen dollars exclusive of extras which will be noticed hereafter their active life comprises about twelve or fourteen hours daily ranging from noon to midnight or early morning their visitors are mostly of what may be called the aristocratic class young middle-aged and even old men of property of all callings and professions any one who can command a liberal supply of money is welcome but without this indispensable requisite his company is not sought or appreciated none of the disgusting practices common in houses of a lower grade are met with here there is no palpable obscenity and but little that can outrage propriety of course there is a perfect freedom of manner between prostitutes and visitors but so far as the public eye can penetrate the requirements of common decency are not openly violated profanity as may naturally be expected exists to some extent it is an almost invariable accompaniment of prostitution but even that is divested of its grossness and is not a frequent occurrence there is no bar-room or public drinking place in the house but it is a general custom for each visitor to invite his pro tempore inamorata and her companions to take champagne with him which is supplied by the keeper of the place at the charge of three dollars a bottle as remarked in the preceding chapter excessive drunkenness is rare both prostitutes and keepers trying to suppress it because an intoxicated man would be likely to give them trouble damage their furniture and injure the reputation of the house by means of a small aperture in the front door covered by a wrought iron latticework the candidates for admission can be examined before entrance is given and the door is kept closed against any person who is likely to prove an annoyance as a natural consequence of their position the women exert all their powers of fascination by adopting the latest and most superb fashions in dress and by a very tasteful arrangement of their hair for which purpose a hairdresser visits them every day charging each woman two or three dollars a week for his assistance besides these they practise a thousand other artifices unknown to mere lookers-on in order to secure the favour of their visitors about three-fourths of the courtesans of this grade are natives of the united states and mostly from new england or the middle states some of them are very well educated accomplished musicians and artists are sometimes found among them while others aspire to literature with the greater number much elegance and refinement of manner or a close observance of what may be called the conventionalities of life is seen their income is large but so are their expenses it is no exaggeration to state that their individual receipts very seldom fall short of fifty dollars per week from this amount deduct the sum charged for their board an additional fee which they pay the proprietress for every visitor they entertain the expenses of hair-dressing perfumery etc the cost of their washing which is all done at their own charge away from the house and must be considerable and the remainder will give their expenditure for a dress all are not equally extravagant some seem to consider prostitution a business and act upon the idea of saving as much money as possible in one case a woman asserted that she had seven thousand dollars in the bank which she had accumulated by prostitution in a few years and her statement was confirmed by the captain of police for the district 
The economical ones are generally shrewd, calculating down Easters, who argue that if they save enough during the zenith of their charms to support them when their attractions fail, or to help them establish a house of this description on their own account, they are only doing their duty. Others have dependent relatives whom they support, or illegitimate children whom they maintain and educate, frequently appropriating considerable sums for these purposes in nearly all of them kindness toward the unfortunate of their own sex and grade is a striking trait much as they may quarrel among each other when they are all alike in health let one be visited with sickness or overcome by misfortune and as a general rule their envy or jealousy is forgotten and they freely contribute to her support their means of amusement are limited when they have no visitors they generally indulge in a luxurious indolence for any useful employment such as even sewing or fancy needlework they have but little inclination and their general refuge from ennui is found in reading novels these are not as would be generally supposed works of lascivious character to these they seem to have an objection most probably because their own expertise has proved the fallacies of the highly colored descriptions of the delights of love which abound in such productions to one source of recreation they are extremely partial namely driving in carriages some few miles out of town and they frequently persuade their visitors to indulge them in these rural excursions they are well acquainted with the most pleasant drives and know exactly where to find quiet and retired hotels where all the delicacies of the season can be served in the most approved style if they cannot induce their friends to gratify them in this manner they will endeavor to secure an invitation to take luncheon or oysters at some fashionable saloon dress gay life and excitement seem necessary to their existence and amid all this array of luxurious homes of splendid dresses of comparative affluence the question arises are they happy a moment's consideration will prompt the answer that they cannot be continued indulgence in their course of life tends to obliterate the sense of degradation and makes their career almost second nature but even the most confirmed must at times reflect the memory of what they have been the thought of what they are the dread of what they must be haunt their minds conscience will make itself heard many a poor girl dressed in silks or satins gleaming with jewelry and receiving with a gay smile the lavish compliments of her friend is mentally racked with a keen appreciation of her true position she knows that the world condemns her and her own heart admits the justice of the verdict she knows that he who is so ostentatiously parading his admiration regards her but as a purchased instrument to minister to his gratification she feels that she is emphatically alone in the world and her merry laugh but ill conceals a breaking heart these houses are generally kept by middle-aged women who have themselves passed through the initiatory course of a prostitute's life in some cases they own the real estate and furniture in others they hire or lease the house paying an exorbitant rent often to some wealthy man who considers himself a respectable member of society and provide their own furniture in other cases they rent both house and furniture in one house in this city the enormous sum of nine thousand one hundred dollars is or was at the time of examination paid annually for rent and use of furnishings the owner being a woman who formerly kept the place but who is now living in the enjoyment of a large income in one of the italian cities the following extracts from information obtained on this subject will give you a very good idea of the facts e m pays thirteen hundred dollars per year for rent and use of furniture which is owned by a woman who formerly kept the house m s pays a thousand dollars per year rent and owns the furniture m l owns the house and furniture estimated to be worth fifteen thousand dollars m a t 
pays seven hundred dollars per year rent and owns furniture valued at five thousand dollars j g pays seven hundred dollars per year rent and owns furniture valued at three thousand dollars e t owns the real estate and furniture valued at thirty thousand dollars c g pays eighteen hundred dollars per year rent and owns furniture valued at six thousand dollars m c k pays thirty nine hundred dollars per year for rent and use of furniture c e pays fourteen hundred dollars per annum rent and owns furniture valued at six thousand dollars m b owns the house and furniture valued at fifteen thousand dollars j b pays five hundred and sixty dollars per year rent and owns furniture valued at two thousand dollars e b pays one thousand per year rent and owns furniture valued at three thousand dollars m m owns house and furniture valued at fifteen thousand dollars c c pays eight hundred and fifty dollars per year rent and owns furniture valued at eight thousand dollars m m pays seven hundred and fifty dollars per year rent and owns furniture valued at two thousand dollars m g pays six hundred and twenty five dollars per year rent and owns furniture valued at a thousand dollars v n pays thirteen hundred dollars per year rent and owns furniture valued at three thousand dollars c e pays fourteen hundred dollars per year rent and owns furniture valued at six thousand dollars l c pays one thousand dollars per year rent and owns furniture valued at two thousand dollars a t pays one thousand dollars per year rent and owns furniture valued at three thousand dollars the financial effects of the system of prostitution will furnish a theme for some remarks hereafter these facts are quoted now to explain the expenses connected with first-class houses of course where such outlays are incurred the receipts must correspond the following statement will exhibit the minimum weekly receipts in a house where ten boarders reside board for ten women at sixteen dollars per week each a hundred and sixty dollars fees for visitors say one each day to each woman one dollar each seventy dollars profit from sale of one basket of champagne each day weekly a hundred and sixty eight dollars total three hundred and ninety eight dollars this estimate does not reach the daily average of visitors, and a more correct statement would be board for 10 women at $16 per week each, $160. Fees for visitors, say two each day to each woman, $1 each, $140. Profit from sales of two baskets of champagne each day, weekly, $336. Total, six hundred and sixteen dollars taking the mean of these two calculations will give receipts exceeding twenty six thousand dollars per year or five hundred dollars weekly the cost of maintaining these luxurious establishments in addition to the rent is considerable but still there is a very large excess this is satisfactorily proved by the fact that the women who own the houses in which they conduct their traffic have almost without exception purchased them since they commenced housekeeping and also that many of them own considerable personal property in addition to the real estate one woman is positively affirmed to be worth over one hundred thousand dollars many are reported as worth sums ranging from fifty thousand downward and many more are reputed to be rich but no special amount mentioned the management of many of the houses is confided to a housekeeper acting for the principal who is rarely visible unless specially called for and under this housekeeper are a number of servants varying from three to seven according to the size of the house and the number of boarders it accommodates these servants are almost invariably colored women and no difficulty is ever experienced in obtaining a full complement their wages are liberal their perquisites considerable and their work light 
a neat and well-arranged breakfast is prepared for the lady boarders about eleven or twelve o'clock and their dinner is served about five or six o'clock as a general rule these are only meals supplied them in the course of the day if they require anything more they send out for it or persuade their visitors to escort them to some saloon the proprietors of this class of house assume to be respectable women when they are away from the scene of their business an anecdote and a true one has been related of one of them who on a recent visit to newport so effectually carried out her disguise as to receive the escort of a reverend gentleman a d d of this city to the dinner table and elsewhere with his family he thinking her a most amiable and deeply afflicted widow some of them have private residences uptown in the quiet respectable streets and come to their house of prostitution every forenoon returning at night a portion of them profess to be religious frequently attending some place of worship the better to preserve their mass naturally benevolent as are all women they contribute liberally to charitable objects and freely relieve any indigent persons who may ask their assistance even in political matters they have some weight their resources and connections proving valuable to some aspirant for local distinction who has promised them that he will if elected use all his influence to protect them from annoyance toward the miserable women whose vice is the source of their wealth these proprietors act as interest dictates a girl who has not the tact or disposition to attract visitors is seldom treated with much consideration while one who is successful receives more favors but favors generally speaking of a nature to render her subservient to their wishes such as the loan of money to purchase new and fashionable articles of dress a short credit for her board or some equivalent which will place her under an obligation and render it difficult for her to leave the house they are actuated in this by a desire to retain an attractive girl for in addition to the actual cash payments she makes she also possesses the power of inducing her visitors to be liberal in their orders for wine and the profit from its sale about two hundred per cent is an important source of revenue the excessive demands made upon the earnings of prostitutes by these women has been productive of a serious social evil many unfortunate girls cannot appreciate the advantages of leading a vicious life for the benefit of a landlady and in self-defense have hired apartments in some private house so as to secure their earnings for themselves this is generally arranged so that two of them engage a suite of rooms say a parlor and two bedrooms representing themselves as virtuous women governesses or seamstresses and frequently as the wives of sailors or men who are in california or some other distant land here they either board themselves or resort to some saloon and to this lodging or to the house of assignation which will be noticed in due course they introduce their visitors it is a fact more than suspected that many prostitutes are living in this manner in our city it is needless to enlarge upon the injurious effects likely to result therefrom before leaving this branch of the subject there is another characteristic of keepers of these houses which must be noticed namely an exaggerated affection for some man to whom they are passionately attached some few of them are professedly living with their husbands but this is an exception to the ordinary rule generally speaking they are the mistresses of some persons upon whom they lavish all their tenderness and for whose gratification they willingly incur any amount of expense some of these individuals are men upon town gamblers or rowdies of the highest class whose noblest aspirations are satisfied by a liberal supply of money they will readily ignore all social virtues for the same consideration it is related as a fact concerning a celebrated brothel keeper in the city that when she was residing in the interior of the state some years since she became desperately enamored of a young man whose friends discovered the connection they removed him to the far west undaunted by the dangers and difficulties which surrounded her she followed him 
and during her journey through the large towns had many offers of protection from men acquainted with her antecedents true to her affection she refused them all and traced her lover to the forests here she remained with him living in a log hut deprived of many of the necessaries and all of the comforts and elegances of life for three years at least infidelity to her love cannot be charged against this woman and is it not a natural conclusion that a heart so sincere and devoted in its attachment could have been led to a more virtuous course had a different social feeling existed toward her and her former transgressions as a general rule the keepers of these first-class houses will not permit the boarders to have the men whom they style their lovers residing with them although they allow them to visit a constant residence is considered as likely to engross too much of the girl's time to the neglect of the interests of the proprietress we come now to the second grade of prostitutes and houses of prostitution many of the women of this rank are those who made their debut in first-class houses but left them when their charms began to fade to some extent they endeavor to carry out the same rules of conduct which govern them while there and generally speaking the management of some portion of the houses of this grade assimilates very much with the former the same privacy being observed though in a less expensive manner in others a marked difference is perceptible and these will now claim attention a longer continuance in the habits of prostitution and the association with a less aristocratic class of visitors has diminished the refinement of the women and imparted to them coarser manners there is not the same desire to assume a virtue if they have it not or the same ambition to make vice seem unlike itself degradation has had its effects upon them and now that they are reduced to a humbler sphere they feel more of the world's pressure and become more daring and reckless in their conduct many of the street walkers and women frequenting theatres are of this class and any one who has ever come in contact with them would have found no difficulty in at once assigning their true position it is right to say here that many of the managers of our best theatres have abolished the third tier so called and if any improper woman visits them she must do so under the assumed garb of respectability and conduct herself accordingly other women in this grade or rather this section of the second grade commence their life of vice in it and as the natural tendency of prostitution is to depress instead of elevating its followers they have very little chance of ever rising beyond their present rank although such instances do occasionally happen the keeper of a first-class house sometimes consenting to receive a boarder from a lower rank if she has only recently commenced prostitution and is sufficiently prepossessing in manners and appearance for this exaltation a great number of foreign-born women are found in this class victims of emigrant boarding-houses or of seduction on board ship during their passage to this country the houses are generally conducted in a similar manner to those of the first class with this distinction that what is costly luxury in the one is replaced by tawdry finery in the other and for expensive mirrors and valuable paintings they substitute cheaper ornamentation their reception rooms are of much inferior finish they also furnish wine and brandy to customers who wish for them drunkenness is more general both with the prostitutes and their visitors and the most revolting scenes are not uncommon profanity is indulged in to a considerable extent and in some places seems the vernacular language the attempts at fascination made by the women are more excessive and frequently vulgar to a degree which while it excites a smile also inspires disgust the general charge for board here will be from six to ten dollars a week rarely reaching the latter figure when evening approaches if there is little or no company in the house the girls resort to the streets 
dressed in their most attractive finery in the expectation of finding some man whom they can induce to accompany them home they are seldom unsuccessful in this search and very frequently repeated several times in the course of the evening others of them visit the third tier of such theatres as will admit them and there exert their charms to secure conquest intercourse with these women is attended with considerable danger professional experience having shown many of them to be infected with syphilis while numbers are connected with dishonest men who would not scruple to rob a stranger if any opportunity offered for the purpose such opportunity being not unfrequently afforded by some arrangement of the woman herself in such places vice presents comparatively few attractions and yet these houses are numerously visited principally by travellers clerks from stores the higher class of mechanics etc some of whom will spend in an evening the earnings of a week the women who preside over these brothels are usually of the strong-minded and frequently of the strong-handed order the latter being those who can by their own strength suppress any riot that may occur without calling in aid from the police and generally calculate to preserve a moderate decorum in their establishments their profits are very large derived not merely from the board money and extras paid by the women but also from the wines and liquors they sell they do not endeavor to screen their own character as do those of the upper class but openly acknowledge that they are and do not hesitate to give their personal attention to the business of the place anxious to accumulate money as rapidly as possible they are not very particular about the means they employ and although they would not allow any positive act of dishonesty to be performed toward a visitor while he was in the house on account of the trouble to which it might subsequently expose them yet they would scarcely consider it their duty to warn him against the proceedings of the men who live as lovers with the prostitutes under their roofs the virtue of these keepers is generally not of a very rigid order and their favored lovers are universally selected from among men of the same character as themselves the meals provided for boarders are served at about the same hours as in the fashionable houses but they lack that neatness and arrangement which a good cook would give the domestic matters being mostly confided to inexperienced servants and frequently to some old prostitutes who are retained at nominal wages to do as much work as they can and in their own style it has been already stated that some of the second-class houses of prostitution are conducted in a similar manner to those of the first and therefore no attempt has been made to give any detailed account of them which would be a mere repetition of what has been once described the lower class have been taken as illustrating the second grade and consequently the account must not be taken as a sweeping condemnation of the whole the next or third grade of prostitutes and houses of prostitution may be found very fully developed in the first police district among the germans in the fourth district where sailors mostly resort and also in the third fifth sixth and fourteenth districts a majority of the women in these districts are of foreign birth the largest proportion being irish and german although rated as third-class houses some of them are equal in all respects and sometimes superior in many to houses of the second class most of the women are young and many of them are very good-looking while the houses particularly those kept by germans are in general conducted very quietly even in those places resorted to by sailors the principal part of any noise which may occur is caused by the boisterous mirth and practical jokes of the visitors themselves the houses are in every sense of the word public places of prostitution and neither women nor keepers seek to disguise the fact in any manner the general argument seeming to be we live by prostitution no matter who knows it there are many distinctive features in the several districts but the first and the fourth will be fair average types of the whole and there we will notice briefly commencing with the german houses in the first district 
here drinking is openly carried on although seldom to such an extent as to cause absolute intoxication there is a public bar-room opening directly from the street where can be obtained lager beer and german wines as well as the usual liquors sold in porter houses this is the reception room of the establishment and a stranger in the city who might walk in to get a glass of lager beer without knowing the character of the place or being aware of the significance of the crimson and white curtains festooned over the windows would find himself followed to the bar by some german girl who would ask him in broken english if he would treat her if he feels inclined to gaze around him and study human nature in this phase he sees that the room is very clean a common sofa one or two settees and a number of chairs are ranged round the walls there is a small table with some german newspapers upon it a piano upon which the proprietor of this bar keeper at intervals performs a national malady and a few prints of engravings complete its furniture two or three girls are in different parts of the room engaged in knitting or sewing for german girls whether virtuous or prostitute seem to have a horror of idleness and even in such a place as this are seldom seen without their work everything bears an unmistakable teutonic appearance from the heavily moustached proprietor or the recently imported barkeeper to the mistress or madame as she is generally called and the women themselves all plainly tell their origin he is surprised at the entire absence of all those noisy elements generally considered inseparable from a low-class house of prostitution he can sit there and smoke his cigar in as much peace as at any hotel in the city and if he once tells a woman he does not wish to have any conversation with her he will scarcely be annoyed again unless he makes the first advances if he thinks proper to enter into conversation with the proprietor he will be certain of a courteous reply and will frequently find him an intelligent and communicative man finally concluding to resist the temptations around him he leaves the place in the most perfect security and without the least fear of being insulted the majority of the girls here have recently arrived in the united states some have embraced this course of life from absolute poverty and friendlessness some have followed it in their own country others have been the victims of seduction and with some the ruling motive seems to have been a desire to speak and be spoken to in their native tongue their pecuniary arrangement with the proprietor for there is almost invariably a man at the head of each establishment is that they shall give him one half of all the money they receive for which he provides them with board and lodging they are not generally intemperate women the light german wines being their principal beverage and although they frequently indulge in profanity yet as it is in their national language it is unintelligible to those who understand only english and the annoyance is consequently restricted they are generally honest in fact it is the testimony of those best qualified to judge that there is very seldom much disturbance and very rarely any dishonesty practiced in this class of brothels it cannot be said that literally there is not much noise for any one who has been in a room where two or three germans of each sex were talking and gesticulating with their characteristic earnestness will be of opinion that they talked quite loud enough but by disturbance is to be understood quarrelling or fighting which sometimes occurs but not very frequently as before remarked a man and his wife are mostly the keepers of such houses the man sometimes with a lad for his assistant attends to the bar-room and takes charge of the money the wife does the cooking and general housework and the girls attend to their own rooms by this division of labor the work is generally done to the satisfaction of all parties and the expenses being light a considerable profit is made there are mostly three or four girls in each house seldom exceeding that number and the rule among housekeepers is to consider any girl an unprofitable acquisition who does not pay them about ten dollars a week their rents are low 
because they have but little room the basement of an ordinary sized house is generally the extent of their accommodation the front part of this forms the bar room and the remainder is partitioned into very small bedrooms there is another feature connected with german prostitution and exhibited in the same neighborhood which has already received a cursory notice on a former page namely their dancing saloons saltatory amusements are carried on more or less in all their houses of prostitution but in these saloons it is considered a respectable business enterprise although the morality of the establishment is at least questionable the ballroom is a large open apartment devoid of all furniture excepting chairs or benches round the walls the musical arrangements generally comprise a piano and violin and the dances are national waltzes and polkas no charge is made for admission and the bar is the only source of revenue the orchestra occasionally appeal to the charitable for assistance and the call is mostly responded to in a liberal manner the business commences in the evening and is invariably discontinued at midnight the places are frequented by very few but germans and order is well maintained end of section fifty three Recording by Mina Anderson Section 54 of The History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mina Anderson. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 54, Chapter 35. New York, Prostitutes and Houses of Prostitution. Part 2 leaving the germans of the first district the reader's attention will now be asked to the brothels of the fourth police district here the principal part of the women are of irish parentage some few are natives of the united states the greater part of the visitors are sailors when a succession of storms which have driven homeward bound vessels off the coast is followed by a fair wind so as to allow them to enter the harbor in large numbers these houses are crowded, and for a few days, or while the sailors' wages last, a very extensive business is carried on. The barroom, as in the case of the German houses, is the reception room, and here may be seen at almost any hour of the day a number of weather-beaten sailors, verifying the truth of the old proverb, which says they resemble two distinct animals in earning and spending their money it matters not who it may be but any one who enters the room is almost sure to be asked to take a drink immediately and if he remains in less than five minutes somebody else will ask him to take another a sailor with cash in his pocket has a decided antipathy to drinking alone and generally invites everyone in the room male and female to partake with him by such a course he very soon gets intoxicated when the girl whom he has honored with his special attention convoys him to bed and leaves him there to sleep himself sober in these houses less neatness is observable than in those just noticed but they have entirely a different class of customers a german in the midst of his pleasures likes to see everything neat and orderly about him a sailor is not particular so that his pleasures are unobstructed. A curious observer, also, does not meet with the same civility. If he comes to spend money, he is welcome. If not, the landlord does not care about his company. Considerable card-playing is practiced, not what may be termed gambling, but for amusement, the stakes being seldom more than intoxicating drinks for the players. There is less noisy rowdyism than might be expected, 
since the men who generally cause such disturbances lack the courage to impose upon a crowd of hard-fisted sailors who are always able and willing to take their own part and resent any interference still occasional quarrels occur among the visitors themselves frequently resulting in a pitched battle the landlord is then called for and his knowledge of his customers enables him speedily to discover the aggressor who always happens to be the man that has the least money and he is forthwith pushed into the street without any ceremony as a kind of peace offering to the rest of the company the landlord is a character in his way he is a man who has been to see himself for no one would be deemed fit to keep a house where sailors resort and is usually a large powerful man by a freemasonry of the craft and by freely joining his visitors whenever they ask him to drink and occasionally treating them in return he is sure of their custom until their wages are all spent and they are obliged to go to sea again the women in these houses use liquor very freely but they are not permitted to get drunk in the daytime if the landlord observes any symptom of intoxication he gives them water instead of gin the next time they are asked to drink as he knows very well his prospects for business would be injured unless the girls were kept sufficiently sober to be on the watch for contingencies or as he phrases it to look out for chances in some of these houses it is the rule that all the money received by the girls is to be given to the landlord who provides them with clothing and necessaries but in others a fixed rate of board six or eight dollars a week is paid and the women retain the surplus in either case it is a very probable business particularly where many girls are kept in one house that we visited in the fourth district the keeper informed us that his expenses amounted to about one hundred and fifty dollars weekly and of course some estimate can be made from this as to the amount of business he transacted the dancing saloons in this neighborhood are not conducted on the platonic principles of the germans they are in fact so many accessories to prostitution and many scenes their witness will not permit description the women residing in the house are there dressed in the most tawdry finery they can command many of them assuming the bloomer costume the band consists of a violin a banjo and a tambourine and whatever is wanting in musical ability is adequately supplied by vigorous execution the bar is very liberally patronized and before midnight drunkenness is the rule and sobriety the exception passing now to the fourth grade of this vice we find prostitution in a most repulsive form the women themselves diseased and dirty the houses redolent of bad rum the prostitutes are the refuse of the other classes who have fallen through the successive gradations on account of disease and drunkenness or they are some of those children of iniquity who born in scenes of vice and squalid misery know nothing of a virtuous or happy course of life destiny seems from their birth to have intended them for vagrants and has planted them so low in the moral scale that they can scarcely hope to rise it would be useless to attempt a specification of the localities of these houses any one who has been through the purlieus of new york city must have observed some of them and it will be quite sufficient to glance at a few of their peculiarities they are generally kept by an old prostitute who gathers around her some of the most debased of her class takes a cheap basement wherever she can obtain possession of one suited to her purpose erects a small bar furnished with three or four bottles of the commonest liquor she can procure partitions off one or two small hovels of bedrooms and forthwith begins housekeeping her arrangements are about as extensive as her preparations she seldom professes to board the girls generally making a charge for every visitor they entertain and giving them the privilege of cooking anything they want these dens are largely patronized by the vilest of the male sex the petty thieves who hang around the public markets stealing from the wagons 
or who haunt the doors of grocery stores and abstract whatever they can reach, as they find them convenient places of concealment and can frequently dispose of their booty by means of the women. Another class of visitors consists of the lowest order of rowdies, who assume a free license to perpetuate any mischief they please, because there is no one to interfere with them. A fatal case of this nature, which occurred but a few months since, will be fresh in the recollection of all citizens. It is dangerous for a stranger to enter a place of this description, for if he does not get his pocket picked by the one, he will most probably be assaulted by the other class of visitors. Upon such establishments, the police are compelled to keep a watchful eye, and although they have no power to enter them except some actual necessity calls for their service, yet they frequently induce a neighbor to make a complaint against the keepers for maintaining a disorderly house, and then, duly armed with a warrant, they enter and arrest everyone found on the premises. The finale of such an experiment at housekeeping as this is very frequently a commitment for vagrancy to Blackwell's Island. The character of the place will be a sufficient proof that syphilis abounds there, and its dangers must be added to those already enumerated. The divisions thus made are presumed to be accurate as far as the distinctive characters of the various grades are concerned, but the lines of demarcation are of course arbitrary. Any attempt to classify so large a social evil must from its very nature be incomplete. And in this case, farther experience or a more extended inquiry would very probably warrant an alteration in the arrangement. But there is another class of whom a few words must be said, namely, those truly wretched beings, the outcasts of the outcasts, in many cases destitute of home or shelter, diseased, starving, and afflicted with an insatiable thirst for ardent spirits, they present most ghastly and heart-rending spectacles, retaining scarcely any vestiges of humanity. These wretched beings can be found clustered round the bars of liquor stores in low neighborhoods, begging for the price of a glass of gin. Much of their time is spent in the prisons on Blackwell's Island, from which they are no sooner released than they return to their old haunts and habits. They can scarcely be called prostitutes, for their aspect is so disgustingly hideous that all feminine characteristics are blotted out, and thoroughly sensual and animalized must he be who could accept their favors. They are, in every sense of the word, outcasts, compelled for the short time they may be in the city, and this is seldom more than a few days at once to eke out a wretched existence by stealing or begging frequently so miserable that they gladly hail the day on which they are returned to prison they present subjects for mournful consideration and the reflection that they are experiencing the degradation to which every prostitute in the city is rapidly tending should be a powerful argument in favor of any remedial measures which can be devised to ameliorate the condition of the frail women of new york and prevent them from falling so far below humanity houses of assignation every resident of new york is aware of the existence of houses used especially as places for the meeting of the sexes with a view to illicit intercourse but so carefully have all particulars respecting them been concealed from the public gaze that very little more than this mere fact is generally known particularly with reference to those of a higher grade secrecy is necessary to their continuance and essential for the maintenance of the social position of their patrons the most exclusive are generally situated in the quietest and most respectable portion of the city they are fitted up neatly and even luxuriously but without any extravagant or gaudy display their arrangements of course do not require reception or sitting rooms and the whole care bestowed upon them is lavished on the bedchambers the appointments of which contain every possible comfort and convenience. 
The keepers of this class of houses are generally very shrewd, quiet, cautious women, who never seek to penetrate into any engagements made by their visitors, who never know any person that enters their house, and from whom it is impossible to obtain information by any means. In fact, it has been said that the keepers and servants around these places have neither eyes, ears, nor tongues. Money is confessedly their object, and as they receive liberal pay, self-interest dictates quietness, because if they adopted any other course, their houses would inevitably become known to the public, which would be an effectual barrier against visitors and result in an entire loss of their customers. Consequently, if a liberal bribe could ever induce treachery, their shrewdness enables them to discern that such an act would at once and forever close their establishment. It will be readily understood that as the intrinsic value of these houses as places for meeting depends upon the secrecy and selectness with which they are operated, in order to carry out this principle fully, arrangements are made with much precision. Two parties are not allowed to meet casually in the halls or staircases. The keeper maintains a strict watch in order that ingress and egress may be free and uninterrupted, and there can be little doubt that the desire to make money on her side and the fascination of illicit passion on the part of her visitor conjointly tend to ensure more actual secrecy than could be obtained by any system of oaths or discipline. In some of the most exclusive, the system is carried to such an extreme that no accommodation will be afforded to parties unless the gentleman has been previously introduced to the proprietress and his character for secrecy and integrity vouched for by some person with whom she is acquainted. This rule is adopted to prevent the possibility of the house becoming known as a place of assignation to anyone who might use his knowledge to the prejudice of the keeper or her visitors. No public women reside in these houses, nor would they be admitted under any pretext, as such a course would attract attention and defeat the purpose contemplated. Many of them are open for months without the knowledge of the neighbors or the police of the district, as visitors very rarely enter or leave together, and to prevent any delay the outer door is generally kept unlocked so that persons pass immediately into the hall where a second door with a bell attached is generally found. The business of these houses is done mainly during the prominent hours of Broadway, say from 11 to 12 to 4 or 5 o'clock. The visitors are confined to the upper walks of life, the men being of all sorts of business, and the women exclusively from our fashionable society. If the mysterious personal advertisements in the daily papers could be understood by the outside world, it would be seen that appointments are not unfrequently made through their agency. Arrangements for a meeting are generally made with the keepers in advance, and at the designated time the parties arrive from different directions and proceed direct to the room which has been already selected. If they wish it, they can obtain wine or refreshments by ringing a bell in their apartment. A majority of the females who visit these places can scarcely be called prostitutes, notwithstanding their undeniable fall from virtue. They sin, but with one individual, and that, in many cases, from positive affection, and in others from the desire of sexual gratification. Whatever may be the motive, it does not concern the keeper of the house, whose only business is to receive the rent of her room which ranges from two or three dollars upward to any amount that policy or the desire to ensure secrecy may dictate. Doubtless, very few of the visitors regard money in their negotiations. Females are very frequently closely veiled when they enter the house so that their features cannot be recognized, as has been illustrated in trials for divorce in this city, especially if the prior arrangements for the meeting have been made by the gentleman. 
if on the other hand the lady takes the preliminary steps she can scarcely be unknown to the proprietors in whose keeping she consequently places her character the unsuspecting moral men of new york will scarcely credit these facts but men of the world know that such meetings and places for meeting are not uncommon it may be objected that the exposure of these mysteries imparts information which may lead the uninitiated into similar practices it is believed that the information here given is not sufficiently definite for this end and certainly nothing could be farther from the design of this work than to aid an immoral purpose but it is a duty to record the general facts in order that our citizens may be aware of the dangers that abound on every side and particularly is it necessary because many of the female visitors are married women who take advantage of the absence of their husbands at business a question will arise who are the women that keep these houses that they cannot have lived as common prostitutes or been the keepers of houses of prostitution is evident in the first place the acquaintances they would have made in either of those avocations would preclude the possibility of their maintaining the inviolable secrecy necessary in a house of assignation and again no female would enter a place of this description the keeper of which would be likely to betray her it is apprehended that some of these houses originate in the following manner in fact we know of more than one that did commence so a female engages in an intrigue which she cannot carry out at her own residence and desiring a place of security for her meetings has an acquaintance with some shrewd woman possibly one who works for her as seamstress or in some other capacity whom she makes partially a confidant she tells her that she is desirous of seeing a gentleman whom for some particular reason she cannot invite to her house and asks if she will accommodate her with a room in which the interview can take place it is not likely that a person who felt under any obligation to her employer would refuse such a request especially for so simple a purpose as a short conversation the meeting accordingly takes place and a handsome present is made her it is frequently repeated until she becomes suspicious and finally satisfied that these interviews are for the purpose of sexual intercourse by this time it has become a question of policy with her she argues that if she refuses to extend any future accommodation she will lose not only a considerable income from the presents but also all employment from the lady she knows that by allowing such meetings she realizes considerably more than she can procure by her daily labor and self-interest is generally strong enough to overcome her scruples she goes on extending her accommodations and enlarging the circle of her visitors until she becomes mistress of a select house of assignation which will be always liberally patronized so long as her power of maintaining the requisite secrecy remains unimpeached some of these women are from distant cities entire strangers in new york except to their immediate customers if they are widows who have children these are invariably educated away from the house from the privacy observed it is very difficult to estimate their receipts which must be large they sometimes degenerate into keepers of houses of public prostitution and then become dangerous members of society on account of the secrets which have been entrusted to them probably some of our ultra fashionable citizens might be enabled to give more particulars of these houses than are here collected what has been stated is gathered from authentic sources and may command implicit belief indeed so trustworthy is the authority that it may be confidently asserted that even fifth avenue and union square are not exempt from these resorts such houses must be regarded as the connecting link between the licentious excesses of the capitals of europe and this city of the new world they are dangerous from their secrecy and exclusiveness as yet they are rare 
and it speaks well for the morals of our upper classes that they are so. It shows that the majority of people in the higher walks of life are untainted. But the course of deterioration has commenced. Will not American good sense and American morality check this base imitation of a foreign custom? The recently avowed sentiments, or rather the resuscitation of sentiments, which were proclaimed years ago respecting the obligations of marriage and the theory of free love, have doubtless increased. The patrons of houses of assignation among our fashionable novel-reading people or weak romantic heads made giddy by the sudden acquisition of wealth. For the last fifteen years, a loose code of morals has been promulgated among us the foreign apostles of which, many of them pretending to nobility, but being in truth mere adventurers, have visited us, and by them, and through their influence, many intrigues have originated. A spice of romance in the American character has induced many to join this movement in search of adventure while a portion of our female society are ardent admirers of everything foreign be it a lord or a lace veil and these delights in an intrigue because it is an exotic the facilities of communication with europe are now so great that american travel on that continent is largely on the increase and perhaps there are at this time in the cities of continental europe more representatives of our society than of any other nation many of our people go there with the laudable desire to improve their minds by general culture or for the study of particular branches of science or art but it is to be regretted that some come back to our shores with ideas calculated to be anything but beneficial to their native country in a social or moral point of view the sons of our staid and solid men go to the capital of the french empire to study medicine apart from the impropriety of this course when there are the same facilities for study here where a few seconds of lightning intercourse will place them in immediate communication with their friends instead of their being separated four thousand miles from parents and guardians does the end justify the means what course do these young men frequently pursue unable to speak the language intelligibly they resort to the acquaintance of a grisette in order to study in her company the language they acquire by this means is at best a vulgar patois but they also obtain a knowledge of intrigue entirely incompatible with the simplicity and purity of our republican institutions a species of male and female diplomacy foreign to the character of our people young ladies too when they return from a foreign tour are more fascinated with the charms and successes of the favored mistress of some european prince or potentate then benefited by the useful solid lessons of travel with them as with the others it is all superficiality superficial when they started superficial while traveling they are still more superficial when they return there are always weak-minded people in this country who will ape foreign manners and to this cause must be assigned the gradual approximation of our fashionable society to the vices of the european capitals their ladylike and gentlemanlike frailties their genteel peccadilloes and affectations the effects of foreign travel upon such persons cannot be but injurious it demands a clear head and a sound heart to decide between the vicious frivolities and the positive good submitted to their notice and with the class mentioned it requires but little judgment to know which will first attract them they must see lord a or count b no matter what valuable opportunities for instruction they miss they must become au fait in the observances of courts and the manners of courtiers no matter what else they leave undone as remedial measures for another evil are elsewhere spoken of this may be an appropriate place to suggest for profound consideration whether it would not be a wise policy to adopt 
some preventative system for this evil. We might establish a phrenological and psychological bureau armed with full powers to examine all persons desiring to travel, so as to ascertain whether they may safely make the grand tour and have sufficient strength of intellect and firmness of principle to resist the vitiating influences and examples which will surround them there so that they may return only with the knowledge of the good and valuable lessons taught but the evils of foreign manners and customs are not imported solely by the travelling class of our own community the political turmoils of europe in the last eight or ten years have thrown among us numerous refugees who have been reared in the hot beds of intrigue and who styling themselves artistes depend upon our unexampled prosperity the increase of our wealth the improvement of our country and our known predilections for foreigners to enable them to make a living and also to establish the same state of morals and manners existing in the cities whence they came the united states are now the great harvest field for art which with science music and poetry aids to improve the mind at the same time these bring with them an excessive devotion to fashion both in dress and manners as the low-necked dress and the lascivious waltz which are so decidedly positive degenerations from our normal state that none but the most superficial will ever copy that we are rapidly introducing many of the most absurd follies and worst vices of europe is a patent fact almost every one can specify acts now tolerated in respectable families which so far from being permitted fifteen years ago would have been thought by our own plain common-sense parents amply sufficient to warrant the exclusion of the offender from the domestic circle and it is an equally conspicuous fact that our social morality is deteriorating in a direct ratio to the introduction of these habits every day makes the system of new york more like that of the most depraved capitals of continental europe and it remains for the good innate sense of the bulk of the american people to say how much farther we shall proceed in this frivolous intriguing and despicable manner of living or whether they will not strive to perpetuate the stern morality of the puritan fathers our great moral safeguard so far and thus put an effectual barrier against the inroads of a torrent which must undermine our whole social fabric and finally crush us beneath the ruins the second class of assignation houses are to a great extent private but not so rigidly exclusive as the others. Their furniture is of the same luxurious style, but of a more gaudy character. Generally, the same routine is observed in regard to entrance as in those of the first class. The principal portion of the females who resort to them are married women, most of whom are from the upper classes, whose sexual passions are not gratified elsewhere, or who resort to this means to obtain more money to expend in dress kept mistresses residing with their lovers as husband and wife in motels or boarding houses whose attachment is not strong enough to keep them faithful to one man occasionally the best class of serving women or shop women or females whose occupations such as milliners artificial florists etc lead them into contact with the fashionable classes it is told on good authority that there are husbands cognizant of the fact that their wives visit such places and who live wholly or in part upon money earned in this way these cases are not supposed to be numerous but it is to be hoped for the credit of our national character that the number will become still smaller a few prostitutes of the upper grades sometimes visit this class of houses they are known to the keeper and she encourages them for the following reason an habitué of the place will make an appointment to visit it at a specified time and he tells the keeper he would wish to meet a female there at the appointed day his wishes are gratified the keeper having acted as negotiator with one of the girls mentioned 
more wine is consumed in these houses than in the strictly select ones, probably from the different class who frequent them. The third-class houses of assignation are not situated in such select parts of the city as are the other two classes. Some of them are managed with much privacy and seclusion, while others are simply houses of public prostitution on a large scale. Their principal female patrons are those prostitutes who have rebelled against the exorbitant charges made by the keepers of fashionable houses, and shop girls who resort to prostitution to augment their income. Many of these live some distance uptown, and any one who is journeying downward in the after part of the day may see numbers of them going to these places in the cars and stages. This is another imitation of French and English systems. Very little disguise is attempted about these third-class houses. Each has a parlor or reception room where a man can have a bottle of wine, and one or two of the girls named will join him. Of course, many couples visit there, but a large number of men go alone, knowing that there are always women in the house. Fast young men about town are in the habit of keeping their mistresses at these houses as more economical than boarding with them at hotels. Considerable disease is propagated in such places, a contingency from which the first and second classes are almost entirely exempt. Business is generally over here in three or four hours, commencing in the dusk of the evening, but it is unquestionably a source of considerable revenue to the keeper, particularly in those cases where she acts as procuress, since in addition to the rent of the room which the man pays, she always receives a present from the woman. There is another or fourth class of assignation houses to which the commonest portion of street walkers take their company, and these may be emphatically described by an old saying, cheap and nasty. Dirty and insufficient accommodations are the equivalent for low prices, and such places are, in the general estimation of connoisseurs, very low and despicable. Notwithstanding this, they thrive and multiply, from which it may safely be inferred that they are profitable in a business point of view, repulsive as they may be in their features and arrangements. Some of them are ingeniously arranged with a view to robbery, and are called panel houses. The plan adopted is somewhat as follows. Some man, generally a countryman, not very well informed in the tricks of the metropolis, meets with a prostitute and agrees to accompany her to an assignation house. She is in league with the panel thieves and therefore introduces her victim to one of their rooms. The apartment seldom contains more furniture than a bed and a chair or lounge with the floor covered with a thick carpet. To make assurance doubly sure, the man himself locks the door by which he enters and when undressing, naturally throws his clothes upon the chair or lounge. The bedstead is placed so that the feet come toward the only apparent door in the room, with one side against the wall and the head and the other side hung with curtains, which the woman carefully draws as soon as the man lies down by her side. At the head of the bed, and of course concealed by the drapery from any one occupying it, is another door, which forms the secret entrance. It is so adroitly arranged and so neatly covered with paper the same as the walls that no one would suspect its existence. The hinges and fastening on the outside are oiled so that no noise can be perceived when it is opened, and the operator steals with cat-like step over the carpet and quietly examines the clothes without alarming the unsuspecting stranger. The thief completes his inspection, appropriates as much as he thinks proper, and the temporary occupant of the apartment resumes his clothes and prepares to leave. If his suspicions are excited by the circumstance that his wallet looks less plethoric than it did, and an examination reveals that some of its contents are missing, he knows not how to account for it. He is perfectly certain that no one has entered that room while he was there, and if he has 
visited much before meeting the girl he concludes that he must have lost some of his money in his career and that the only way is to take the loss contentedly and avoid new york fascinations in the future sometimes the loser has not enough philosophy for this and if he can be certain that his money was right when he entered the room will call the police and thus expose the secret arrangements of the establishment this is comparatively a rare case as most men would rather submit to a pecuniary loss than encounter the trouble and exposure attending a criminal prosecution and the knowledge of this reluctance enables the panel thieves to pursue their operations almost with impunity end of 54 recording by mina anderson Section 55 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mina Anderson. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 55, Chapter 36. New York. Extent, Effects, and Cost of Prostitution. Part 1 number of public prostitutes opinion of chief of police in eighteen fifty six effects on prostitution of commercial panic of eighteen fifty seven extravagant surmises police investigation of may eighteen fifty eight private prostitutes aggregate prostitution visitors from the suburbs of new york strangers proportion of prostitutes to population syphilis danger of infection increase of venereal disease statistics of cases treated in island hospital blackwell's island primary syphilis and its indications cases of venereal disease in public institutions alms house workhouse penitentiary bellevue hospital nursery hospital randall's island emigrants hospital ward's island new york city hospital dispensaries medical colleges king's county hospital brooklyn city hospital seamen's retreat staten island Summary of cases treated in public institutions. Private treatment. Advertisers. Patent medicines. Drug stores. Aggregate of venereal disease. Probabilities of infection. Cost of prostitution. Capital invested in houses of prostitution and assignation, dancing saloons, etc income of prostitutes individual expenses of visitors medical expenses vagrancy and pauper expenses police and judiciary expenses correspondence with leading cities of the united states estimated prostitution throughout the union remarks on tate's prostitution in edinburgh unfounded estimates national statistics of population births education occupation wages pauperism crime breweries and distilleries and nativities the preceding chapters have given a statistical and descriptive account of prostitution in new york before considering what measures can be best applied for the amelioration of its accompanying evils it will be necessary to ascertain the extent of the system, and this inquiry must include the number of abandoned women in the city and the amount of venereal infection propagated through their agency. It has been assumed in these pages that the 2,000 women whose replies form the basis of the statistical tables represent about one-third of the aggregate prostitution of New York. 
This is allowing an increase of 20% during the winter of 1857 to 1858. In consequence of the commercial panic of last autumn and the resulting paralysis of trade and suffering of the laboring community, in the progress of this investigation, it was deemed advisable to consult those whose acquaintance with the details of city life would entitle their opinions to confidence as to the actual number of prostitutes within our limits, and in addition to much information obtained privately, the following correspondence took place with the then Chief of Police. Resident Physician's Office, Blackwell's Island, New York, September 1st, 1856. George W. Matzel, Esquire, Chief of Police. Dear Sir, During the last twenty years, various estimates have been made by different persons, foreigners and natives, interested and not interested, as to the number of prostitutes in the city of New York. It is generally supposed that they reach the large number of twenty-five or thirty thousand. You, sir, have been at the head of the police department of the city for the past fifteen years, while previous to that time you acted, if I mistake not, as one of the police justices of the city. I presume, therefore, that you have a considerable knowledge of prostitution as it exists here, and consequently can give a very correct opinion as to the number of prostitutes in New York City. You will greatly oblige me if, at your earliest leisure, and in any form most convenient to yourself, you will state what you believe to be the total number of prostitutes now in the city. It is proper to add that, with your permission, I intend to publish this letter, with your answer in the report on prostitution which I am preparing, and shall soon have the honor to lay before the public. Yours respectfully, William W. Sanger, Resident Physician, Blackwell's Island. Reply Office of the Chief's Police, New York, December 12, 1856. Dr. William W. Sanger. Dear Sir, I received your letter asking me to express in writing my estimate of the whole number of known public prostitutes in the city of New York. In the absence of any law compelling the registering of public prostitutes, it would be very difficult to testify with accuracy to the exact number of such persons in the city. I have no hesitancy in stating that, in my opinion, they do not number over 5,000 persons, if indeed they reach so high a figure. Having been engaged in public life for many years, my opinion is based on the observations made by me from time to time and from various official reports made to me. You are at liberty to make such use of this answer to your interrogatory as you may deem proper. Very respectfully yours, G. O. W. Mitzel chief of police this communication in addition to the facts gleaned from other sources was amply sufficient to warrant the conclusion that the known public prostitutes in new york did not exceed five thousand in number at the close of the year eighteen fifty six then ensued the summer with its artificial inflation that false prosperity which excites unbounded hopes and stimulates to measureless extravagance followed by the revulsion and panic of the fall and winter. Trade was literally dead. Operatives, never too well paid, were threatened with starvation. Females, particularly, felt the rigid pressures of the times. In many families, the embarrassments of the fathers compelled a reduction of the servants employed, and a large number of domestics were added to the aggregate of that class already out of situations. The occupations of the army, of seamstresses, dressmakers, milliners, and tailoresses were suspended, and their struggles for bread were merged in the general cry for labor. It was, in short, a trying time alike for the sufferers and the observers. But one resort seemed available. The poor workless, houseless, foodless woman must have recourse to prostitution as a means of preserving life. As usual in any time of great excitement, surmise ran actually wild as to the extent of the consequences, and extravagant theories abounded, one gentleman actually stating in a public meeting that a thousand virtuous girls were becoming prostitutes every week through sheer starvation. An assertion so appalling as this is its own refutation. 
It assumes that one woman in every hundred of the female population of New York City, between the ages of 15 and 30 years, became a prostitute every week, and therefore, during the six months of fall and winter, 26,000 women, one-fourth of the inhabitants of the ages named, one in every four of all the women under middle age, would have been forced into vice. The practice of jumping at conclusions upon serious matters like this is much to be reprehended. An exaggerated statement made in the fervor of enthusiasm while advocating a benevolent object must always recoil to the injury of the cause it is intended to promote. It will be necessary only to consider for a moment the financial condition of New York to be convinced that such an increase of prostitution was impossible. It cannot be denied that the number of abandoned women is regulated by the demand, or that the only inducement which could lead virtuous girls to the course alleged must have been the necessity to earn money for subsistence. But this necessity to earn money was felt as strongly by men as by women. The revulsion for a time left a large portion of the community without resources. Merchants, manufacturers, and storekeepers found their receipts inadequate to meet their expenditures. Commercial employees, bookkeepers, clerks, salesmen, and agents were discharged. Mechanics in every branch were without work and consequently without wages. Merchants from other parts of the country had no money to meet their liabilities or make fresh purchases, and therefore did not visit the city as usual. These causes combined to reduce the business of houses of prostitution, and instead of large accessions to the ranks of courtesans, many of this very class were forced to seek a refuge in the public charitable institutions. Hence arose the increase in the denizens of Blackwell's Island, where hospital, almshouse, workhouse, and penitentiary were alike overcrowded. Some of the places vacated by these recipients of elemosionary aid were doubtless filled by new recruits. But the supposition that a thousand were added every week would imply a change in the whole corps every six weeks or a change nearly five times completed during the fall and winter. That female virtue was yielded in many instances cannot, unfortunately, be doubted, but the sufferers did not become public prostitutes. Poor creatures, they surrendered themselves unwillingly to some temporary acquaintance, probably in gratitude for assistance already rendered or anticipating aid to be afforded. There is something truly melancholy, in the consideration that bread had to be purchased at such a price, that the only alternative lay between voluntary dishonor and killing indigence. It is but charity to conclude that the woman who thus acted, if her subsequent course was not a continuous life of abandonment, was impelled by the stern necessity of the times rather than induced by a laxity of moral feeling. Unchaste as she must be admitted, she can scarcely be deemed a prostitute in the ordinary acceptation of the word. The population of New York is now some thirty or forty thousand more than at that time, and female degradation has extended as a natural consequence. Relying upon the estimate of five thousand as correct at the time made, the subsequent augmentation of inhabitants would suppose an addition of about three hundred prostitutes. But to take the wildest scope and assume that the debasement required by hunger degenerated into a habit of confirmed vice, it may be admitted that the number of abandoned women in New York has increased from 5,000 in 1856 to 6,000 in 1858. This is a very liberal estimate, and the total assigned is certainly not too small. How much it may be in excess cannot be said with precision, but in an argument of this nature it is safer to err in the direction of overstating an evil than to be lulled into false security by too flattering a representation. The known public prostitutes of New York are thus presumed to amount to 6,000 at the present day, but to this number exceptions might be taken. To secure farther accuracy, additional evidence was sought. In the month of May 1858, 
the assistance of the board of metropolitan police commissioners was requested and under the direction of its president general james w nye to whom our acknowledgments are respectfully tendered for his courtesy and aid a list of queries was submitted to the inspector of each police precinct below is a copy of the circular with a synopsis of the replies copy office of the metropolitan police commissioners new york may first eighteen fifty eight inspector blank 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 police precinct sir you will please report to this office as early as possible on the questions given below let your answers be full and explicit to the best of your knowledge and belief space is left below each query for the insertion of your replies and you will therefore write them on this sheet and return it without delay one how many houses of prostitution from the most public to the most private are there in your police district two how many houses of assignation are there in your district three how many dancing saloons liquor and large beer stores are there in your district where prostitutes are in the habit of assembling in addition to the known houses of prostitution four how many prostitutes do you suppose reside in your district synopsis of replies precincts reported by houses of prostitution houses of assignation dancing saloons liquor or lager beer stores where prostitutes assemble estimated number of prostitutes precinct one reported by inspector james sylvie houses of prostitution twenty two houses of assignation blank dancing saloons liquor or lager beer stores three estimated number of prostitutes seventy six precinct two reported by inspector hart b weed houses of prostitution one houses of assignation blank dancing saloons liquor or lager beer stores one estimated number of prostitutes two precinct three reported by inspector j a p hopkins houses of prostitution nine houses of assignation blank dancing saloons liquor or lager beer stores blank estimated number of prostitutes twenty six precinct four reported by inspector morris de camp houses of prostitution thirty five houses of assignation thirteen dancing saloons liquor or lager beer stores eight estimated number of prostitutes seven hundred and fifty precinct five inspector henry hutchings houses of prostitution sixty three of assignation seven dancing saloons liquor or lager beer stores forty six estimated number of prostitutes four hundred and twenty precinct six acting inspector lush houses of prostitution fifty two of assignation six dancing saloons liquor or lager beer stores twelve estimated number of prostitutes two hundred and twenty eight precinct seven inspector john cameron houses of prostitution six houses of assignation blank dancing saloons liquor or lager beer stores four estimated number of prostitutes one hundred precinct eight inspector c s turnbull houses of prostitution forty three of assignation fifteen dancing saloons liquor or lager beer stores blank estimated number of prostitutes three hundred precinct nine inspector jacob l sebring houses of prostitution blank of assignation blank dancing saloons liquor or lager beer stores blank estimated number of prostitutes fifty precinct ten inspector t c davis houses of prostitution twenty six of assignation one dancing saloons liquors or lager beer stores four estimated number of prostitutes one hundred
Precinct 11, Inspector Peter Squires, Houses of Prostitution, blank, of Assignation, blank, Dancing Saloons, Liquor, or Lager Beer Stores, 12. Estimated Number of Prostitutes, 50. Precinct 12, Inspector Gallen P. Porter, Houses of Prostitution, blank, of Assignation, blank, Dancing saloons, liquor or lager beer stores, blank. Estimated number of prostitutes, blank. Precinct 13, Inspector Thomas Steers. Houses of prostitution, 15. Of assignation, 4. Dancing saloons, liquor or lager beer stores, 8. Estimated number of prostitutes, 150. Precinct 14, Inspector J. J. Williamson. Houses of Prostitution, 39. Of Assignation, 5. Dancing Saloons, Liquor or Lager Beer Stores, blank. Estimated Number of Prostitutes, 125. Precinct 15, Inspector G. W. Dilkis. Houses of Prostitution, 5. Of Assignation, 19. Dancing saloons, liquor, or lager beer stores. 7. Estimated number of prostitutes, 175. Precinct 16. Inspector Samuel Carpenter. Houses of prostitution, 6. Of assignation, 4. Dancing saloons, liquor, etc. 10. Estimated number of prostitutes, 500. Precinct 17. Inspector J. W. Hart. Houses of Prostitution, 20. Of Assignation, 3. Dancing Saloons, Liquor or Lager Beer Stores, 6. Estimated Number of Prostitutes, 150. Precinct 18. Inspector Theron R. Bennett. Houses of Prostitution, 1. Of Assignation, blank. Dancing Saloons, Liquor or Lager Beer Stores, 3. Estimated number of prostitutes, 250. Precinct 19, Inspector James Bryan. Houses of prostitution, 5. Of assignation, 1. Dancing saloons, liquor or lager beer stores, 2. Estimated number of prostitutes, 30. Precinct 20, Inspector F. M. Curry. Houses of prostitution, 15. Of assignation, 1. Dancing saloons, liquor or lager beer stores, 5. Estimated number of prostitutes, 250. Precinct 21. Inspector Francis Spite. Houses of prostitution, 15. Of assignation, 10. Dancing saloons, liquor or lager beer stores, 6. Estimated number of prostitutes, 75. Precinct 22. Inspector James E. Colter, Houses of Prostitution, blank, of Assignation, blank, Dancing Saloons, Liquor or Lager Beer Stores, 14, Estimated Number of Prostitutes, 50. Totals, Houses of Prostitution, 378, Houses of Assignation, 89, Dancing saloons, liquor or lager beer stores, or prostitutes assemble, 151. Estimated number of prostitutes, 3,857. Upon some of the reports are notes which may be extracted. Inspector Sylvie, 1st District, says in answer to question 4, There are, to my knowledge, 76 common prostitutes living in this precinct. Inspector de Camp, 4th District, says, in answer to question 4, 350 who reside in houses of prostitution, 150 kept mistresses, 150 who reside in the ward and prostitute themselves in this and other wards, and probably 100 occasional prostitutes. Inspector Hutchings, 5th District, in answer to question 3, clarifies the resorts as dancing rooms, 2. Saloons and cigar stores, 31. Lager beer stores, 13. Total, 46. And in answer to question 4, subdivides the prostitutes into whites, 360, 
Lax, 60, 420. Acting Inspector Lush, 6th District, says in answer to question 4, 178 known prostitutes whose names we have, supposed to be at least 50 more residing in the district. Inspector Cameron, 7th District, in answer to question 3, classifies the resorts into lager beer stores, 3, cigar store, 1, 4. And in answer to question 4 says, can give no reliable information, probably 100. Inspector Sebring, 9th District, says in answer to question 1, this precinct does not contain any houses of prostitution that I am aware of, and in reply to question 4, scattered through the precinct, there are probably 50. Inspector Squires, 11th District, says in answer to question 1, none, properly speaking, there are many low drinking places where dissipated persons of both sexes often meet and where no doubt prostitution is sometimes practiced but no regular houses of that character to question three there are about a dozen lager beer saloons where dutch girls of loose character assemble and dance at night they do not remain long in the same place but when driven from one place they locate in another to question four I presume there are about fifty young women and married women, some of whom pass for respectable persons who are in the habit of going across to the 8th, 15th, and other disreputable wards for purposes of prostitution, and some of the lowest of these are even said to visit the 5th ward, but I have never been able to ascertain this fact positively. Inspector Porter, 12th District, says, This precinct, comprising all that portion of the island north of 86th Street, is not infested with any of the evils enumerated in the within questions. Inspector Williamson, 14th District, says, in answer to question 4, I should suppose about 125. Inspector Carpenter, 16th District, says, in answer to question 4, it is generally conceded by those of us who presume to know that there are in this precinct at least five hundred prostitutes of all ages nations grades and colors inspector hart seventeenth district says in answer to question four this being a hard question to answer the answer must be taken as entirely guesswork supposed to be about one hundred and fifty inspector curry twentieth district says in answer to question four probably two or three hundred, but this is mere guesswork. We know there are a great many, some of them very young. Those reports from which no extracts have been made consist simply of figures without any remarks, and are given fully in the synopsis. It will be observed that all of the officers quoted give the number of prostitutes more as a conjecture than a certainty, and although their avocations would lead them to know most of the disreputable women in their several districts, none of them assume to be so thoroughly informed as to be enabled to answer positively to the numbers they give must be added the floating prostitute population of station houses city and district prisons hospitals workhouse almshouse and penitentiary which varies from one thousand to two thousand and may be taken at an average of one thousand five hundred this, with those known to the police, makes a total of 5,357, and the balance of 643, required to raise the number to 6,000, is but a moderate allowance for those who have escaped the eyes of the officers when taking the census. As before remarked, it is better to overestimate than underestimate the abandoned women of the city. But to this number are to be added those whose calling is so effectually disguised as to prevent its being known, those who practice prostitution in addition to some legitimate occupation, and those who resort to illicit pleasures for the indulgence of their passions. To obtain information on these points, some supplementary questions were addressed to the captains of the police at the commencement of this investigation in 1856, and their replies are now submitted. The first inquiry was, how many houses of assignation are there in your district? It was known when this interrogatory was propounded that the secrecy maintained in these places 
would in some instances baffle the keenness not often at fault of our shrewdest police officers and no surprise was felt when the replies indicated that only seventy-four of these houses were known to them reliable information from other sources led to the conviction that this was understated the investigation of may eighteen fifty eight fixes the number at eighty-nine which is also too low and we shall be perfectly justified in estimating the number of houses of assignation in new york at one hundred the next question was what to the best of your belief are the average number of visitors to such houses every twenty-four hours the replies gave an average of six couples to each house every day to an aggregate of six hundred women every twenty-four hours this was followed by the query are all the females who visit these houses of assignation known public prostitutes if not of what class do you suppose or know them to be from the replies it was found that about two-fifths were known as prostitutes the remainder being sewing or shop girls kept mistresses widows and some married women again state your opinion as to how many kept mistresses there are in your district in the twenty-two districts two hundred and sixty-eight were ascertained and the presumption was that there were more the number may be safely taken at four hundred the next question was how many women to the best of your belief and that you have not previously examined are there in your district that obtain a livelihood in whole or in part by prostitution to this the number are stated upon belief for the nature of the question precludes any positive information as about four hundred can you form an opinion as to how many women in your district who are not impelled by necessity prostitute themselves to gratify their passions no definite answers were obtained to this the general suppositions ranging from one-third to one-fourth of those who were not recognized as public prostitutes to what extent in your opinion is prostitution carried on in the tenant houses in your district it is generally admitted that there is some but no calculation can be made with any accuracy many of what may be called private prostitutes live in this class of houses but their visitors would be taken to houses of assignation where the numbers are included in the estimate given it is believed that there are many women who follow prostitution living in nearly all the respectable portions of the city they singly or in couples hire a suite of rooms and under the garb of honest labor sewing etc passes respectable among those living near them it is also known that such as these are the great frequenters of houses of assignation how many such women to the best of your belief are there in your district the officer's reply was that they have ascertained that there are about two hundred but they believe there are many more thus much for the information we have been enabled to collect there are six hundred women who visit these houses of assignation every day of whom two-fifths are known as public prostitutes and the remainder are of other classes it may be assumed that the known prostitutes visit such houses at least once every twenty-four hours which leaves over three hundred visits daily for the others kept mistresses or married women who resort there for the gratification of their passions probably amount to one hundred per day it can scarcely be supposed that such visit houses of assignation more than once a week as a general rule while the others sewing or shop girls etc who resort there to augment their income would probably take this step two or three times per week which would bring their number to about four hundred it thus appears that a very fair estimate of the total number of frail women who are now in new york may be stated as follows known public prostitutes six thousand women who visit houses of assignation for sexual gratification one thousand two hundred and sixty women who visit houses of assignation to augment their income four hundred one half the number of kept mistresses assuming the other half to be included in those who visit houses of assignation two hundred total seven thousand eight hundred and sixty it will be seen that to arrive at this conclusion all are included who are suspected to be lost to virtue although of the number who visit houses of assignation for sexual gratification many are guiltless of promiscuous intercourse this total number falls very far short of the estimates made 
at different times by various persons that there are from twenty to thirty thousand prostitutes in new york city such rash conclusions hastily formed in the excitement of the moment sometimes influenced by the fact that the wish is father to the thought must give place to the result of a careful and searching investigation made for this special purpose the modus operandi of examination in the city rendered it incumbent on those having it in charge to approximate to the facts and is itself a sufficient guarantee of correctness if it were possible to parade the six thousand known public prostitutes in one procession they would make a much larger demonstration than the mere printed words six thousand suggest to the reader it requires a man who is in the habit of seeing large congregations of persons to comprehend at a glance the aggregate implied in this statement place this number of women in line side by side and if each was allowed only twenty-four inches of room they would extend two miles and four hundred and eighty yards let them march up broadway in single file and allow each woman thirty-six inches and that is as little room as possible considering the required space for locomotion and they would reach from the city hall to fortieth street or let them all ride in the ordinary city stages which carry twelve passengers each and it would be necessary to charter five hundred omnibuses for their conveyance these simple illustrations will make the extent of the vice plain to many who could form but an adequate idea from the mere figures yet the estimate will probably appear low to those residents of the city who have been accustomed to believe new york reeking with prostitution in every hole and corner while it would seem excessively large to readers residing in the country for the information of the latter it may be remarked that vicious as manhattan island unquestionably is much as there may be in it to need reform in this manner of prostitution it must not bear all the blame for these six thousand women for although they certainly reside in it a very large number of their visitors do not dwell there brooklyn the village on long island fort hamilton new utrecht flushing and others jersey city hoboken hudson staten island morrisania fordham etc contain numbers of people who transact their daily business in new york but reside in those places in very few of these localities are any prostitutes to be found nor would they be encouraged therein while new york is so close at hand and so easy of access again the strangers flocking into the city from all parts of the world average from five to twenty thousand and upward every day and they must relieve it of some part of this oblique the population of new york at the last census eighteen fifty five was officially stated to be in round numbers six hundred and thirty thousand and the proportionate increase for three years to the extent time will bring it very near seven hundred thousand if illicit intercourse here were carried on only by permanent residents its proportion of public prostitutes would be one to every one hundred and seventeen of the inhabitants but the calculation must include the denizens of the places already enumerated and adding five hundred thousand for them and the number of strangers constantly visiting the city we have a total of one million two hundred thousand persons making the proportion of prostitutes only one in every two hundred including men women and children it is desirable however to ascertain what proportion courtesans bear to the classes who patronize them and the census shows that males above the age of fifteen form about thirty two per cent of the population a wider range might have been taken as it is notorious that many boys under fifteen years old especially among the lower classes practice the vice but assuming that to be the standard there is one prostitute to every sixty-four adult males certainly not a large proportion in a commercial and maritime city it is impossible to form any idea of the proportion of male inhabitants and visitors who encourage houses of prostitution marriage is not always a check to indiscriminate intercourse and professions of religion are often violated for illicit gratification still there are a vast number whom these obligations bind and if they could be exactly ascertained this would make a corresponding difference in the proportions 
as the case now is new york city stands somewhat in the position of a seduced woman and has to endure all the odium attached to the number of prostitutes residing within her limits while her neighbors and strangers who largely participate in the offense are like seducers and escape all censure self-righteously saying how virtuous is our own town or village compared with that sink of iniquity new york it has been already stated that the effect would be if all visitors of new york were moral men and although the remark need not be repeated its appositeness is apparent from the prostitutes within our borders emanates the plague of syphilis and when the number of abandoned women is considered in conjunction with the certainty that each of them is liable at any moment to contract and extend the malady when the probabilities of such extension are viewed in connection with the acknowledged fact that each prostitute in new york receives from one to ten visitors every day instances are known where the maximum exceeds and sometimes doubles the highest number here given there can be no reasonable doubt of the danger of infection nor any surprise that the average life of prostitutes is only four years the actual extent of venereal disease must be the first point of inquiry and here the records of public institutions are of great service the hospitals on blackwell's island under the charge of the governors of the almshouse present the largest array of cases the principal part of which were treated in the penitentiary now island hospital the number of these cases was in eighteen fifty four one thousand five hundred and forty one eighteen fifty five one thousand five hundred seventy nine eighteen fifty six one thousand six hundred and thirty nine eighteen fifty seven two thousand and ninety upon these facts the writer of these pages remarked in his annual report to the board of governors for eighteen fifty six the ratio of venereal disease on the gross number of patients treated in eighteen fifty four was thirty seven and four tenths of a percent the ratio of the same disease in eighteen fifty five was fifty eight and seven tenths of a percent showing an increase in the year eighteen fifty five of twenty one and three tenths per cent the ratio of venereal disease on the gross number of patients treated during eighteen fifty six was seventy three one tenth per cent showing an increase in eighteen fifty six as compared with eighteen fifty five of fourteen four ten per cent or an increase as compared with eighteen fifty four of thirty five seven tenths per cent this steady increase, 21 3 tenths percent in one year and 14 4 tenths percent in the next, or 35 7 tenths percent within two years, may be considered an incontrovertible proof of the progress of this malady in the city of New York. The fact that the people regard the penitentiary hospital as a dernier resort, an institution to which nothing but the direst necessity will compel them to apply, justifies the conclusion that the cases treated are but a fraction of the disease existing and its increase here may be taken as a sure indication of a corresponding or larger increase among the general population again on the same subject in eighteen fifty seven in my last report i took the opportunity to submit to your honorable board facts proving the increase of venereal disease and i then gave the ratio of that malady on the gross number of patients treated as seventy three one tenth per cent in the year eighteen fifty seven the ratio was sixty five two tenths per cent but this reduction of seven nine tenths per cent must be considered in connection with the fact that other diseases much beyond the general average have been treated in the last year so that a larger number of venereal cases will yet show a smaller percentage the cases of Fifthis pulmonalis consumption, which have advanced from 58 in 1856 to 159 in 1857, sufficiently explain that the decrease of venereal affections is apparent and not real. An investigation beyond the statistics upon which these remarks are based, and including the penitentiary hospital, almshouse, workhouse, and penitentiary, had shown that of the total number admitted, to these several institutions fifty nine and a half per cent had suffered or were suffering from venereal disease at the time the inquiry was made 
Of this proportion, 45% of the total were suffering directly at the time of investigation, and 19% were suffering indirectly, or, in non-professional language, were laboring under disease more or less consequent on the syphilitic taint. The following detailed statistics of venereal disease treated in the penitentiary hospital for four years ending December 31, 1857, will be found to embrace many subjects which have been alluded to in these pages. Total number of patients treated 1854, 4058, 1855, 2657, 1856, 2083. 1857, 3,158. Cases of primary syphilis. 1854, 606. 55, 660. 56, 650. 57, 882. Cases of secondary and other forms of syphilis. 1854, 935. 55, 919, 56, 989, 57, 1208. Total of syphilitic diseases, 1854, 1541, 55, 1579, 56, 1639, 57, 2090. Nativities, Natives of United States, 1854, 410, 55, 489, 56, 531, 57, 673. Foreigners, 1854, 1131, 55, 1090, 56, 1108, 57, 1,417. Total, 1854, 1,541. 55, 1,579. 56, 1,639. 57, 2,090. Ages, under 16 years. 1854, 65. 55, 72. 56, 77, 57, 68. From 16 years to 20 years. 1854, 481. 55, 457. 56, 472. 57, 593. From 21 years to 25 years. 1854, 490. 55, 481. 56, 494, 57, 631. From 26 years to 30 years, 1854, 314, 55, 304, 56, 311, 57, 423. From 31 years to 40 years, 1854, 128. 55, 151, 56, 165, 57, 190. From 41 years to 50 years. 1854, 42, 55, 99, 56, 101, 57, 157. From 51 years and upward. 1854, 21, 55, 15, 56, 19, 57, 28. Total, 1854, 1,541, 55, 1,579, 56, 1,639, 57, 2,090. Education, good. 1854, 175, 55, 227, 56, 231, 57, 175. Imperfect. 1854, 787, 
55, 794, 56, 830, 57, 1,161. Uneducated, 1854, 579, 55, 558, 56, 578, 57, 754. Total, 1854, 1,541, 55, 1,579, 56, 1,639, 57, 2,090. From the total number of venereal patients under treatment, 1854, 1,541, 1855, 1,579, 1856, 1,639, 1857, 2,090. Deduct those discharged each year. 1854, 1,253, 55, 1,316, 56, 1,389, 57, 1,710. Leaving to add to the next year's account, 1854, 288, 55, 263, 56, 250, 57, 380. Of the numbers discharged, the following is the result treatment. Cured, 1854, 874, 55, 1051, 56, 1201, 57, 1491. Relieved, 1854, 370, 55, 263, 56, 183, 57, 213. Not relieved, 1854, 7, 55, blank, 56, blank, 57, 1. Died, 1854, 2, 55, 2, 56, 5, 57, 5. Total, 1854, 1,253, 55, 1,316, 56, 1,389, 57, 1,710. Duration of treatment, 5 days and under, 1854, 13, 55, 16, 56, 17, 57, 83. 6 days to 10 days, 1854, 57, 55, 36, 56, 68, 57, 102, 11 days to 20 days, 1854, 80, 55, 59, 56, 81, 57, 131, 21 days to 30 days, 1854, 154, 55, 121, 56, 137, 57, 187, 1 month to 2 months, 1854, 293, 55, 333, 56, 453, 57, 528, 2 months, to three months, 1854, 304, 55, 443, 56, 340, 57, 328, three months to four months, 1854, 220, 55, 245, 56, 207, 57, 260, four months and upward. 1854, 132, 55, 63, 56, 86, 57, 91. Total, 1854, 1253, 55, 1316, 56, 1389, 57, 1710. Some few remarks may be made on the subject of primary syphilis. 
the proportion of the cases of this malady to the gross number of patients treated was in eighteen fifty four fourteen nine tenths per cent eighteen fifty five twenty five two tenths per cent eighteen fifty six thirty one and two tenths of a percent eighteen fifty seven twenty seven and nine tenths of a percent by the term primary syphilis non-professional readers will understand the commencement of the disease or symptoms which are the direct consequence of an impure connection in contradistinction to secondary syphilis which is the comparatively remote result of infection never appearing until after the primary symptoms are well developed and frequently not until all traces of them are removed he will thus see that every case of primary syphilis is in itself a proof of recent intercourse with a diseased person these cases then have increased from fifteen per cent in eighteen fifty four to thirty one and one fourth of a per cent in eighteen fifty six and twenty eight per cent in eighteen fifty seven the remarks recently quoted explain how 882 cases in 1857 make a smaller percentage than 650 in 1856. The fact of this increase compels us to but one conclusion, and that is a very important and suggestive one, namely that commerce with prostitutes in 1857 was attended with nearly twice the risk of infection incurred in 1854, and, of course, the health of abandoned women has deteriorated in the same proportion. This is not said with any wish on the part of the writer to be considered an alarmist. The facts are those which have come under his personal observation. The inference is but a plain and natural deduction. End of section 55. Recording by Mina Anderson, Washington, D.C. Section 56 of The History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Samantha Miles. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 56. Chapter 36. New York extent effects and cost of prostitution part two but the hospital although the chief is not the only institution on blackwell's island where patients are treated for venereal disease the almshouse workhouse and penitentiary have each a share of sufferers from this malady to what extent will be shown by the annex table eighteen fifty four almshouse thirty three 1855, Almshouse 173, 1856, Almshouse 85, 1857, Almshouse 52, 1854, Workhouse 65, 1855, Workhouse 31, 1856, Workhouse 5, 1857, Workhouse 56, Penitentiary 1855, 176, 1856 penitentiary 234 1857 penitentiary 430 bellevue hospital new york city also under charge of the governors of the almshouse is not professedly available to venereal cases by report from the medical board of that institution which will be found in the next chapter it is seen that they estimate not far from ten per cent of the inmates of bellevue hospital are admitted for affections which have their origin remotely in venereal disease these data are sufficient to fix the numbers thus treated as follows year eighteen fifty four total number of patients seven thousand thirty three ten per cent for venereal cases seven hundred three eighteen fifty five six thousand six hundred ninety seven patients six hundred seventy for venereal cases eighteen fifty six six thousand three hundred ninety two patients six hundred thirty nine for venereal cases eighteen fifty seven seven thousand six hundred seventy six patients seven hundred sixty eight for venereal cases 
in regard to the nursery hospital on randall's island it is stated by dr h n whittlesey the resident physician that nine-tenths of all diseases treated in this hospital during the past five years have been of constitutional origin and for the most part hereditary the exact proportion which hereditary syphilis bears to the sum of constitutional depravity cannot be stated with accuracy it is an estimate far within the bounds of probability to assume that one half of the diseases referred to by dr whittlesey are complicated with or by syphilitic taint and the numbers in the nursery hospital will therefore stand as follows here eighteen fifty four total number of patients two thousand a hundred ninety nine fifty per cent for venereal cases a thousand a hundred eighteen fifty five two thousand three hundred ten patients one thousand a hundred fifty five for venereal cases eighteen fifty six a thousand two hundred seventy five patients six hundred thirty eight for venereal cases eighteen fifty seven a thousand four hundred sixty nine patients seven hundred thirty four for venereal cases following the institutions in charge of the governors of the almshouse is the new york state emigrants hospital on wards island new york city under the direction of the commissioners of emigration in the reports whereof the following cases of venereal disease are noted eighteen fifty three six hundred fifty seven eighteen fifty four seven hundred thirty two eighteen fifty five eight hundred fifty six eighteen fifty six five hundred eleven eighteen fifty seven five hundred fifty nine the new york hospital broadway next claims attention the reports for the undermentioned years give the number of venereal cases as follows eighteen fifty two four hundred seventy eight eighteen fifty three three hundred thirty eight eighteen fifty six three hundred seventy two eighteen fifty seven four hundred five these embrace the principal public hospitals of new york there are other institutions such as st luke's hospital st vincent's hospital the jews hospital etc but they are of recent origin and their practice will not form an element in this calculation the dispensaries of the city relieve yearly a large amount of sickness in the new york dispensary centre street the cases of venereal disease are reported as follows eighteen fifty five a thousand a hundred fifty four eighteen fifty six a thousand three hundred ninety three eighteen fifty seven a thousand five hundred eighty this gives an average of about three per cent of all the patients treated the northern dispensary waverley place does not publish any detailed report of the diseases treated and to make an estimate it will be necessary to assume that the proportion is the same as in the new york dispensary namely three per cent by this rule the following results are obtained year total number of patients three per cent for venereal cases eighteen fifty nineteen thousand six hundred fifteen patients five hundred eighty eight for venereal cases eighteen fifty one twenty thousand six hundred eighty patients six hundred twenty for venereal cases eighteen fifty two twenty one thousand nine hundred forty one patients six hundred fifty eight for venereal cases eighteen fifty four fourteen thousand seventy five patients four hundred twenty two for venereal cases eighteen fifty five twelve thousand three hundred seventy eight patients three hundred seventy one for venereal cases eighteen fifty six eleven thousand seven hundred ninety seven patients three hundred fifty four for venereal cases eighteen fifty seven ten thousand eight hundred ninety five patients three hundred twenty seven for venereal cases the eastern dispensary at Lidlow street does not give any detailed report of the diseases treated and the same approximation will be made as previously year total number of patients three per cent for venereal cases eighteen fifty five twenty five thousand six hundred twelve patients seven hundred sixty eight for venereal cases eighteen fifty six twenty one thousand seventeen patients six hundred thirty for venereal cases to the demilt dispensary second avenue the same system of approximation will be applied year total number of patients three per cent for venereal cases eighteen fifty two to fifty three two thousand one hundred ninety seven patients sixty six for venereal cases 
1853 to 54, 9,006 patients, 274 venereal cases. 1854 to 55, 14,034 patients, 421 for venereal cases. 1855 to 56, 20,004 patients, 600 for venereal cases. 1856 to 57, 20,684 patients, 620 for venereal cases. 1857 to 58, 26,785 patients, 803 for venereal cases. The Northwestern Dispensary, 8th Avenue, subjected to the same rule gives year, total number of patients, 3% for venereal cases. 1854, 9,264 patients, 277 for venereal cases. 1855, 11,581 patients, 347 for venereal cases. 1856, 11,477 patients, 344 for venereal cases. Cases of venereal disease are treated in the clinical lectures at the three medical colleges of New York City. From the New York University Medical College, the following report of patients has been obtained. It is undoubtedly much too low an estimate. 1855, 47, 1856, 53, 1857, 69. And assuming that the practice of the others is of the same extent, we have as the venereal cases treated in the three colleges. 1855, 141, 1856, 159, 1857, 207. As many of the patrons of New York houses of ill fame reside out of the city, some further information must be sought beyond our own limits. Without professing to inquire into the public health in all the suburbs previously enumerated, it will be sufficient to take the reports of the superintendents of the poor of King's County to ascertain what amount of syphilitic infection has been treated at the public cost in Brooklyn and its environs. The reports of Dr. Thomas Turner, resident physician of the King's County Hospital, show the following cases. 1853, 165. 1855, 362. 1857, 311. Or about 10% on the total number treated. In the Brooklyn City Hospital, the cases of venereal disease received and treated were in 1854, 158. 1855, 173. 1856, 160. 1857, 186. 1858 to May 1st, 65. It has been already stated that sailors are great patrons of prostitutes, and to obtain any true statement of venereal disease among them, some estimate respecting this class must be made. For this purpose, the reports of Dr. T. Clarkson Moffat physician-in-chief of the Seamen's Retreat, Staten Island, New York, are available. The number of cases treated in the several years is here given. 1854, 657. 1855, 473. 1856, 355. 1857, 365. 1858 to April 1st, 82. This is nearly 24% on the gross number treated. This concludes the published reports of charitable institutions, and the question next arises, what amount of syphilis is treated by physicians in private practice? It is impossible to obtain any reliable data upon this head. The medical board of Bellevue Hospital, composed of some of the leading members of the profession in the city, state that they are unable to say what proportion of the practice among regular and qualified physicians in this city is derived from the treatment of venereal diseases, but they know it is large, and that many receive more from this source than from all other sources together. There are also a very large number of advertising pretenders who offer their services for the treatment of secret diseases, and many drug stores whose main business is derived from a similar source together with an infinity of patent medicines announced and sold as specifics for all venereal maladies. Upon the simple commercial principle of supply and demand, there are so many proofs of the extent of the evil they profess to relieve. Should the number of cases of venereal disease treated in private practice 
by qualified physicians and by advertisers, added to the number of patients who supply themselves with patent or other medicines from drug stores, be regarded as equal to the aggregate of those treated in public institutions, the estimate could not be deemed extravagant. The design is now to ascertain how much venereal disease exists in New York at the present time. To do this it will be necessary to recapitulate the information already given. The cases below are those treated in 1857. Institutions Cases Penitentiary Hospital Blackwell's Island 2090 Almshouse Blackwell's Island 52 Workhouse Blackwell's Island 56 Penitentiary Blackwell's Island 430 Bellevue Hospital New York 768 Nursery Hospital Randall's Island 734 New York State Emigrants Hospital Wards Island 559 New York Hospital Broadway 405 New York Dispensary Center Street 1580 Northern Dispensary Waverly Place 327 Eastern Dispensary Lidlow Street 630 DeMilt Dispensary 2nd Avenue 803 Northwestern Dispensary 8th Avenue 344 Medical Colleges 207 Kings County Hospital Flatbush Long Island 311 Brooklyn City Hospital Brooklyn Long Island 186 Siemens Retreat Staten Island 365 total 9847 Medical men and those acquainted with the internal arrangements of public institutions need not be reminded that the general system of record in hospitals includes only what may be called the prominent malady thus if a man were admitted with a broken limb it would be registered as a fracture and if the same man were suffering indirectly from syphilis at the same time no entry would be made thereof although the physician rendered him every professional assistance towards its cure it is estimated that in this manner a large number of the cases of venereal disease treated in all public institutions except such as make a specialty of those maladies is never recorded elsewhere than on the private case books of the attending physicians more particularly is this the rule in institutions supported wholly or in part by voluntary contributions their benevolent directors have not yet outlived the prejudice which formerly held it almost as disgraceful to treat as to contract syphilis some of the spirit which drove the unhappy men and women so afflicted from civilized life to perish in the fields or woods as in london edinburgh and paris during the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries and at a later period drew from the papal government a bill recognizing the affliction as a direct punishment from the almighty for the sin of incontinence still survives in the present generation the trustees of more than one of the dispensaries in new york have directed their medical officers not to prescribe for such complaints and a hospital in a sister city which receives a yearly grant from public funds has in its printed rules and regulations no person having gonorrhea or syphilis shall be admitted as a charity patient some remarks are made hereafter upon this course and the facts are mentioned now to explain why many cases of venereal disease never appear upon the reports of institutions where patients are treated practically such prohibitions are a dead letter no physician of a public institution applied to by a poor wretch suffering from syphilis could pass him by without attempting to relieve let the orders of the board of trustees be what they may his mission is simply to apply the aid of science and skill to the alleviation of any ailment which may be presented to his notice and his appreciation of the responsibility of his office is too keen to allow him to refuse the prayer of such an applicant hence arises the circumstance that the case is treated under some other name if then the cases recorded are but two-thirds of the aggregate the numbers stand thus cases recorded in public institutions nine thousand eight hundred forty seven cases not recorded four thousand nine hundred twenty three for a total of fourteen thousand seven hundred seventy cases in the year eighteen fifty seven in public institutions the difficulty of forming an opinion as to the extent of venereal disease treated in private practice has been already mentioned 
in the absence of all information collateral circumstances form the only guide to a conclusion the amount is unquestionably very large so large that if its full magnitude could be discovered and announced every reader must be astonished the first consideration to support this view may be found in the army of advertising empirics who make it a source of revenue each of these men must have numerous patients he could not keep up his business without them any practical advertiser knows that to insert an announcement of some twenty or thirty lines every day in at least two daily papers to repeat the same in weekly journals and in addition to this to post handbills on the corner of every street and employ men or boys to deliver them to passengers at steamboat docks ferry landings and railroad depots cannot be done without a considerable outlay whatever its prospective advantages may be no one supposes these charlatans to be actuated by pure disinterested benevolence they crowd the columns of our journals and insult us with their printed announcements in the public thoroughfares simply because it pays these means obtain them customers and whenever this result ceases the announcements will be discontinued while they appear there is positive proof that their issuers are gathering patronage the number of patent medicines always in the market for the cure of secret diseases and which the vendors announce can be sent any distance securely packed and safe from observation affords a corroboration they are made and sold as a business speculation when the reputation diminishes and the public become doubtful if all the virtues of the materia medica are comprised in a single bottle of red drop or unfortunate's friend the manufacture will soon stop and the inventors will resort to some other employment for their capital the extent to which advertising empirics and patent medicines are flourishing is an undeniable proof of the prevalence of the maladies they professedly relieve the legitimate business of drug stores affords another link in the chain of evidence beyond the regular nostrums almost every druggist in the city sells large quantities of medicine for the cure of venereal disease sometimes a man will candidly tell the storekeeper that he has contracted disease and ask him to make up something to cure it at other times a prescription which has been efficacious in a formal attack will be presented or the sufferer has taken counsel among his friends and companions and obtained some infallible recipe from one of them in short there are so many different means taken by persons who have contracted disease that it is impossible to enumerate the various methods which the aid of the drug store may be invoked there are many traditional recipes which can be used without the necessity of purchasing ingredients of a druggist one favorite remedy among the lower classes is pine knot bitters bottles of this preparation are kept for sale in liquor stores particularly in those neighborhoods where prostitutes most do congregate another reason may be submitted why a large amount of venereal disease must be treated privately many of the victims are men who move in a respectable sphere of society and have probably been led to the act which resulted so disastrously in a moment of uncontrollable passion their social position would be irreparably damaged should they enter a public hospital and the desire to retain their status forces them to secrecy even if the natural repugnance of every man to the former course did not exist it is vain to deny that while medical institutions designed for the public good are so managed as to inflict a disgrace upon their inmates their benefits are circumscribed and will never be accepted by any but the poor unfortunates who have no other means of obtaining relief in the case of syphilis this is particularly to be regretted from the nature of the disease every day it is neglected it becomes in a tenfold degree more aggravated and entails proportionate misery in after life if it be assumed that the private cases of venereal disease equal in number those treated in public institutions an aggregate is obtained of more than twenty nine thousand five hundred cases every year if the former are double the number of the latter the sum will be over forty four thousand cases per annum either of these conjectures is below the truth and we are satisfied from professional experience and inquiry that there is no exaggeration in estimating the number of patients treated privately every year for louis venerea as at least quadruple the cases receiving assistance in hospitals and charitable establishments the result is the enormous sum of seventy four thousand cases every year 
if each person suffered only one attack each year this would represent one-sixth of the total population above fifteen years of age but many persons especially among abandoned women and profligate men are infected several times in the course of twelve months and any attempt to say what proportion of individuals are represented in these seventy-four thousand cases would be mere speculation without a particle of conclusive evidence to support it notwithstanding the magnitude of the result a very brief consideration will show that it is not extravagant in addition to the arguments already advanced in this chapter the reader will recollect that in a previous section it has been shown that two out of every five prostitutes in new york confessed the syphilitic taint supposing a girl relinquishes her calling as soon as she becomes aware of being diseased several days may have elapsed before she discovered her condition and during that interval she must have infected every man who had intercourse with her to take the most liberal view it may be conceded that the portion who acknowledged infection were not all suffering from the primary or communicable form many of them had doubtless recovered from that but if only one half were so suffering and each of these infected only one man the result would be three hundred sixty five thousand men diseased every year this is not an exaggerated estimate as was said when alluding to the prostitutes who admitted their contamination there can be no possible suspicion that they would acknowledge sickness if they could avoid doing so and consequently the sick are certainly not overrated it may be objected that the numbers who owned disease were spread over a considerable space of time but this can be met with the fact that the inquiry which produced this result was in progress simultaneously in all parts of the city at the farthest it did not extend three months from the time of commencement to completion and the natural presumption would be that as during that time the health of the women was neither better nor worse than in any other three months of any year the same proportion of diseased women could be found whenever an investigation was made in other words that two out of five prostitutes in new york are diseased the calculation that of these diseased women one half only are affected in a manner which renders them liable to infect their paramours is also a liberal one syphilis when manifested in its secondary stage in the shape of sores eruptions and blotches upon the face or person is so disgusting that no prostitute thus disfigured could retain her place in any brothel unless it was one of the very lowest grade because her appearance would immediately repel all visitors in its primary or local form it is of course concealed from her customers and may be so concealed for a considerable length of time these facts borne in mind is it not almost too liberal an estimate to assume that one half who admit syphilis are suffering in the secondary or palpable form this line of argument supported by the facts given is perfectly justifiable view it in what light you may and proves that the estimate of seventy four thousand cases of venereal disease annually is much too small another course of reasoning may be adopted the time occupied in taking the census is stated at three months this included all the needful preliminary measures the instructions to examiners the conferences with police captains etc and the final proceedings such as arranging and writing out reports allow one-third of the time for these introductory and concluding adjuncts and it will leave about sixty days including sundays or fifty-two working days devoted to the actual inquiry the inquiry resulted in the discovery of syphilis in such a proportion of women as would amount to an aggregate of two thousand on the total number of public prostitutes suppose a disease of two thousand women equally distributed over the fifty-two days or in other words that an average number were infected and confessed it every day and the result is thirty-eight women diseased every twenty-four hours we wish to make this argument as plain as possible and the reader will pardon what may appear needless repetition if this disease existed in each woman for four days before she was conscious of it or it became so troublesome as to force her from her calling and during this interval of four days each woman had intercourse with only one man per day over fifty thousand men would be exposed to the risk almost the certainty of contracting infection in the course of the year as the medico chirurgical review said in the course of a similar argument upon syphilis in london this estimate is ridiculously small in the first place a majority of the women would not abandon their calling in four days after infection 
but would continue it as long as they could possibly submit to the suffering involved. Every resident of New York will remember the excitement caused in the spring of the year 1855 by the arrest of a large number of prostitutes in the public streets, their committal to Blackwell's Island, and their subsequent discharge on writs of abeus corpus on account of informality in the proceedings, but it is not generally known that of those arrested at that time, a very large proportion, certainly more than one half, were suffering from syphilis in its primary form, and many of them in its most inveterate stage. We make this assertion from our own knowledge, the result of a professional examination, and mention the circumstance now, to prove that women will not abandon their calling when they know themselves diseased, so long as they can possibly continue it. If the estimate had been made that each woman continued prostitution for eight days instead of four days after she was infected, it would have been a closer approximation to the truth, and it would have shown over one hundred thousand men exposed to infection every year. Again, the supposition that a prostitute submits to but one act of prostitution every day is ridiculously small. No woman could pay her board, dress, and live in the expensive manner common among the class upon the money she would receive from one visitor daily. Even two visitors is a very low estimate, and four is very far from an unreasonably large one. But suppositions might be multiplied, and the argument extended almost ad infinitum. One more calculation shall be submitted, and then the reader can form his own conclusion upon the question whether the theory of seventy-four thousand cases of venereal disease in New York every year has not been supported by a mass of evidence far more weighty than can ordinarily be adduced to establish a controverted point. It shall be assumed that the thirty-eight women infected every day continue their calling for six days after the appearance of venereal disease and during such six days one half of them shall submit to one, and the other half to two sexual acts daily. Then, in the course of a year, one hundred and twenty-five thousand men would be exposed to contamination. To this add the number of women infected, which, at thirty-eight daily, would amount to nearly thirteen thousand in the year, and a total of one hundred and thirty-eight thousand will be presented, or nearly double the number assumed as a basis for a mark. It is needless to advance farther reasons in support of the soundness of that opinion. Next in order will be the consideration of the amount of money prostitution costs the public, the amount of capital invested in houses of ill fame, and the outlay consequent thereupon presents a total which cannot but surprise all who have not deeply reflected upon the ramifications of the evil. The police investigation of May 1858, quoted a few pages back, gives the total number of houses of prostitution as 378, and the worth of property thus employed can be ascertained with a tolerable degree of accuracy from information obtained in many cases by actual inquiry. The value of real estate where it was owned by the keepers of these houses has been already given in some instances, and in others the rent may be assumed equivalent to 10% per annum upon the cost of the property which is certainly not an undue valuation. Dividing the total number of houses into four classes, the estimate stands as follows. Eighty houses of the first class are estimated, from actual inquiry, to be worth, including real estate and furniture, $13,800 each, or a total of $1,104,000. A hundred houses of the second class are estimated at twenty five per cent less than those of the first class, namely ten thousand three hundred fifty dollars for each, or a total of one million thirty five thousand. A hundred twenty houses of the third class at five thousand dollars each, six hundred thousand. Seventy eight houses of the fourth class at a thousand dollars each, seventy eight thousand. Three hundred seventy eight houses of prostitution are estimated worth. Two million eight hundred seventeen thousand dollars. Add for houses of assignation twenty five houses of the first class at twelve thousand dollars each, three hundred thousand. Twenty five houses of the second class at nine thousand dollars each, two hundred twenty five thousand. Thirty five houses of the third class at five thousand dollars each, a hundred and seventy five thousand. Fifteen houses of the fourth class 
at three thousand dollars each forty five thousand a hundred total for houses of prostitution and assignation three million five hundred sixty two thousand dollars in addition to this are a hundred and fifty one dancing saloons liquor and lodger beer stores mainly dependent upon the custom of prostitutes and their companions any place in which it is possible to carry on either of these businesses must be worth two hundred dollars a year rent which would give a value of two thousand dollars each or a total of three hundred two thousand the necessary stock fixtures and implements cannot be worth less on an average than a hundred dollars in each place this gives a total of fifteen thousand one hundred and an aggregate capital of three million eight hundred seventy nine thousand a hundred dollars invested in the business of prostitution that this is not an extravagant estimate will be admitted by any real estate owner or person acquainted with the value of property in the city especially if he takes into consideration the location of many of the houses and calculates how much more the adjacent lands and buildings would be worth if these resorts of vice and infamy were removed on a scale correspondingly large is the amount of money actually spent upon prostitutes the weekly income of each woman cannot be less than ten dollars many pay much more than that sum for their board alone and in first-class houses it is not uncommon for a prostitute to realize as much as thirty or fifty dollars or upward in a week but if the income is taken at the lowest point the aggregate receipts of six thousand courtesans amount to sixty thousand dollars per week or three million one hundred twenty thousand per year every visitor to a house of prostitution expends more or less money for wines and liquors therein in some cases this outlay will be larger than the cash remuneration given to the women but other men are not so lavish in their hospitality and it is fair to assume that such expenditures amount to two-thirds of the previous item a weekly total of forty thousand dollars or two million eighty thousand dollars spent for intoxicating drinks and houses of prostitution every year in describing the customers of houses of assignation it has already been remarked that in the first class many of the female visitors take that step not for gain but impelled by affection or sexual desire they would spurn the idea of being paid for their company but the houses at which their intrigues are consummated being luxuriously furnished and conducted by women of known discretion and secrecy have a high tariff of prices as one of their features visitors must pay as much there for accommodation as the rent of a room and compensation to a female would amount to in places of less pretension it is assumed that four thousand two hundred visits are paid to houses of assignation every week and for the foregoing reason estimating them to cost the men the same in every instance and fixing that cost at three dollars for each visit this item will amount to twelve thousand six hundred dollars per week or six hundred fifty five thousand two hundred dollars per year the consumption of wine and liquor is small in houses of assignation as compared with houses of prostitution it may probably amount to five thousand dollars per week or two hundred sixty thousand dollars per year the income of the dancing saloons liquor and larger beer stores frequented and mainly supported by prostitutes and their friends cannot be less than thirty dollars per week for each house and as there are a hundred fifty one establishments of that description the aggregate of money dispersed in them will be four thousand five hundred thirty dollars per week or two hundred thirty five thousand five hundred sixty dollars per year these sums exhibit the outlay for the pleasures of prostitution the ensuing items give its penalties of the inmates of the island late the penitentiary hospital in eighteen fifty seven over sixty five per cent were afflicted with venereal disease the total expense of that institution for the year was thirty five thousand dollars and the pro rata amount for syphilitic patients would be twenty two thousand seven hundred fifty dollars during the year or four hundred thirty eight dollars per week bellevue hospital cost to maintain it during eighteen fifty seven seventy thousand dollars in round numbers the medical board say that ten per cent of its inmates are treated for diseases originating in the syphilitic taint and this proportion of the expenses being chargeable to prostitution amounts to seven thousand dollars per year or a hundred thirty five dollars per week the nursery hospital on randall's island cost the city of new york seventeen thousand dollars for maintenance during eighteen fifty seven 
one half its infant patients are treated for diseases resulting from venereal infection and eight thousand five hundred dollars per year or a hundred sixty three dollars per week is a quota of expense caused by this vice and its sequel the number of cases of venereal disease treated in the new york state emigrants hospital on ward's island was six and a half per cent of the total relieved on that island the expenses for eighteen fifty seven were a hundred nine thousand dollars and the share chargeable to prostitution will be seven thousand seventy five dollars per year or a hundred and thirty six dollars per week in the new york city hospital broadway fourteen per cent of the patients during eighteen fifty seven were treated for venereal disease the cost of maintenance for that year was fifty nine thousand dollars and the share caused by prostitution was eight thousand two hundred sixty dollars per year or a hundred and fifty nine dollars per week the cases treated in dispensary practice have been averaged at three per cent throughout the city the yearly expenses of those charities are as follows new york dispensary nine thousand a hundred dollars northern dispensary three thousand five hundred fifty eastern dispensary three thousand seven hundred demilt dispensary five thousand three hundred north western dispensary two thousand six hundred thirty total twenty four thousand two hundred eighty dollars and the proportion chargeable to syphilis must be seven hundred twenty eight dollars per year or fourteen dollars per week very little expense is incurred by the medical colleges in the cases of syphilis treated at their clinical lectures as the relief is generally confined to a prescription or a slight operation and if medicine is supplied in a few cases the amount is so small that in a calculation of this sort it is not worth notice the expenses of the king's county hospital long island for eighteen fifty seven amounted to seventy five thousand three hundred dollars about ten per cent of the patients treated were venereal sufferers and the cost for them amounts to seven thousand five hundred thirty dollars per year or a hundred forty five dollars per week in the brooklyn city hospital the proportion of venereal patients is twenty seven per cent of the aggregate the total annual expenses are seventeen thousand two hundred dollars and the amount incurred on account of this disease is therefore four thousand six hundred forty four dollars per year or eighty nine dollars per week in the seamen's retreat staten island new york twenty four per cent of the inmates suffer from venereal disease the expenses during the year eighteen fifty seven were forty three thousand five hundred dollars of which ten thousand five hundred forty dollars per year or two hundred three dollars per week must be considered the proportion rendered necessary by syphilis end of section number fifty six recording by samantha miles Section 57 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 57, Chapter 36, New York. Extent, Effects, and Cost of Prostitution, Part 3. To ascertain the amount expended for private medical assistance, it will be necessary to recapitulate the outlay of the public institutions mentioned. Institutions Island Hospital, Blackwell's Island Yearly outlay, $22,750 Weekly outlay, $438 Bellevue Hospital, New York Yearly outlay, $7,000 Weekly outlay, $135. Nursery Hospital, Randalls Island. Yearly outlay, $8,500. Weekly outlay, $163. Emigrants Hospital, Wards Island. Yearly outlay, $7,075. Weekly outlay, $136. City Hospital, New York. Yearly outlay, $8,260. Weekly outlay, one hundred fifty nine dollars dispensaries yearly outlay seven hundred twenty eight dollars weekly outlay fourteen dollars kings county hospital long island yearly outlay seven thousand five hundred thirty dollars weekly outlay one hundred forty five dollars 
Brooklyn City Hospital, Long Island. Yearly outlay, $4,644. Weekly outlay, $89. Siemens Retreat, Staten Island. Yearly outlay, $10,540. Weekly outlay, $203. Total, yearly outlay, $77,027. Total weekly outlay, $1,482. These totals must be multiplied by four, and the product will show the amount paid for private medical assistance as $5,928 weekly, or $308,108 yearly. This is calculated on too liberal a scale, for no one believes that an individual requiring professional aid can obtain it so economically in private life as in a public institution, nor would even the fact that in the latter case, the patients are boarded and supplied with all necessaries, more than counterbalance the sums which must be paid for individual medical attendance. The desire not needlessly to exaggerate facts which are sufficiently comprehensive without such a procedure is the only reason that induces so low an estimate. But there are yet other items of expenditure which must be noticed before the long array is completed. Foremost of these is the cost of support of abandoned women in the workhouse and penitentiary on Blackwell's Island. The proportion of females committed to the workhouse during 1857 was three-fifths of the total commitments. It is not asserted that all these were prostitutes, but it is certain that the larger part were unchaste, and for argument's sake we will take the ratio as two abandoned to one virtuous woman, the latter representing the class whom poverty, sickness or friendlessness may have driven to accept a shelter in the institution the expenses of the workhouse for the year amounted to seventy six thousand dollars and the share of cost incurred on behalf of prostitutes would therefore be thirty thousand four hundred dollars per year or five hundred eighty five dollars per week the female sentenced to the penitentiary from courts of criminal jurisdiction during eighteen fifty seven amount to twenty seven per cent of the total number incarcerated it will violate no probability to assume that all these women were prostitutes there may be exceptions to the rule but so rare are they as not to invalidate the principle the penitentiary was supported during eighteen fifty seven at an outlay to the taxpayers of nearly eighty nine thousand dollars and the proportion chargeable to prostitutes at the ratio given above is twenty four thousand thirty dollars per year or four hundred sixty two dollars per week a farther portion of the expenses of the workhouse and penitentiary might very plausibly be included in the list, namely the share incurred by the maintenance of those men who owe their imprisonment either to crimes committed at the instigation of common women, or for the sake of supporting them, or to a course of idleness and dissipation resulting from the companionship of prostitutes. To pursue this subject in all its minutiae would lead to the conclusion that nearly every male prisoner owes his confinement, less or more remotely, to one or the other of these causes, and hence it could be argued that all the expenses of male imprisonment should be taken into this account. On the other hand, such a course could be opposed with the plea that crimes which send men to Blackwell's Island are only indirect results of the system under discussion, and to recognize them would force the recognition of many other indirect consequences daily occurring elsewhere. Strictly speaking, the position is scarcely demonstrable enough to form an arithmetical calculation, but its moral certainty is so far acknowledged as to make it a serious matter of reflection in connection with the attendant evils of prostitution. To resume, about 55% of the population of the alms houses, Blackwell's Island, are female. Some of these are old, decrepit women whom it would be impossible to consider as prostitutes. Others are virtuous women whose poverty has driven them there. But many are broken-down prostitutes who have lost whatever of attraction they once possessed, and with ruined health and debilitated constitutions it is impossible for them to exist even in the lowest brothels they make the almshouse their last resting place and there await the final summons which shall close their career of sin and misery yet another class in this institution is composed of women with young children some claim to be respectable married women while others are known as disreputable characters but the former have little to support their pretensions except their own assertion and collateral testimony sometimes invalidates that it is not an uncharitable conclusion that at least one half of the female inmates of the almshouse owe their dependence upon charity to the prostitution 
the support of the almshouse in eighteen fifty seven cost the city of new york sixty three thousand dollars and the proportion resulting from prostitution on the above data is fifteen thousand seven hundred fifty dollars per year or three hundred three dollars per week the children on randall's island may be classified according to the rule already adopted in reference to disease in the nursery hospital there namely to assume that one half owe if not their existence certainly their support from public funds to causes that originated in vice the nursery exclusive of the hospital cost during last year sixty thousand dollars one half of which must in accordance with the previous estimate be charged to prostitution namely thirty thousand dollars per year or five hundred seventy seven dollars per week the final charge arises from the police and judiciary expenses of the city of new york of which it is believed that ten per cent is caused by prostitution and its concomitant crimes and sufferings the aggregate forms a large amount and will be rather a surmise than an assertion the maintenance of police officers and station houses of police justices and their courtrooms of the city judge and recorder with their respective courts of the city and the district prisons and numerous contingent expenses cannot be less than two million dollars per year the percent chargeable to prostitution will therefore be two hundred thousand dollars per year or four thousand dollars per week thus much for preliminary explanations it will now be possible to present the reader with a tabular statement of the weekly and yearly cost of the system of prostitution existing in the metropolis of the new world those who have followed us through this argument and noted the facts upon which every calculation is based will bear witness that nothing has been exaggerated that no dollar is debited to the vice without strong presumptive evidence to support such charge and that the endeavor has been throughout rather to underestimate than exceed the bounds of strict probability upon this ground the attention of the public is earnestly requested to the first exposition ever attempted of the amount paid by citizens of and visitors to new york for illicit sexual gratification recapitulation expenditure individual expenses paid to prostitutes weekly outlay sixty thousand dollars yearly outlay three million one hundred twenty thousand dollars spent for wine and liquor by visitors weekly outlay forty thousand dollars yearly outlay two million eighty thousand dollars paid by visitors to houses of assignation weekly outlay twelve thousand six hundred dollars yearly outlay six hundred fifty five thousand two hundred dollars spent for wine and liquor by visitors to houses of assignation weekly outlay five thousand dollars yearly outlay two hundred sixty thousand dollars spent in dancing saloons liquor and large beer stores frequented by prostitutes and their friends weekly outlay four thousand five hundred thirty dollars yearly outlay two hundred thirty five thousand five hundred sixty dollars medical expenses island hospital blackwell's island weekly outlay four hundred thirty eight dollars yearly outlay twenty two thousand seven hundred fifty dollars bellevue hospital new york weekly outlay one hundred thirty five dollars yearly outlay seven thousand dollars nursery hospital randall's island weekly outlay one hundred sixty three dollars yearly outlay eight thousand five hundred dollars emigrants hospital wards island weekly outlay one hundred thirty six dollars yearly outlay seven thousand seventy five dollars new york city hospital new york weekly outlay one hundred fifty nine dollars yearly outlay eight thousand two hundred sixty dollars dispensaries yearly outlay seven hundred twenty eight dollars kings county hospital long island weekly outlay one hundred forty five dollars yearly outlay seven thousand five hundred thirty dollars brooklyn city hospital long island weekly outlay eighty nine dollars yearly outlay four thousand six hundred forty four dollars siemens retreat staten island weekly outlay two hundred three dollars yearly outlay ten thousand five hundred forty dollars private medical assistance weekly outlay five thousand nine hundred twenty eight dollars yearly outlay three hundred eight thousand one hundred eight dollars vagrancy and pauper expenses workhouse blackwell's island weekly outlay five hundred eighty five dollars yearly outlay thirty thousand four hundred dollars penitentiary blackwell's island weekly outlay four hundred sixty two dollars yearly outlay twenty four thousand thirty dollars alms house blackwell's island weekly outlay three hundred three dollars yearly outlay fifteen thousand seven hundred fifty dollars nursery randall's island 
weekly outlay five hundred seventy seven dollars yearly outlay thirty thousand dollars police and judiciary expenses proportion of aggregate weekly outlay four thousand dollars yearly outlay two hundred thousand dollars total weekly outlay one hundred thirty five thousand four hundred sixty seven dollars total yearly outlay seven million thirty six thousand seventy five dollars the footings of the columns show the total expense to be weekly one hundred thirty five thousand four hundred sixty seven dollars yearly seven million thirty six thousand seventy five dollars over seven millions of dollars or nearly as much as the annual municipal expenditure of new york city comment upon these figures would be superfluous they present the monetary effects of prostitution in a convincing point of view and will prepare the reader for an intensive perusal of the suggested remedial measures which form the subject of the next chapter the american mind is said to be proverbially open to argument based upon dollars and cents without giving an unqualified assent to the proposition we may be permitted to hope that financial considerations combined with the claims of benevolence and humanity the appeals of virtue and morality the demands of public health and the future physical well-being of the community at large will exercise that influence on the public mind which is necessary to the accomplishment of any valuable practical result from the present investigation before leaving the subject of the extent of prostitution it may be appropriate to remark that it was considered advisable to ascertain the prevalence of the vice in some of the leading cities of the united states and in order to do this effectually a circular letter was addressed to the mayors of albany new york baltimore maryland boston massachusetts brooklyn new york buffalo new york charleston south carolina chicago illinois cincinnati ohio detroit michigan hartford connecticut louisville kentucky memphis tennessee mobile alabama newark new jersey new haven connecticut new orleans louisiana norfolk virginia philadelphia pennsylvania pittsburgh pennsylvania portland maine richmond virginia savannah georgia st louis missouri washington district columbia the names printed in italics are those of cities from which replies were received the circular forwarded was as follows copy mayor's office new york city september first eighteen fifty six to his honor the mayor of the city of dear sir below you will receive from dr sanger a note containing a few questions concerning prostitution and prostitutes in your city which i shall feel obliged if you will have the kindness to answer very truly yours fernando wood mayor new york city dear sir during the past six months with the aid of his honor mayor wood of this city and the police force at his command i have been collecting materials for a report on prostitution as it exists in new york at the present time i enclose you a list of questions that have been asked all the women examined here of course i do not expect that you will or can give answers to these questions from the prostitutes in your city but i would wish to have your replies to the following queries one how many houses of prostitution are there in your city two how many houses of assignation are there in your city three how many public prostitutes are there in your city four how many private prostitutes are there in your city five how many kept mistresses are there in your city six what is the present population of your city of course these questions can be answered to you by your chief of police and officers only as to the best of their knowledge but as a general thing shrewd police officers will be able to give correct answers to them i do not wish names only the round numbers in each class i shall do myself the honor to forward you a copy of the report when completed and shall be glad to receive your replies to the above queries by the thirtieth of this month you will please direct your answer to yours respectfully william w sanger resident physician blackwell's island new york city the following are the replies received buffalo new york copy mayor's office buffalo october second eighteen fifty six dear sir i received your circular of the first of september asking that certain questions concerning houses of prostitution prostitutes etc might be answered i immediately directed our chief to collect the necessary information through the police and i have just received his report i here enclose the answers 
To show how far the report can be relied on for accuracy, I here copy from his report. The captains inform me that they experienced much difficulty in their endeavors to make a correct report and answer to the several questions proposed. They, however, believe that the returns, so far at least as the number of houses and public prostitutes is concerned, are very near correct. Any further information you may desire I will cheerfully give, so far as I am able. I am respectfully yours, F. P. Stevens, Mayor. Enclosure. Houses of Prostitution, 87. Houses of Assignation, 37. Public Prostitutes, 272. Private Prostitutes, 81. Kept Mistresses, 31. Population, 75,000. Louisville, Kentucky. Copy. Police Office, Louisville, Kentucky, December 26, 1856. Honorable John Barber, Mayor. Dear Sir, below I give a statement of such matters as called for by Dr. William W. Sanger, resident physician of Blackwell's Island, New York City, which I think you will find correct, or as near as can be arrived at, from the facilities afforded. Hoping that it will prove satisfactory to the doctor, and that it will many tales unfold, I remain respectfully yours, James Kirkpatrick, Chief of Police. Houses of Prostitution, 79. Houses of Assignation, 39. Public Prostitutes, 214. Private Prostitutes, 93. Kept Mistresses, 60. Population of City, supposed to be 70,000. I am now preparing to take the census for 1857. Newark, New Jersey, copy. Newark, New Jersey, October 4th, 1856. William W. Sanger, M.D. Dear Sir, I cannot make any excuse for not answering your letter of inquiry that will justify me. Yours of September 1st was unfortunately mislaid. Our population in 1855 was 55,000 by census. We have no houses of ill fame in our city, none of assignation, there are no public prostitutes. It may appear strange to you that the above should be the case, but there is good reason for it. From the best information that I can get, there are perhaps 50 private prostitutes in this city, composed of girls living at service or as seamstresses, but who conduct themselves so as not to be known. Our city is so near to New York that as soon as a girl turns out, she makes her way to it, where associations and congenial amusements make it more agreeable. It is rather singular, but so soon as it becomes known that a girl is loose, she is marked and followed in the streets by half-grown boys hooting at and really forcing her to leave town. Occasionally it is made known to the police that a couple of girls stayed a night or two at some boarding house, when they are arrested as vagrants or warned off, and they are gone. New York, being so much greater field for them, they are the least of our troubles. Truly and respectfully yours, H. J. Poinet, Mayor. New Haven, Connecticut, copy. New Haven, September 18, 1856. Dr. William M. Sanger. Dear Sir, herewith I hand you the report of our Chief of Police in answer to your inquiries relative to prostitution in this city. Your obedient servant, P. S. Galpin, Mayor. Enclosure. To His Honor, the Mayor of the City of New Haven. Sir, I have had the communication addressed to you by William W. Sanger, resident physician, Blackwell's Island, New York, in regard to prostitutes and prostitution in the city of New Haven, under consideration, and beg leave to report. That the answers to the questions propounded are given in a general manner, with near approximation to exactness, without pretending to be minutely accurate. And to the first question, namely, how many houses of prostitution are there in the city, I answer, that the number now known as such to the police is ten and that these are only such some of them occasionally and that none of them would be so called in new york being inconsiderable in poor out-of-the-way houses and conducted with great secrecy and are constantly liable to the penalties of a law peculiar to connecticut which punishes reputation rendering it impossible for them to gain strength and become permanent and to the second inquiry, how many houses of assignation are there in the city? I answer, there are known to be six, and others suspected, but these all are not such proper, but are connected with some businesses as eating houses, hotels, dance houses, etc. And to the third inquiry, how many public prostitutes are there in the city? There are known by name, ninety-three, all well known. And to the fourth inquiry, how many private prostitutes are there in the city, I answer, that there are thirty, with many married women, and indeed, this class is mostly comprised of married women. And to the fifth question, how many kept mistresses are there in the city? The answer is, that number is not known, but is small, and no one instance is certainly known to us. 
The population of the city is 32,000. All which is respectfully submitted John C. Hayden, Chief of Police, City of New Haven. Dated at New Haven, September 16, 1856. Norfolk, Virginia, copy. Mayor's Office, Norfolk, Virginia, September 15, 1856. Dear Sir, Yours of first instant was duly received, and in reply would state that I have endeavored to be as accurate as possible in my replies to your several interrogatories, namely, 1. How many houses of prostitution in your city? Answer, about 40. 2. How many houses of assignation in your city? Answer, none as such, there being no places, so far as I can learn, used as meeting places. 3. How many public prostitutes are there in your city? Answer, about 150. 4. How many private prostitutes are there in your city? Answer, about 50. 5. How many kept mistresses are there in your city? Answer, about 6 or 8. 6. What is the present population of your city? Answer, about 18,000. I would, in connection with the above, state that about 25 of the 40 houses are used almost exclusively by sailors and seafaring men, and are sometimes improperly called sailor boarding houses, especially the most decent of them. Any other information I can give you, I will most cheerfully do, should you desire any. I am very respectfully yours, F. F. Ferguson, Mayor, City of Norfolk, Virginia. To Dr. William M. Sanger, Resident Physician, Blackwell's Island, New York. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, copy. Office of the Mayor of the City of Philadelphia, September 8, 1856. Dear Sir, as near as we can arrive at the facts, of course no great reliance can be placed on this general answer. The following are the figures. 1. Houses of prostitution, 130. 2. Houses of assignation, 50. 3. Public prostitutes, 475. 4. Private prostitutes, 105. 6. Say, 600,000 population. Our city has 129 square miles of police jurisdiction and 650 policemen besides officers. You will therefore make some allowances for the want of time to enable me more fully to state answers to your question. The answers given are from estimates made by the lieutenants of police of their own districts. Respectfully, Richard Vaux, Mayor of Philadelphia, to William W. Sanger, M.D., Resident Physician, Blackwell's Island. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, copy. Mayor's Office, Pittsburgh, September 18, 1856. William W. Sanger, M.D. Dear Sir, Your favor of the first instant came to hand a few days ago requesting answers to the following questions. 1. How many houses of prostitution are there in our city? Answer, 19. 2. How many houses of assignation? Answer, 9. 3. How many public prostitutes? Answer, 77. 4. How many private prostitutes? Answer, 37. 5. How many kept mistresses? Answer, 16. 6. What is your population? Answer, 75,750. The above is arrived at from the personal knowledge of some of our police officers. No doubt the number is much greater. At the last census, our population of the city proper was over 60,000. The population at that time of Pittsburgh, Allegheny, and the suburbs of Pittsburgh was nearly 100,000. Respectfully, your obedient servant, William Bingham, Mayor. Savannah, Georgia, copy, Mayor's Office of Savannah, Georgia, September 18, 1856. William W. Sanger, Resident Physician, Blackwell's Island, New York City. Dear Sir, in this city there are 15 houses of prostitution, 3 assignation houses, 93 white, and 105 colored prostitutes. In the winter season, the number is greatly increased by supplies from New York City. I cannot answer what number of private prostitutes or kept mistresses there are here. Our present population is about 26,000. Very truly yours, Edward C. Anderson, Mayor. These replies may be condensed as follows. Buffalo, reported by Mayor Stevens, 87 houses of prostitution, 37 houses of assignation, 272 public prostitutes, 81 private prostitutes, 31 kept mistresses, total of abandoned women, 384, population, 75,000. Louisville, reported by Mayor Barber, 79 houses of prostitution, 39 houses of assignation, 214 public prostitutes, 93 private prostitutes, 60 kept mistresses, total of abandoned women, 367, population 70,000. Newark, reported by Mayor Poignier, zero houses of prostitution, zero houses of assignation, zero public prostitutes, 50 private prostitutes, zero kept mistresses, 
Total of abandoned women, 50. Population, 55,000. New Haven, reported by Mayor Galpin, 10 houses of prostitution, 6 houses of assignation, 93 public prostitutes, 30 private prostitutes, 0 kept mistresses. Total of abandoned women, 123. Population, 32,000. Norfolk, reported by Mayor Ferguson, 40 houses of prostitution, 0 houses of assignation, 150 public prostitutes, 50 private prostitutes, 8 kept mistresses. Total of abandoned women, 208. Population, 18,000. Virginia, reported by Mayor Vaux, 130 houses of prostitution, 50 houses of assignation, 475 public prostitutes, 0 private prostitutes, 105 kept mistresses. Total of abandoned women, 580. Population, 600,000. Pittsburgh, reported by Mayor Bingham, 19 houses of prostitution, 9 houses of assignation, 77 public prostitutes, 37 private prostitutes, 16 kept mistresses. Total of abandoned women, 130. Population, 75,750. Savannah, reported by Mayor Anderson, 15 houses of prostitution, 3 houses of assignation, 198 public prostitutes, 0 private prostitutes, 0 kept mistresses, total of abandoned women, 198, population 26,000. It has already been stated, on the authority of the state census of 1855, that the adult male population of New York City formed nearly one-third of the total inhabitants, and the same rule may be applied to these cities to ascertain the comparative number of prostitutes and their customers. The proportions stand as follows. New York, on the resident population of the city proper, has one prostitute to every 50 men, but including the suburbs, one prostitute to every 64 men. Buffalo has one prostitute to every 65 men, Louisville has one prostitute to every 64 men, Newark has one prostitute to every 366 men, New Haven has one prostitute to every 87 men, Norfolk has one prostitute to every 29 men, Philadelphia has one prostitute to every 344 men, Pittsburgh has one prostitute to every 192 men, Savannah has one prostitute to every 44 men. It can scarcely be doubted that the worthy mayors of Newark, Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh have been misinformed as to the extent of the vice in their respective cities. Respecting Newark, for instance, the writer was recently informed that prostitution was not so rare as Mayor Poignier's letter would imply, but that prostitutes and known houses of prostitution were to be found scattered over the city, and that the fact was notorious to nearly every resident. This information was received from a gentleman himself, an inhabitant of Newark. There is no doubt that much of the vice of Newark finds a home in New York, as the mayor says, but it is equally certain that it is not all expatriated. The mayor of Philadelphia is particularly wide of the mark. There may not be as many public prostitutes there as in New York, but it is proverbial, and is as widely known as is Philadelphia itself, that its streets abound in houses of assignation and private houses of prostitution. Pittsburgh is situated at the head of the navigation on the Ohio River, at the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers, both navigable. She has canals, railroads, and large manufactories, and, if closely examined, would probably show a larger proportion of prostitutes than above reported. Norfolk is the largest naval depot in this country, and its population cannot be held responsible for all the prostitution within its limits. In both Norfolk and Savannah, we presume that the larger portion of the abandoned women at the time the census was taken were colored people, whose virtue is always at a discount under the most favorable circumstances, and to which a seaport is always fatal. But another calculation may be made upon the assumption that the males who have commerce with prostitutes form only one-fourth of the population, and the proportions resulting from that are as follows. New York, on the resident population of the city proper, has one prostitute to every thirty men, but including the suburbs, one prostitute to every fifty men. Buffalo has one prostitute to every forty-nine men. Louisville has one prostitute to every forty-eight men. Newark has one prostitute to every two hundred seventy-five men. New Haven has one prostitute to every sixty-five men. Norfolk has one prostitute to every twenty-three men. Philadelphia has one prostitute to every two hundred fifty-eight men. Pittsburgh has one prostitute to every 144 men. Savannah has one prostitute to every 33 men. 
to arrive at an average we will omit the calculation of the proportion of prostitutes to the population of new york city proper it having been shown already that the responsibility of much of it must rest upon the suburbs and upon visitors and also omit newark philadelphia and pittsburgh because the reports from those cities are palpably underrated this done the mean of the two estimates stands thus new york one prostitute to every fifty seven men Buffalo, one prostitute to every 57 men. Louisville, one prostitute to every 56 men. New Haven, one prostitute to every 76 men. Norfolk, one prostitute to every 26 men. Savannah, one prostitute to every 39 men. And the mean of the whole is one prostitute to every 52 men. This mean may be fairly assumed as the proportion existing in all the large cities of the union and the farther assumption that men who visit houses of prostitution form one-fourth of the total population will give a basis upon which the total number of the prostitutes in the united states may be estimated with some accuracy the calculation cannot of course be claimed as absolutely correct as that would be an impossibility but is submitted as a probability on which the reader can form his own conclusion the population of the United States in 1858 was estimated by Professor DeBow when preparing the compendium of the census of 1850, and his calculation at that time was that by the present year it would amount to 29,242,139 persons, which may be taken in round numbers 29 million. From this must be deducted 3,500,000 slaves, which will leave the free inhabitants 25,500,000, and the proportion of adult males to this number is 6,375,000. It may next be assumed that one half of these men live in country places or small cities where prostitution does not exist, the other moiety being inhabitants of cities with a population of 20,000 or upward, and upon the basis already proved of one prostitute to every 52 men, the result would be a total of 61,298 prostitutes. The whole area of the United States is 2,936,166 square miles, and if all the prostitutes therein were equally divided over this surface, there would be one for every 47 square miles, or if they were walking in continuous line, 36 inches from each other, they would make a column nearly 35 miles long. If the inhabitants of large cities were only one-third, the number of prostitutes would be 41,058. These suggestions are, of course, mere matters for consideration and are not given as definite facts. End of section 57. Section 58 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 58. Chapter 36. New York. Extent, Effects, and Cost of Prostitution. Part 4. Allusions have already been made to many exaggerated opinions as to the extent of prostitution in New York City, and it may well be to notice in this place some passages in a work entitled an inquiry into the extent causes and consequences of prostitution in edinburgh by william tate surgeon second edition eighteen forty two the author starts with the impression that the capital of scotland is the most moral city on the face of the earth and after fixing the number of public prostitutes in edinburgh at eight hundred or one to every eighty of the adult male population remarks in london there is one for every sixty and in paris one for every fifteen edinburgh is thus about twenty five per cent better than london while the latter is about seventy per cent better than paris happy edinburgh and what is to be said of the chief city of the united states of america of the independent liberal religious and enlightened inhabitants of new york it will scarcely be credited that that city furnishes a prostitute for every six or seven of its adult male population alas for the religion and morality of the country that affords such a demonstration of its depravity it was not surpassed even by the metropolis of france during the heat and fervor of the revolution when libertinism reigned triumphant and the laws of god and man were alike set at defiance page six this picture is anything but flattering to our national pride but it loses very much of its effect because it is contrary to the truth it will however satisfy our readers that mr tate was misinformed and they may feel a slight gratification in the conclusion that his pathetic lament for the religion and morality of their country was unnecessary on page eight of the same work we find 
after stating that there were upward of ten thousand abandoned women in the city of new york the rev mr mcdowell chaplain to the new york magdalen asylum goes on to say besides these we have the clearest evidence that there are hundreds of private harlots and kept mistresses many of whom keep up a show of industry as domestics seamstresses nurses etc in the most respectable families and throng the houses of assignation every night although we have no means of ascertaining the number of these yet enough has been learned from the facts already developed to convince us that the aggregate is alarmingly great perhaps a little behind the proportion of the city of london whose police report asserts on the authority of accurate researches that the number of private prostitutes in that city is fully equal to the number of public harlots in this passage mr tait shifts the responsibility of his figures to the shoulders of the rev mr mcdowell who is represented as declaring the number of public prostitutes in new york sixteen years ago to be ten thousand and assuming the private prostitutes to amount to the same number making an aggregate nearly three times as large as an actual and searching inquiry has found at the present time during the last sixteen years vice has not decreased in new york but has steadily increased and yet the most diligent search can discover in eighteen fifty eight only seven thousand eight hundred sixty public and private prostitutes instead of the twenty thousand mentioned in the publication under notice we imagine it to be an imperative duty to be tolerably well acquainted with a social evil before attempting to write upon it and although mr tate's book cannot by any possibility injure our city on account of the palpable misrepresentations it contains we allude to it now to show the opinion entertained of new york and its vices on the other side of the atlantic were an apology necessary for the preset work such statements as these would be amply sufficient mr tate loses no opportunity to hurl a sly dart at new york thus on page thirty eight after quoting the words of the rev mr medowell as to the character of an abandoned woman in new york he mr tate continues he says nothing of the state of religious feeling among the prostitutes there and if we are to regard his statement of the number of prostitutes as strictly correct it may very well be questioned whether any considerable number of the inhabitants of that city are under the influence of sincere religious feeling some of our new york city readers may probably recollect that the publication of mr mcdowell's inquiry produced very considerable excitement here at the time and opinions were freely expressed that he was either very ignorant on the matters of the nature or intentionally colored his statements and was in either case entirely unfitted for the task he had assumed mr tate assumes the population of edinburgh at about two hundred thousand the number of public prostitutes at eight hundred and of private prostitutes at nearly twelve hundred or a total of two thousand abandoned women this gives one prostitute to every thirty-two adult males if we adopt his system of calculation or one prostitute to every twenty-five adult males if we adopt the system of calculation which has been applied to the united states in the present work from his own figures then it can be seen that although new york city is so awfully irreligious it has less prostitution than pious edinburgh again on page one eighty nine while speaking of the demoralizing effects of theatrical representations mr tate says in the report of the house of refuge in new york it is stated that one hundred and fifty boys and girls out of six hundred and ninety are guilty of theft and impurity to get a seat in the theatre he does not mark this as a quotation nor does he state the report from which it was extracted as he has printed it it must be supposed correct although we must confess we cannot see very clearly what connection exists between the new york house of refuge and prostitution considering the ages of children generally admitted to that institution and while we have very little doubt that many of the inmates thereof have committed theft for the reason he assigns we are rather dubious as to the acts of impurity alluded to except in very few exceptional cases farther on page one ninety four Mr. Tate quotes the address of Rev. Mr. McDowell on prostitution in America as follows. At the very hour in the morning, afternoon, and evening of every Lord's Day, when the people of God assemble for religious worship, then, in a special manner, do the children of the wicked one meet in troops at harlot houses. On the Sabbath days the rooms are so filled with visitors that there is no place for them to sit down, and on that account many are refused admission at the doors. These palpable exaggerations require no contradiction. They show, however, the extremes of misrepresentation to which an enthusiastic and incompetent writer may be led. Inclined to exaggeration as Mr. Tate has been proved to be, he yet protests, in page 251, against some opinions upon infanticide by prostitutes in New York advised by his informant, the Rev. Mr. McDowell, and quotes the opinion of parent du Chalet to prove that mothers are generally fond of their children. This fact warrants the conclusion that his other opinions upon social morals in New York are entirely derived from Mr. Medall, who is shown to be anything but a credible witness. 
his reliance upon such a source is much to be regretted as materially impairing the value and truthfulness of his otherwise interesting and useful volume the following extracts from the compendium of the seventh census of the united states eighteen fifty will be interesting from their relation to various points which have been discussed in the progress of this work they have all a more or less direct bearing upon the subject of prostitution and the condensation of them here will give readers an opportunity of verifying many of the previous remarks the estimated population of the union at the present time eighteen fifty eight has been already given as twenty nine million two hundred forty two thousand one hundred thirty nine persons including slaves the proportion of females to males at each census from seventeen ninety to eighteen fifty is stated as follows seventeen ninety one hundred males to ninety six point four females eighteen hundred one hundred males to ninety five point three females eighteen ten one hundred males to ninety six point two females eighteen twenty one hundred males to ninety six point eight females eighteen thirty one hundred males to ninety six point four females eighteen forty one hundred males to ninety five point six females eighteen fifty one hundred males to ninety five females this relates only to the free population in enumerating slaves no distinction of sex was made earlier than the year eighteen twenty the ratio of male and female slaves since that date is as follows eighteen twenty one hundred males to ninety five point one nine females eighteen thirty one hundred males to ninety eight point three six females eighteen forty one hundred males to ninety nine point five five females eighteen fifty one hundred males to ninety nine point nine five females from these tables it appears that the males in the free population and the females in the slave population have been steadily increasing but with no determined ratio of progression taking the total free and slave population since the census of eighteen twenty the excess of males is stated thus eighteen twenty four million eight hundred ninety eight thousand one hundred twenty seven males four million seven hundred forty thousand four females excess of males one hundred fifty eight thousand one hundred twenty three eighteen thirty six million five hundred twenty nine thousand six hundred ninety six males six million three hundred thirty six thousand three hundred twenty four females excess of males of one hundred ninety three thousand three hundred seventy two eighteen forty eight million six hundred eighty eight thousand five hundred thirty two males eight million three hundred eighty thousand nine hundred twenty one females excess of male three hundred seven thousand six hundred eleven eighteen fifty eleven million eight hundred thirty seven thousand six hundred sixty one males eleven million three hundred fifty four thousand two hundred fifteen females excess of males four hundred eighty three thousand four hundred forty six it will be seen from this that in eighteen fifty the males were in excess at the rate of two point zero eight per cent and by applying the same rule to the population of eighteen fifty eight a fair estimate of the relative number of each sex at the present time may be made as follows males eighteen fifty eight fourteen million nine hundred twenty five thousand one hundred eighty eight females fourteen million three hundred sixteen thousand nine hundred fifty one excess of males six hundred eight thousand two hundred thirty seven total estimated population twenty nine million two hundred forty two thousand one hundred thirty nine in the several geographical divisions of the union the proportion of white males to white females is thus shown new england states maine new hampshire vermont massachusetts rhode island and connecticut one hundred point eight seven females to one hundred males middle states new york new jersey pennsylvania delaware maryland and district of columbia ninety seven point seven zero females to one hundred males southern states virginia north carolina south carolina georgia and florida ninety eight point five four females to one hundred males southwestern states alabama mississippi louisiana texas arkansas and tennessee ninety one point six six females to one hundred males northwestern states kentucky missouri illinois indiana ohio michigan wisconsin and iowa ninety two point one one females to one hundred males california and territories thirty six point seven three females to one hundred males two facts are developed in this statement in the new england states females are in excess of males from this district comes the majority of all the native-born prostitutes who find their home in new york city in the northwestern states to which it has been proposed to remove some of the surplus female labor of new york 
the males are in excess and any women sent there would aid in restoring the equilibrium of the sexes the following table gives the relative percentage of each sex at different ages and also the number of females to each hundred males ages under five years percentage of males fourteen point six eight percentage of females fourteen point nine five females to each one hundred males ninety six point seven six from five years to ten years percentage of males thirteen point six nine percentage of females thirteen point nine eight females to each one hundred males ninety seven point zero three from ten years to fifteen years percentage of males twelve point two three percentage of females twelve point three five females to one hundred males ninety six from fifteen years to twenty years percentage of males ten point three nine percentage of females eleven point four two females to each one hundred males one hundred four point four six from twenty years to thirty years percentage of males eighteen point six four percentage of females eighteen point four six females to each one hundred males ninety four point oh eight from thirty years to forty years percentage of males twelve point eight five percentage of females eleven point eight four females to each one hundred males eighty seven point five five from forty years to fifty years percentage of males eight point three eight percentage of females seven point eight six females to each one hundred males eighty nine point zero nine from fifty years to sixty years percentage of males four point nine seven percentage of females four point eight three females to each one hundred males ninety two point one five from sixty years to seventy years percentage of males two point six four percentage of females two point six nine females to each one hundred males ninety six point eight eight from seventy years to eighty years percentage of males one point one one percentage of females one point one eight females to each one hundred males one hundred one point zero one from eighty years to ninety years percentage of males point three one percentage of females point three six females to each one hundred males one hundred ten point one one from ninety years to one hundred years percentage of males point zero four percentage of females point zero five females to each one hundred males one hundred twenty three point one six from one hundred years upwards percentage of males point zero four percentage of females point zero five females to each one hundred males one hundred twenty point four five ages unknown percentage of males point zero seven percentage of females point zero three females to each one hundred males forty four point zero nine total percentage of males one hundred total percentage of females one hundred total females to each one hundred males ninety five experience has proved that the age at which female virtue is exposed to the most temptation or at least the age which the greater part of the prostitutes in new york have embraced their wretched calling is from fifteen to twenty years and the table shows that at those periods females are in excess over males nearly four and one half per cent is it to be supposed that the numerical predominance is the cause of the temptations or may it not rather be concluded that both are coexistent and equally contribute to the sad result or even would not temptation be more aggravated because concentrated if at that critical period of life males and females were in equal numbers the following table gives the relative ages of the whole population without distinction of sex but compares the white free colored and slave classes under five years of age percentage of white population fourteen point eight one percentage of free colored population fourteen percentage of slave population sixteen point eight seven from five years to ten years percentage of white population thirteen point eight three percentage of free colored population thirteen point eight six percentage of slave population fourteen point nine five from ten years to fifteen years percentage of white population twelve point two eight percentage of free colored population twelve point zero four percentage of slave population thirteen point six one from fifteen years to twenty years percentage of white population ten point eight nine percentage of free colored population ten point zero eight percentage of slave population eleven point one five 
from 20 to 30 years percentage of white population 18.55 percentage of free colored population 17.85 percentage of slave population 17.86 from 30 years to 40 years percentage of white population 12.36 percentage of free colored population 12.71 percentage of slave population 11.04 from 40 years to 50 years percentage of white population 8.13 percentage of free colored population 8.73 percentage of slave population 6.86 from 50 years to 60 years percentage of white population 4.90 percentage of free colored population 5.60 percentage of slave population 3.96 from 60 years and upward percentage of white population 4.20 percentage of free colored population 5.56 percentage of slave population 3.68 age unknown percentage of white population 0 0.05 percentage of free colored population 0 0.07 percentage of slave population 0 0.02 total percentage of white population 100 total percentage of free colored population 100 total percentage of slave population 100 births the ratio of births is in the united states one birth to every 36 persons or 2.75 percent great britain one birth to every 31 persons or 3.22 percent france one birth to every 35 persons or 2.86 percent russia one birth to every 36 persons or 2.75 percent prussia and austria one birth to every 26 persons or 3.87 percent education the importance of education and its influence upon the social problem of prostitution is a sufficient apology for the following extracts in addition to what has been said already on the subject there are in the united states 239 colleges with an annual income of one million nine hundred sixty four thousand four hundred twenty eight dollars 80,978 public schools with an annual income of nine million five hundred twenty nine thousand five hundred forty two dollars 6,085 academics and private schools with an annual income of four million six hundred forty four thousand two hundred fourteen dollars totaling eighty seven thousand three hundred two educational institutions which cost sixteen million one hundred thirty eight thousand one hundred eighty four dollars these institutions are attended by three million six hundred forty four thousand nine hundred twenty eight scholars there are in the united states eight hundred fifty eight thousand three hundred six natives one hundred ninety five thousand one hundred fourteen foreigners for a total of one million fifty three thousand four hundred twenty persons above twenty years of age who cannot read or write this number is subdivided thus white three hundred eighty nine thousand six hundred sixty four males five hundred seventy three thousand two hundred thirty four females total white nine hundred sixty two thousand eight hundred ninety four free colored forty thousand seven hundred twenty two males forty nine thousand eight hundred females total free colored ninety thousand five hundred twenty two total males four hundred thirty thousand three hundred eighty six total females six hundred twenty three thousand thirty four total combined one million fifty three thousand four hundred twenty this shows a remarkable preponderance of uneducated women the percentage of children attending school in the united states calculated on all between the ages of five and fifteen years is natives eighty point eight one per cent foreigners fifty one point seven three per cent a proof of the fact intimated already that foreign parents do not endeavor to avail themselves of the facilities provided for the education of their children the illiterate of the population are thus minutely analyzed white illiterate to total white four point nine two per cent free colored illiterate to total free colored twenty point eight three per cent native white and free colored illiterate to total native white and free colored four point eight five per cent foreign white and free colored illiterate to total foreign white and free colored eight point two four per cent native illiterate white and free colored to total of both native over twenty years of age ten point three five per cent foreign illiterate white and free colored to total of both foreign over twenty years of age fourteen point four eight per cent foreign illiterate over twenty years of age one hundred ninety five point one one four per cent
foreign illiterate to total foreign over 20 years of age supposing the illiterate to be all white 14.51 percent following the geographical sections we obtain the following results new england states percentage of pupils to the white population 25.90 percentage of pupils to the white and free colored population 25.71 Percentage of illiterate to white population, 1.88. Middle states, percentage of pupils to the white population, 71.79. Percentage of pupils to the white and free colored population, 21.02. Percentage of illiterate to white population, 3.16. Southern states, percentage of pupils to the white population, 14.52. Percentage of pupils to the white and free colored population, 13.92 percentage of illiterate to white population 9.22 southwestern states percentage of pupils to the white population 16.32 percentage of pupils to the white and free colored population 16.10 percentage of illiterate to white population 8.45 northwestern states percentage of pupils to the white population 21.72 Percentage of pupils to the white and free colored population, 21.51. Percentage of illiterate to white population, 5.03. New England states, percentage of illiterate to natives, 0.26. Percentage of illiterate to natives over 20 years of age, 0.42. Percentage of illiterate to foreigners, 14.63. Percentage of illiterate to foreigners over 20 years of age, 24.39. Percentage of illiterate to free colored. 8.45 middle states percentage of illiterate to natives 1.84 percentage of illiterate to natives over 20 years of age 3.00 percentage of illiterate to foreigners 9.55 percentage of illiterate to foreigners over 20 years of age 15.92 percentage of illiterate to free colored 22.42 southern states Percentage of illiterate to natives, 9.30. Percentage of illiterate to natives over 20 years of age, 20.30. Percentage of illiterate to foreigners, 5.28. Percentage of illiterate to foreigners over 20 years of age, 8.80. Percentage of illiterate to free colored, 21.20. Southwestern states. Percentage of illiterate to natives, 8.41. Percentage of illiterate to natives over 20 years of age, 16.63. Percentage of illiterate to foreigners, 9.12. Percentage of illiterate to foreigners over 20 years of age, 15.20. Percentage of illiterate to free colored, 18.54. Northwestern states. Percentage of illiterate to natives, 4.97. Percentage of illiterate to natives over 20 years of age, 9.92. Percentage of illiterate to foreigners, 4.63. Percentage of illiterate to foreigners over 20 years of age, 7.72. Percentage of illiterate to free colored, 21.44. California and Territories. Percentage of illiterate to natives, 17.50. Percentage of illiterate to natives over 20 years of age, 21.63. Percentage of illiterate to foreigners, 14.13. Percentage of illiterate to foreigners over 20 years of age, 23.51. Percentage of illiterate to free colored, 12.47. Occupations. In the tables of occupations, the only class noticed is the white and free colored male population over 15 years of age, no returns of female employment being given. As interesting to the general reader, although not in immediate connection with the subject, the following is given. Occupations. Commerce, trade, manufactures, mechanic arts, and mining. Ratio percent to the total employed, 29.72. Agriculture, 44.69. Labor, not agricultural, 18.50. Army, 0 .10. Sea and river navigation, 2.17. Law, medicine, and divinity, 1.76. Other pursuits requiring education, 1.78. Government, civil service, 0.46, domestic service, 0.41, other occupations, 0.41, for a total of 100%. A similar but more elaborate statement of occupations of the people of Great Britain was published in the British Census for 1841 and is reprinted by Professor Bowe in his compendium. Occupations, commerce, trade, and manufactures, 
percentage to total males 26.24 percentage to total females 7.12 percentage to total population 16.52 agriculture percentage to total males 15.33 percentage to total females 0.84 percentage to total population 7.96 labor not agricultural percentage to total males 6.99 percentage to total females 1.21 percentage to total population 4.05 army percentage to total males 1.42 percentage to total females 0 percentage to total population 0 0.70 navy and merchant seamen boatmen etc percentage to total males 2.35 Percentage to total females, 0. Percentage to total population, 1.17. Clerical, legal, and medical professions. Percentage to total males, 0.66. Percentage to total females, 0 0.02. Percentage to total population, 0.34. Other pursuits requiring education. Percentage to total males, 1.17. Percentage to total females, 0.36. Percentage to total population, Point seven six, government and municipal civil service percentage to total males point four three, percentage to total females point zero two, percentage to total population point two two, domestic servants percentage to total males two point seven eight, percentage to total females nine point four eight, percentage to total population six point one eight, persons of independent means. Percentage to total males, 1.47. Percentage to total females, 3.88. Percentage to total population, 2.69. Pensioners, paupers, lunatics, and prisoners. Percentage to total males, 1.11. Percentage to total females, 1.01. Percentage to total population, 1.06. Unoccupied, including women and children. Percentage to total males, 40.05. Percentage to total females, 76.06. .06. Percentage to total population, 58.35. Percentage total to males, 100. Percentage total to females, 100. Percentage to total population, 100. Wages. In introducing this subject, Professor Debeau remarks, The money price of wages, unless the price of other articles be known, gives but an unsatisfactory idea of the condition of the laboring classes at different periods and in different countries. In the following tables of the rates of remuneration in 1850, this difficulty will scarcely exist, so far as New York is concerned at least. The large number of domestic servants who have been added to our population since that year precludes the possibility of any considerable advance in the rate of wages, and, as every reader has an idea of what a woman's necessary expenses must be, each will be enabled to decide for himself whether the compensation is sufficient, or whether society at large would not be benefited were some of the surplus domestic servants removed to other localities and thus by increasing the demand augment the wages the following was the average weekly wages with board of a domestic servant in the year eighteen fifty state alabama wages one dollar forty one cents arkansas one dollar sixty seven cents california thirteen dollars columbia district of one dollar thirty one cents connecticut one dollar thirty six cents Delaware, eighty four cents. Florida, one dollar eighty three cents. Georgia, one dollar fifty two cents. Illinois, one dollar fourteen cents. Indiana, ninety cents. Iowa, one dollar seven cents. Kentucky, one dollar nine cents. Louisiana, two dollars fifty seven cents. Maine, one dollar nine cents. Maryland, eighty nine cents. Massachusetts, one dollar forty eight cents. Michigan, one dollar ten cents. Mississippi, one dollar fifty two cents. Missouri, one dollar seventeen cents. New Hampshire, one dollar twenty seven cents. New Jersey, ninety seven cents. New York, one dollar five cents. North Carolina, eighty seven cents. Ohio, ninety six cents. Pennsylvania, eighty cents. Rhode Island, one dollar forty two cents. South Carolina, one dollar forty two cents. Tennessee, one dollar. Texas, two dollars. Vermont, one dollar nineteen cents. Virginia, ninety six cents. Wisconsin one dollar twenty seven cents territories Minnesota two dollars twenty five cents New Mexico seventy eight cents Oregon ten dollars Utah one dollar forty six cents 
The following is a table of the monthly wages in factories in the different states. It is, of course, exclusive of board and lodging. Looking at the amount received by female operatives, will anyone feel surprised that they should abandon the insistent and poorly paid employment? Wages per month without board. Alabama Cotton. Males, $11.71. Females, $7.98. Wool, $0 for males and females. Pig iron, males, $17.60. Females, $0.00. Iron castings, males, $30.05, females, zero. Wrought iron, males, $15.29, females, zero. Fisheries, zero dollars for males and females. Arkansas, cotton, males, $14.61, females, $5.88. Wool, zero dollars for males and females. Pig iron, zero dollars for males and females. Iron castings, zero dollars for males and females. Wrought iron, zero dollars for males and females. Fisheries, zero dollars for males and females. California, cotton, zero dollars for males and females. Wool, zero dollars for males and females. Pig iron, zero dollars for males and females. Iron castings, males, twenty-three dollars thirty-three cents. Females, zero dollars. Wrought iron, zero dollars for males and females fisheries zero dollars for males and females district of columbia cotton males fourteen dollars two cents females eight dollars wool males thirty dollars females zero dollars pig iron zero dollars for males and females iron castings males twenty seven dollars five cents females zero dollars Wrought iron, zero dollars for males and females. Fisheries, zero dollars for males and females. Connecticut, cotton, males, nineteen dollars eight cents. Females, eleven dollars eighty cents. Wool, males, twenty four dollars twelve cents. Females, twelve dollars eighty six cents. Pig iron, males, twenty six dollars eighty cents. Females, zero dollars. Iron castings, Males, $27.02. Females, $8. Wrought iron. Males, $31.59. Females, $0. Fisheries. Males, $20.81. Females, $0. Delaware. Cotton. Males, $15.31. Females, $11.58. Wool. Males, $18.79. Females, $17.33. Pig iron, $0 for males or females. Iron castings, males, $23.36. Female, $0. Wrought iron, males, $25.53. Females, $0. Fisheries, $0 for males or females. Florida. Cotton. Males, $32.14. Females, $5. Wool, $0 for males and females. Pig iron, $0 for males and females. Iron castings, $0 for males and females. Wrought iron, $0 for males and females. Fisheries, male, $17.58. Female, $8.40. Georgia, cotton, males, $14.57. Female, $7.39. Wool, males, $27.47. Females, $14.10. Pig iron, males, $17.44. Females, $5. Iron castings, males, $27.43. Females, $0. Wrought iron, males, $11.35. Females, $5. Fisheries, zero dollars for males and females illinois cotton zero dollars males and females wool males twenty two dollars females twelve dollars fifty two cents pig iron males twenty two dollars six cents females zero dollars iron castings males twenty eight dollars fifty cents females zero dollars wrought iron zero dollars for males and females fisheries zero dollars for males and females Indiana, cotton, males, $13.02, females, $6.77. Wool, 
males $21.81 females $11.05 pig iron males $26 females 0 iron castings male $25.74 females 0 wrought iron males $27.45 females $4 fisheries $0 for males and females Iowa cotton zero dollars for males and females wool male eleven dollars fourteen cents female zero dollars pig iron zero dollars for males and females iron castings males thirty two dollars thirty five cents females zero dollars wrought iron zero dollars for males and females fisheries zero dollars for males and females kentucky cotton male fourteen dollars ninety five cents female nine dollars thirty six cents wool male fifteen dollars thirty cents female eleven dollars eleven cents pig iron male twenty dollars twenty three cents female four dollars seventy cents iron castings male twenty four dollars eighty nine cents female four dollars fifteen cents wrought iron male thirty two dollars six cents female zero dollars Fisheries, zero dollars, male and female. Louisiana, cotton, zero dollars for male and female. Wool, zero dollars for male and female. Pig iron, zero dollars for male and female. Iron castings, male, thirty five dollars sixty cents. Female, zero dollars. Wrought iron, zero dollars for male and female. Fisheries, zero dollars for male and female. Maine, cotton, male twenty nine dollars thirty five cents female twelve dollars fifteen cents wool male twenty two dollars fifty seven cents female eleven dollars seventy seven cents pig iron male twenty two dollars female zero dollars iron castings male twenty nine dollars female five dollars wrought iron zero dollars male and female fisheries male nineteen dollars twelve cents female zero dollars maryland cotton male fifteen dollars forty two cents female nine dollars forty eight cents wool male eighteen dollars sixty cents female eleven dollars eighty nine cents pig iron male twenty dollars fourteen cents female zero dollars iron castings male twenty seven dollars fifty cents female zero dollars wrought iron male twenty four dollars thirty one cents female zero dollars fisheries zero dollars male and female massachusetts cotton male twenty two dollars ninety cents female thirteen dollars sixty cents wool male twenty two dollars ninety five cents female fourteen dollars twenty two cents pig iron male twenty seven dollars fifty cents female zero dollars iron castings male thirty dollars ninety cents female zero dollars wrought iron male twenty nine dollars forty six cents female twelve dollars seventy nine cents fisheries male fifteen dollars seventy cents female zero dollars michigan cotton zero dollars for males and females wool male twenty one dollars sixty five cents females eleven dollars forty seven cents pig iron male thirty five dollars female zero dollars iron castings male twenty eight dollars sixty eight cents female zero dollars wrought iron zero dollars for males and females fisheries male twenty two dollars forty three cents female zero dollars mississippi cotton males fourteen dollars twenty one cents females five dollars ninety four cents wool zero dollars for males and females pig iron zero dollars for males and females iron castings male thirty seven dollars ninety one cents females zero dollars wrought iron zero dollars for males and females fisheries zero dollars for males and females missouri cotton males ten dollars ninety three cents females ten dollars wool males thirty two dollars females six dollars fifty cents pig iron males twenty four dollars twenty eight cents females zero dollars iron castings males nineteen dollars sixty three cents females zero dollars wrought iron males thirty dollars females zero dollars fisheries 
zero dollars for males and females new hampshire cotton males twenty six dollars females thirteen dollars forty seven cents wool males twenty two dollars eighty six cents females fourteen dollars fifty three cents pig iron males eighteen dollars females zero dollars iron castings males thirty three dollars five cents females zero dollars wrought iron males thirty one dollars thirty four cents females zero dollars fisheries males ten dollars females zero dollars new jersey cotton males seventeen dollars ninety eight cents females nine dollars fifty six cents wool males twenty five dollars twenty two cents females eight dollars sixty cents pig iron males twenty one dollars twenty cents females zero dollars iron castings male twenty four dollars females zero dollars wrought iron males twenty seven dollars thirty one cents female thirteen dollars thirty four cents fisheries zero dollars for males and females new york cotton males seventeen dollars ninety eight cents females nine dollars fifty six cents wool males twenty five dollars twenty two cents females eight dollars sixty cents pig iron male twenty one dollars twenty cents female zero dollars iron castings male twenty four dollars female zero dollars wrought iron male twenty seven dollars thirty one cents females thirteen dollars thirty four cents fisheries zero dollars male and female north carolina cotton males eleven dollars sixty five cents females six dollars thirteen cents wool males eighteen dollars females seven dollars pig iron males eight dollars females four dollars iron castings males twenty three dollars forty six cents females zero dollars wrought iron males ten dollars forty three cents females four dollars seventy eight cents fisheries males twenty three dollars sixty four cents females eleven dollars seventy seven cents ohio cotton males sixteen dollars fifty nine cents females nine dollars forty two cents wool male twenty dollars fourteen cents female ten dollars ninety cents pig iron male twenty four dollars forty eight cents female zero dollars iron castings male twenty seven dollars thirty two cents female zero dollars wrought iron male twenty nine dollars fifty eight cents female zero dollars fisheries male nineteen dollars seven cents female zero dollars pennsylvania cotton males seventeen dollars eighty five cents females nine dollars ninety one cents wool male nineteen dollars twenty three cents female ten dollars forty one cents pig iron male twenty one dollars sixty five cents female five dollars eleven cents iron castings male twenty seven dollars fifty five cents female six dollars wrought iron male twenty eight dollars thirty one cents female six dollars fifty seven cents fisheries zero dollars for males and females rhode island cotton males eighteen dollars sixty cents females twelve dollars ninety five cents wool male twenty dollars seventy cents female fifteen dollars eighteen cents pig iron zero dollars for males and females iron castings male twenty nine dollars sixty three cents females zero dollars wrought iron male fifty seven dollars eighty five cents females zero dollars fisheries male thirty four dollars female zero dollars south carolina cotton male thirteen dollars ninety four cents female eight dollars thirty cents wool zero dollars for male and female pig iron zero dollars for male and female iron castings male thirteen dollars fifty nine cents female four dollars wrought iron zero dollars for male and females fisheries zero dollars for males and females tennessee cotton male ten dollars ninety four cents female six dollars forty two cents wool male seventeen dollars sixty six cents female six dollars pig iron male twelve dollars eighty one cents female five dollars eleven cents iron castings male seventeen dollars ninety six cents female four dollars fifty cents wrought iron male fifteen dollars twenty cents female five dollars fisheries zero dollars males and females texas cotton zero dollar males and females wool males twenty dollars females twenty dollars
pig iron zero dollars males and females iron castings males forty three dollars forty three cents females zero dollars wrought iron zero dollars for males and females fisheries zero dollars for males and females vermont cotton males fifteen dollars fifty three cents females twelve dollars sixty five cents wool males twenty four dollars forty six cents females eleven dollars eighty one cents pig iron males twenty two dollars eight cents females zero dollars iron castings males twenty eight dollars twenty seven cents females zero dollars wrought iron male thirty two dollars eight cents female zero dollar fisheries zero dollars for males and females virginia cotton male ten dollars eighteen cents female six dollars ninety eight cents wool males eighteen dollars seventeen cents females nine dollars ninety one cents pig iron males twelve dollars seventy six cents females six dollars eighty six cents iron castings males nineteen dollars ninety one cents females nine dollars forty four cents wrought iron males twenty five dollars forty one cents females zero dollars fisheries males twenty one dollars seventy cents females zero dollars wisconsin cotton zero dollars for males and females wool males twenty two dollars forty eight cents females zero dollars pig iron males thirty dollars females zero dollars iron castings males twenty six dollars seventy three cents females zero dollars wrought iron zero dollars for males and females fisheries males twenty one dollars fifty cents females zero dollars the number of hands employed in these manufactures is as follows cotton men employed thirty three thousand one hundred fifty men's average wages per month sixteen dollars seventy nine cents women employed fifty nine thousand one hundred thirty six women's average wages per month nine dollars twenty four cents wool men employed twenty two thousand six hundred seventy eight men's average wages per month twenty one dollars forty nine cents women employed sixteen thousand five hundred seventy four women's average wages per month eleven dollars eighty six cents pig iron men employed twenty thousand two hundred ninety eight men's average wages per month twenty one dollars sixty eight cents women employed one hundred fifty women's average wages per month five dollars thirteen cents iron castings men employed twenty three thousand five hundred forty one men's average wages per month twenty seven dollars thirty eight cents women employed forty eight women's average wages per month five dollars eighty seven cents wrought iron men employed sixteen thousand one hundred ten dollars men's average wages per month twenty seven dollars two cents women employed one hundred thirty eight women's average wages seven dollars thirty five cents fisheries men employed twenty thousand seven hundred four men's average wages per month twenty dollars forty nine cents women employed four hundred twenty nine women's average wages per month ten dollars eight cents total men employed one hundred thirty six thousand four hundred eighty one total women employed seventy six thousand four hundred seventy five pauperism from tables relating to pauperism in the united states we learn that in the year ending june one eighteen fifty when our population was twenty three million one hundred ninety one thousand eight hundred seventy six there were supported in whole or in part at public expense sixty six thousand four hundred thirty four natives sixty eight thousand five hundred thirty eight foreigners total of one hundred thirty four thousand nine hundred seventy two the cost of such support was two million nine hundred fifty four thousand eight hundred six dollars this is much less than the outlay in england where in the year eighteen forty eight there was expended six million one hundred eighty thousand seven hundred sixty four pounds sterling or over thirty million dollars the population being seventeen million five hundred twenty one thousand nine hundred fifty six crime there were confined in the various state prisons throughout the union on june one eighteen fifty four thousand six hundred forty three white males one hundred fifteen white females total whites four thousand seven hundred fifty eight eight hundred one colored males eighty seven colored females total colored eight hundred eighty eight aggregate five thousand six hundred forty six of these there were three thousand two hundred fifty nine native whites eight hundred sixty six native colored total natives four thousand one hundred twenty five 
1,499 foreign whites, 22 foreign colored, total foreign, 1,521, aggregate, 5,646. Intemperance. It need not be repeated that habits of intemperance and prostitution are closely allied. The following figures give the statistics of the breweries and distilleries in the United States. The total number of these establishments is 1,217 in which is invested a capital of eight million five hundred seven thousand five hundred seventy four dollars they employ six thousand one hundred forty hands and consume during the year three million seven hundred eighty seven thousand one hundred ninety five bushels of barley eleven million sixty seven thousand seven hundred sixty one bushels of corn two million one hundred forty three thousand nine hundred twenty seven bushels of rye fifty six thousand six hundred seven bushels of oats five hundred twenty six thousand eight hundred forty bushels of apples one thousand two hundred ninety four tons of hops sixty one thousand six hundred seventy five hogsheads of molasses their yearly production is one million one hundred seventy nine thousand four hundred ninety five barrels or forty two million four hundred seventy one thousand eight hundred twenty gallons of ale forty one million three hundred sixty four thousand two hundred twenty four gallons of whiskey etc six million five hundred thousand five hundred gallons of rum for a total of ninety million three hundred thirty six thousand five hundred forty four gallons if these stimulants were used in the united states exclusive of export or import the average allowance for each man woman and child in the community would be nearly four gallons per year the figures show how much we produce but will not aid the inquiry as to how much is consumed natives the words natives and foreigners have been so frequently used in the course of this investigation that the official census returns as to the relative numbers cannot but be interesting of the white population of the united states there were sixty seven point zero two per cent born in the state in which they are now living twenty one point three five per cent born in the united states but not in the state in which they are living for a total of natives of eighty eight point three seven per cent eleven point four six per cent born in foreign countries and point one seven per cent unknown natives for a total of one hundred per cent thus of every hundred white inhabitants of the united states eighty eight were natives of the soil of the free colored inhabitants there were ninety eight point five nine per cent natives point nine four per cent foreigners point four seven per cent unknown natives for one hundred per cent the slave population are for all practical purposes entirely native End of section 58。section 59 of the history of prostitution。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。Recording by Ramon Escamilla. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 59. Chapter 37. Part 1. New York. Remedial Measures. Effects of Prohibition. Required Change of Policy. Governmental Obligations. Prostitution Augmented by Seclusion impossibility of benevolent assistance necessity of sanitary regulations yellow fever effect of remedial measures in paris syphilitic infection not a local question present measures to check syphilis island hospital blackwell's island mode of admission vagrancy commitment on confession and its action on Blackwell's Island. Pecuniary results. Moral effects. Perpetuation of disease. Inadequacy of present arrangements. Discharges. Writs of habeas corpus and certiorari. How obtained and their effects. Public responsibility. Proposed medical and police surveillance requirements hospital arrangements to be entirely separated from punitive institutions medical visitation power to place diseased women under treatment and detain them till cured 
Refutation of Objections Quack Advertisers Constitution of Medical Bureau Duties of Examiners License System Probable Effects of Surveillance Expenses of the Proposed Plan Agitation in England The London Times on Prostitution Objections Considered Report from Medical Board of Bellevue Hospital on Prostitution and Syphilis Report from Resident Physician, Randalls Island, on Constitutional Syphilis Reliability of Statistics Resume of Substantiated Facts Having traced the causes and delineated the extent and effects of the evil of prostitution as it exists in New York at the present time, an evident duty is to inquire what measures can be devised to stay the march of this desolating plague in its ravages on the health and morals of the public. This is a problem, the solution of which has for centuries interested philanthropists and statesmen in different countries. They commenced with a the theory that vice could be suppressed by statutory enactments, and the crushing out process was vigorously tried under various auspices, until experience demonstrated that it virtually increased and aggravated the evil it was intended to suppress. At subsequent periods, however, different measures have been adopted with different results. It will be necessary, in the first place, to consider the effect of stringent prohibitory measures. The records given in the previous chapters of this work show what these have attempted, and they also show at the same time the uselessness of endeavoring to eradicate prostitution by compulsory legislation. The lash, the dungeon, the rack, and the stake have each been tried, and all have proved equally powerless to accomplish the object. Admitting that, in religion, morals, or politics, it is impossible to force concurrence in any particular sentiment, while a kindly persuasive plan may lead to its adoption, admitting that all attempts to compel prostitutes to be virtuous have notoriously failed, has not the time arrived for a change of policy? If, in direct ratio to the stringency of prohibitory measures, the vice sought to be exterminated has steadily increased, does not reason suggest the expediency of resorting to other measures for its suppression? It has been said that, History is philosophy teaching by example, and, if such instruction is well considered, none can fail to see therein an unanswerable argument against excessive severity in this matter. The several statutes prescribing prostitution have been detailed, and their specific results given, as gathered from the experience of various countries. At the time these laws were in force, it is hardly probable that their authors regarded them as unsusceptible of improvement and the question now arises for decision. In this age of general progress, is it not our duty to try the effect of some other line of action in this country? In common with other nations, we have passed laws intended to crush out prostitution, have made vigorous protests, on paper, against its existence, and there our labors have ended. The experience acquired in this course of legislation only demonstrates that such laws cannot be enforced so as to produce the desired effect. But why are they still retained on the statute books? Is it not an opprobrium upon our national character to allow them to exist, if they are never to be enforced? If they are powerless for good, effective only to increase the plague they were designed to check, why not expunge them at once and substitute others more practicable and more useful in their stead? A candid acknowledgment of error, whether by an individual or a community, is always a creditable and graceful act. It shows that experience has dictated a wiser course, that reflection and experiment have condemned the former plan. It is not to be supposed that any system of laws will entirely eradicate prostitution. History, social arrangements, and physiology alike forbid any such utopian idea. But will not a more enlightened policy do much toward diminishing it? Many of the present generation can recollect the time when it was considered right and proper to imprison an insolvent debtor, but this idea is now wisely repudiated by society, and no one will assert that the effect of the change has been to place any additional difficulties in the way of collecting legal claims. Capital punishment has been abolished in many cases, 
and yet it is a well-known fact that crime has diminished where this experiment has been tried this is more particularly the case in england where forgery which was punished with death is comparatively rare since the amelioration of the law a general conviction is becoming prevalent that the most effectual way to deal with criminals is to attempt to raise them above what they were in contradistinction to the old plan of sinking them lower it is now freely acknowledged that the elevating instead of the depressing process is consonant both with the spirit of our republican institutions and with humanizing policy even if american society is not yet prepared to take a course directly the reverse of its present prohibitory practice prudence dictates the adoption of some medium rule by which prostitution can be kept in check without being encouraged or allowed as in the prussian laws which expressly declare that the vice is tolerated but not permitted government should be patriarchal in its character and exercise an effective but parental supervision over all its subjects this is the living principle which gives vitality and strength to any organization and no satisfactory government can exist if it is absent now in regard to prostitutes admitting that they have erred still the people who constitute the government in this country are concerned in the matter and their mutual obligations their policy and their pecuniary interests require that these wandering members of the body corporate should have a reasonable opportunity for reformation which will give this opportunity most effectually to crush them under the weight of their own misdeeds or to adopt a liberal course likely to induce them to abandon their depraved habits one of the secrets which bound the soldiers of the empire to the standard of napoleon through all his battles and vicissitudes was the knowledge that france regarded them as her children and would not fail to protect and support them the words i am a roman citizen derived their magic power from the fact that the roman empire treated all her citizens as sons and watched over their interests with parental care the recent outburst of popular enthusiasm in our own country when the commander of an american national vessel rescued a citizen from threatened outrage in a foreign land was an emphatic recognition of the principle can we now consistently refuse to apply the rule to all who need our kindly care it may be considered a bold assertion that our present mode of dealing with prostitution is calculated to widely extend its prevalence yet the historical facts already given are sufficient to prove its truth without further argument the existing rule of treatment instead of suppressing the vice merely drives it into seclusion a result far different from the design and infinitely increasing its power to those secret haunts of prostitution resort the lowest and most depraved of the male sex with the full knowledge that a fundamental law of our commonwealth considers every house a castle into which no officer can enter unless armed with a special legal authority or called in to suppress an outrage the result of such seclusion is to confirm the vicious habits of the prostitutes and frequently to lead them to the commission of other and more heinous offenses again secrecy further augments prostitution by preventing the approach of those benevolent individuals who would feel a pleasure in advising and directing the daughters of misery for their real good philanthropists have organized prison associations and magdalene asylums to bear upon prostitution but they can only reach it in its lowest grades when the females become inmates of public institutions from destitution and disease reformers cannot come near the fountainhead and they are consequently now as far from the consummation of their praiseworthy intentions as when they commence their labors because prohibitory measures force prostitutes to take shelter in seclusion and it is only when women are consigned to our hospitals workhouses and penitentiaries that they become accessible by this time they are so far sunk in depravity as to afford very slender hope of reformation this is especially true of magdalene asylums there is indeed a field white unto the harvest for benevolent exertions in the most secluded haunts of prostitution if they could only be made accessible sympathy is worthily bestowed upon the sick or dying women transferred from public institutions to charitable organizations to alleviate the sorrows of their final sufferings to soothe the agony of the hour of death to divest of its terrors the passage from this world to the dread future is a work in which the heart of any christian must rejoice but it is only a part of the duties contemplated by such asylums 
while their projectors gladly administer the consolations of our holy religion to an expiring magdalene they also seek an opportunity to direct erring women to the paths of virtue during the life that still remains to them to guide them to a path in which they can retrace the false steps already taken and become useful members of society this opportunity for exertion is denied under the system which drives vice into seclusion turning now from considering the operation of repressive laws we notice the importance of sanitary and quarantine regulations one of the first cares of a good government is to preserve and promote the public health an illustration of this position occurred in the summer of eighteen fifty six when fears were entertained that the city would be visited by a frightful epidemic fever the public voice declared through the newspapers that the most rigorous and careful sanitary measures were needed and the cleaning of streets the removal of nuisances the purification of tenant houses and many other measures of the same kind were loudly called for and adopted as far as possible while the quarantine regulations of the harbor were strictly enforced in view of this danger so dreadful and apparently so imminent the united voice of public opinion sanctioned the very course advocated here namely the adoption of remedial or more properly speaking preventative measures venereal poison is as destructive although not so suddenly fatal as yellow fever and every motive of philanthropy and economy urges the necessity of effective means for its counteraction since remedial or preventative measures have been adopted in paris the number of cases of disease and the virulence of its form have materially abated this fact is asserted not merely on our own personal knowledge but also from the corroborative testimony of physicians who have had recent opportunities of investigating the subject in that capital the diminution can be easily explained by a comparison of the laws and regulations applicable to prostitution we in new york by our stringent prohibition drive the vice into seclusion and deprive ourselves of the means of watching either its progress or results while our french contemporaries insist that it shall be at all times open to the surveillance of properly appointed persons the extent of syphilitic infection in new york has been portrayed in the preceding chapter but the danger of contamination must not be viewed as a merely local question from its commercial importance its mercantile marine its centralization of railroads and canals and its facilities for river navigation this city is now the great point of arrival and departure of travelers and emigrants from and to all parts of the union foreigners reach here in large numbers every day intending to travel to other states if they remain in the city a few days only they are exposed to its temptations and may contract disease which by their agency will be perpetuated in the district they have selected as their future home returned adventurers from the pacific shores come here to find the readiest transit to their several destinations they are exposed to the same temptations with a probability of the same result merchants and storekeepers visit this commercial emporium to obtain supplies of goods and they are exposed to the same fascinations and the same contingencies the sailors in port are similarly liable in short it is scarcely possible to imagine the extent over which the syphilitic poison originating in the proud and wealthy city of new york may be spread nor would it be an error to describe the empire city as a hotbed where from the nature of its laws on prostitution syphilis may be cultivated and disseminated possessed then of indubitable proofs of the existence of syphilis and the knowledge that its range is more widely extended every day gathering additional malignity in its progress the next point is to inquire what measures have been adopted to check its ravages these have hitherto been found totally inadequate because based upon an erroneous theory namely the idea of suppression the principal public or free hospital where the venereal disease is confessedly treated is the penitentiary hospital on blackwell's island now known as the island hospital to obtain the benefit of medical treatment therein it is necessary that the patient should have been sentenced from the court of sessions to the penitentiary for the commission of some crime or committed to the workhouse by a police justice for vagrancy drunkenness or disorderly conduct from this fact it will be seen that there is strictly speaking no free hospital for such diseases 
as the only one intended for their treatment will or can receive none but those sentenced for an infraction of the laws. Still, the necessity for professional assistance compels many, both males and females, to submit to the degradation of a police commitment. Unfortunate women, or laboring men, find that they are suffering from infection. Possibly they have no money, or probably they have exhausted their funds in payments to charlatans, and so resort for aid and advice to some one of the public dispensaries. Unless the case is a slight one, the medical officers there advise them to resort to hospital treatment, to procure which the poor sufferers are furnished with a certificate of their state and directed to apply to a police justice. They follow this advice, and in nine cases out of ten, the magistrate's only remark is, Do you want me to send you to the hospital? The answer, of course, is in the affirmative, and he forthwith signs a printed commitment to the penitentiary or workhouse for a time named therein, and ranging from one to six months at the discretion of the magistrate. The following is a copy of one of these documents. Quote, City and County of New York, Silicet. By blank, Esquire, one of the police justices in and for the city of County of New York. To the constables and policemen of the said city, and every of them, and to the warden of the penitentiary of the city and county of New York. These are in the name of the people of the state of New York to command you, the said constables and policemen, to convey to the said penitentiary the body of blank, who stands charged before me with being a vagrant, viz., being without the means of supporting him or herself, and having contracted an infectious disease in the practice of debauchery, viz., the venereal disease, requiring charitable aid to restore him or her to health, whereof he or she is convicted of record on confession, the record of which conviction has been made and filed in the office of the clerk of the court of sessions of the city and county aforesaid, and it appearing to me that the said blank is an improper person to be sent to the almshouse, you, the said warden, are hereby commanded to receive into your custody, in the said penitentiary, the body of the said blank, and blank, safely keep for the space of blank months, or until he or she shall be thence delivered by due course of law. Given under my hand and seal, this blank day of blank month, in the year of our Lord one thousand eight hundred and fifty, blank. Blank, police justice. This is technically called a commitment on confession, and its effects are precisely the same as they would be if the individual had been convicted of any tangible act of vagrancy. He is in law and in fact a prisoner for the space of time named in the commitment. He must wear the prison garb and submit to the prison discipline, until the expiration of his sentence. It is well known to the justices that a penal commitment like the above will immediately secure the sufferer the medical attention his case requires, but they have no power to send any one direct to the hospital. And here an inquiry will naturally suggest itself. What does, or what should, a magistrate know about committing a sick person, and how can he decide the time such invalid shall remain under treatment? A self-evident conclusion will be that the whole process is an absurd one at the best, and its requirements a hardship on magistrates already overburdened with legitimate duties. The reader's attention is requested to the pecuniary effects of this plan. To illustrate, suppose the case of a man committed for six months. He is suffering from some form of venereal disease, and in this state is received at the penitentiary or workhouse, where his clothes are taken from him, the institution costume supplied, and the particulars of his name, age, nativity, occupation, etc., are registered with an abstract of the commitment by virtue of which he is detained. He is then subjected to medical examination and transferred to the hospital. In this institution he remains until cured, if that end is attained before the expiration of his sentence, and is then retransferred to the penitentiary or workhouse. The average time required for the successful treatment of the disease named in the Blackwell's Island Hospital will not probably exceed two months, and often a much shorter period is sufficient. 
but the man has been committed for six months, and for the unexpired four months of his incarceration he has to be fed, clothed, and lodged at the expense of the almshouse department. The labor he can perform will never amount in value to the actual cost of his support, so that he is maintained four months in accordance with law at a positive cost to the taxpayers of the city, because they have already supported him for two months in the hospital. In the aggregate of cases during a year, these costs amount to a very large sum. Need any farther argument be adduced to show the palpable absurdity of the system? A few words upon the moral effect of this local system upon prostitution in New York, premising that being a prostitute is acknowledged by all as a degradation, while a vagrancy commitment to the workhouse or penitentiary is a positive disgrace. The system is a portion of the crushing out plan already mentioned, and it says, in effect, we, the people of New York City, will give you an opportunity to be cured of your loathsome and destructive malady, but only upon the condition that you become the inmate of a penal institution. We know that you cannot be cured unless you accept our terms, and we will make those terms as hard and repulsive to human nature as ingenuity can devise. It has been a medical axiom that no two poisons can exist in the system at one and the same time. But the citizens of New York have been experimenting for some years to ascertain whether two moral poisons cannot be coexistent in the same person. By adding farther and unnecessary disgrace to the vice of prostitution, thus widening the gulf between the sinner and her possible return to virtue. The impolicy of making syphilis a reason for imprisonment, except so far as curative measures actually require it, must be apparent to all, were it merely from the fact that it deters many who are suffering from embracing the opportunity of cure until they are absolutely compelled to do so. How excessively wrong is this principle in a hygienic point of view must be evident. A directly contrary course, making the hospital attractive instead of repulsive, would be the true policy and would be the most economical in its results. Nor is it justice to the medical departments of our public institutions to clog their labors with a proviso which prevents their aid being sought until the last extremity, when it can only exert a palliative and not a curative agency. If syphilis could be reached in its primary stages, their task would be much less difficult and their services much more effectual whereas little or nothing can be accomplished when official regulations keep away the patients until the disease becomes constitutional and the mischief is done. As in morals, so is it in medicine. Any evil, to be treated with success, must be encountered in its first stage, and if our regulations preclude this opportunity, but slight hopes can be entertained of any good results. Under a more liberal system, the physician and the philanthropist could combine their efforts. The former would not have to encounter disease inveterately fixed on a broken-down constitution. The latter would not find his benevolent designs frustrated by a lengthened career of depravity now become habitual. The effect of the provision which offers medical aid to prisoners only is that every woman of the town will try all possible means to dispense with the treatment. It is only when she has actually fallen to the lowest deep of her class when one step more will plunge her into a bottomless abyss of helplessness and hopeless woe, that she will voluntarily accept the proffered aid. She will endure torture from her maladies, or rely upon the assistance of empirics, and submit to all their extortions, rather than become a prisoner. But when every resource is exhausted, and her physical torments plainly tell her that she must obtain medical relief or die, then she submits. Once in the hospital, she is relieved, after a period of protracted sickness, and leaves it to return to her old haunts, because she can go nowhere else, the law having affixed the additional disgrace of imprisonment upon her former bad character. Sociality is a characteristic of human nature, and if these women cannot gain admission to any company but that of the vicious and abandoned, they prefer that to solitude. Returned once more to her former associates, the time soon comes when farther medical assistance is needed, and thus she alternates for a few months or years between prison, hospital, and brothel, till death puts an end to her sufferings, and a nameless grave in Potter's Field receives the remains of one whom charitable measures, properly applied, might possibly have made a useful member of society. 
The sense of shame which follows a single deviation from the paths of virtue drives many women to prostitution. Why add to the existing sense of shame another infamy when she unfortunately contracts disease? Can we consistently blame her if she becomes callous when every legal provision directly tends to injurate her sensibilities? The misconduct of parents toward children has been shown as one of the causes of prostitution. The father or mother drives from the paternal roof the child who has committed but a single error. Then, under the pressure of hunger, she inevitably sins more deeply, becomes diseased, applies to the public for relief, and is sentenced to imprisonment. The first mistake, that of the parents, makes her vicious. The second mistake, incarceration, confirms her in vice. We denounce such ill-treatment in the parents, while practically we ourselves, as the natural guardians of all who need assistance, are doing precisely the same thing. Where, then, is our consistency? If it is right for us, a body corporate, to practice such cruel oppression, is it not equally justifiable for each member of the body to act in the same manner in his individual capacity? Of course, what is right for the multitude must be right for the individual, and our own conduct convicts us of inconsistency. We have no warrant to condemn parents for single acts which we perform collectively. Or, if we are right in censuring them, we are wrong in performing the same acts ourselves. If they are reprehensible, we also are culpable. This system, with all its absurdity, its prejudicial effect on public health, and its obvious tendency to immorality, is not adequate to stay the destroying scourge. On the contrary, it is likely to extend its ravages. If a prostitute, arrested and committed to Blackwell's Island for drunkenness or any disorderly conduct, is found to be diseased, or if she commits herself knowing that she is infected, she is immediately placed under medical charge she will probably remain contentedly in the hospital until the worst symptoms of the disease are subdued. By this time, the discipline of the institution has become irksome to her. She communicates with the brothel-keeper, with whom she formerly boarded, or with some lover or acquaintance, who sues out a writ of certiorari or habeas corpus, which instantly effects her discharge. She now returns to her former haunts, half-cured, again to aid in disseminating disease, farther to undermine her own constitution, and to infect men who will in turn become a charge upon taxpayers, or by their agency cause others to become thus liable. The instance of wholesale release mentioned in the previous chapter will recur to the mind of the reader. The experience of almost every day confirms these statements. It is well known that there are those who hang around the various police courts expressly to attend to such business, and who make a large income from this source, exclusive of other matters pertaining to prostitution in which they occasionally exert their abilities. The vagrancy commitments by which women are sent up are generally insufficient, and there is no legal power to detain them and force them to submit to the treatment they so much require. It has been asserted by legal men of high standing that nearly the whole of the commitments issued by police justices are defective, and that there exists in law no impediment to the immediate discharge of every prostitute now on Blackwell's Island. The public can readily perceive the necessary inefficiency of these institutions so far as the prevention of venereal disease is concerned. The facility with which prostitutes committed to Blackwell's Island can obtain their discharge may be attributed to want of care in making out the commitments. A recent statute, 1854, prescribes the form in which these should be made, requiring the recital of admitted or substantiated facts, and the filing of a copy of the original in the office of the clerk of the Court of Sessions. These requirements are not observed, and the reason assigned by magistrates is that their own time and the time of their clerks is so fully occupied by the press of business before them that they cannot proceed as minutely as the Act directs. This confirms the view already expressed of the impolicy and impropriety of placing such onerous and extrajudicial duties upon the justices. But as they would be liable to be sued for false imprisonment if they committed under this act without observing all its requirements, they issue their commitments in the old form required by the revised statutes, and are sheltered thereby from ulterior consequences. 
These commitments direct the persons to be confined in the penitentiary, but the local arrangements of Blackwell's Island require them to be sent to the workhouse, and unless this transfer is actually made in each case by the governors of the almshouse, for they cannot deputize their power, it is a waiver of the right of custody, and consequently entitles the prisoner so transferred to a discharge. It has been claimed that the workhouse is part of the penitentiary, but this point has been overruled, because the statute establishing the workhouse plainly shows a contrary intent. A prisoner is entitled to a discharge on another ground, namely, because the commitment has not been filed as directed, or, on another ground, that the commitment does not recite the evidence by which the fact of vagrancy was proved. A final ground of discharge, which is never pressed till all the minor technicalities have failed, is that the whole proceeding is illegal because the statute of 1854 has not been complied with. On these grounds, a writ of certiorari or habeas corpus is sued out, the preliminary steps being a petition from the prisoner or his friend, setting forth that he is illegally detained, an affidavit of verification, and a certificate of the clerk of the court of sessions that the commitment has not been filed in his office. Upon the presentation of these documents, the judge to whom application is made issues the required writ, and specifies the time at which it shall be returnable. The action of the two writs is similar, excepting that a writ of habeas corpus requires the production of the prisoner before the judge, in addition to a return of the cause of detention, while a writ of certiorari only requires a return of the cause of detention. The return is made by the person having custody of the prisoner, and consists of a copy of the commitment under which he is held, and, from the already stated informality of these documents, it will be apparent there can be no legal ground for his detention. The judge is strictly prohibited from entertaining any question beyond the legality of the papers, with the moral aspect of the question he cannot interfere, and as the commitments are generally informal, he has no alternative but to discharge the prisoner. Application for these writs must be made in the name of an attorney, but such name is often used by an agent who transacts the business and divides the fee with his principal. End of section 59 Recording by Ramon Escamilla Conway, Arkansas R-A-M-O-N-E-S-C-A-M-I-L-L-A dot wordpress dot com Section 60 of the History of Prostitution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ramon Escamilla The History of Prostitution by William Singer Section 60, Chapter 37, New York, Remedial Measures, Part 2 from this sketch, it will be evident that, if the prescribed form were observed in these commitments, frequent discharges would be avoided, or there would be so many difficulties to surmount that they would be very rarely attempted. Does no responsibility rest upon the public and on our lawmakers for negligence in this matter? Without conceding that a vagrancy commitment is likely to reform a prostitute, in fact, the weight of the evidence is against the possibility of its doing so, the case stands thus. The legislature has provided a mode of relief which was deemed effectual at the time, but this mode is evaded, or cannot be observed, by those upon whom its administration devolves. The public have long known the existence of these difficulties, but have never interfered to give us a better act. By their refusal to interfere, they stand in the position of aiders and abettors in this neglect, or worse than neglect, the actual propagation of a dreadful disease. Had public opinion been concentrated upon this matter, an inquiry would long ago have shown the fallacy of our present system, and suggested the required amendments. This has not been done, but public remissness in no way diminishes public responsibility. This doctrine of public accountability may be profitably examined for a few moments in connection with the general aspect of prostitution. Few will deny that the mass of the people are answerable for many of its evils. They are cognizant of the existence of vice in the aggregate, if not in detail. They can understand its effects, 
and are not ignorant of the principal causes which lead to it. Yet they make no effort to remove existing causes or to prevent future evils. They practically treat women as an inferior race of beings, and cannot even give a poor seamstress employment without saying, in fact, if not in words, you cannot be trusted to make this unless a man examines every buttonhole and inspects every row of stitching to see that you are not defrauding us. The only way to secure confidence is to bestow confidence. But if a person is treated in a manner likely to destroy self-respect, the inevitable result will be a recklessness as to his or her own character. Despised without a cause, treated in mere business matters as imbeciles, or children, or thieves, it is not surprising that women become careless as to their future life, and, smarting under the injustice of their position, too frequently degenerate into the wretched beings who infest our streets and pollute the atmosphere with their deadly infection. The public, then, are responsible for this prostitution because they have never bestowed any attention upon it. It is one of the gravest and most difficult of social problems, involving the interests of every man in the community, and yet the most stupid indifference has been shown respecting it. The subject has been canvassed by medical men on account of its sad effects upon the physical organization. Its extent has been known to judicial and police authorities from its social and civil results but the great body of the public have hitherto decided that they know nothing and want to know nothing about it. They admit its existence, being too evident to be denied, but so far they have taken no steps to ascertain its source or stay its progress, because it was a matter with which they were afraid to interfere, and now the deplorable consequences accruing from it must be laid to their charge. It cannot be denied that there are many difficulties attending any investigation of this vice, that many well-meaning but timid people entertain the opinion that it is one of those gangrenous ulcers upon society which cannot be alluded to except in whispers, that more harm would result from instituting inquiries than if it were allowed to exist and fester on unnoticed. This apathy, which has heretofore been the policy, has made prostitution the monster evil which it now is, and upon those who have advocated, or may advocate, a continuance of the same course of silence and inaction, the sufferers from the vice may justly charge their destruction. The masterly inactivity of the statesman is unquestionably justifiable in any case where passive resistance will overcome an evil, but in dealing with prostitution a diametrically opposite method must be pursued. It requires an active aggression upon all old prejudices, an explosion of still older theories, a vigorous commencement of a new course. It has been shown elsewhere that the public are responsible for prostitution, because they persist in excluding women from many kinds of employment for which they are fitted, while for work in those occupations which are open to them they receive an entirely inadequate remuneration. It has also been shown that the community are equally responsible on account of their non-interference with known and acknowledged evils. Another reason why accountability cannot be evaded may be designated, namely, the carelessness or more properly, heartlessness, with which the character of woman is treated. Let there be but a breath of suspicion against her fair fame, no matter from what vile source it may emanate, and the energies of man seem directed toward her destruction. She is down, keep her down, is the almost universal cry, and this malignant process is continued until the victim is positively forced into a life of undisguised immorality. The sacred decision, let him that is without sin among you cast the first stone, is entirely forgotten, and the most violent in their denunciations are frequently those who are the most blameworthy themselves. The whole force of the world's opinion has been directed, not to the censure of actually guilty parties who induced the crime, but to the poor wronged sufferer. She, who is too infrequently the victim of falsehood and deceit, or the slave of an absolute necessity, must expiate her fault by submitting to a constant succession of indignities and annoyances. He, whose conduct has made her what she is, escapes all censure. But some moralist will ask, How would you have us treat such women? Treat them, sir, as human beings, actuated by the same passions as yourself, as susceptible beings, keenly sensitive of reproach, as injured beings, who have a claim upon your kindness as outraged beings who have a demand upon your justice. 
lead them into a path by which they can escape from danger, protect the innocent from the snares which environ them on every side, and when this is done, pour the vials of your hottest wrath on those of your own sex whose machinations have blighted some of God's fairest created beings. Public responsibility must be understood in its broadest and most literal sense, as meaning the individual accountability of every member of the community. The time has not yet arrived, unfortunately, when this matter can be left in the hands of corporations or legislatures. Their constituents must be aroused to consideration of its importance before any satisfactory action can or will be taken by them, and it is to the thinking men of the age that these pages are addressed. In the full confidence that so soon as their sympathies are enlisted, public action will follow. To this end, an endeavor has been made to show the injurious effects of prohibition, disappointing expectation as a means of decreasing syphilis, or of curtailing the limits of prostitution, the necessity which exists for effectual preventative measures, and the inefficient, or worse than inefficient, nature of the local arrangements of New York to accomplish this desideratum. Thus the way for a consideration of the remedial process has been opened, and now with such evidence as he has before him the reader may be asked, in all sincerity, if he does not seriously believe that it would be a prudent step, instead of trying to extirpate the evil, to place prostitutes and prostitution under the surveillance of a medical bureau in the police department. Extirpation never has been, never can be accomplished in any community. Repression and restriction, as proposed, have been tried and have proved successful. Assuming an affirmative answer to this question, and it is difficult to imagine it otherwise if the facts are dispassionately considered, attention is respectfully requested to the manner in which the change could be effected. To meet the exigencies of the case there are required 1. A suitable hospital for the treatment of venereal disease. 2. A legally authorized medical visitation of all known houses of prostitution with full power to order the immediate removal of any woman found to be infected to the designated hospital. 3. The power to detain infected persons under treatment until they are cured, a term of time which none but medical men can decide. By a suitable hospital is meant an institution devoted to the treatment of such diseases, like the special hospitals of Paris and other continental cities, and entirely removed from all connection with any punitive establishment. The rules proposed for the government of the island hospital, when its name was changed from penitentiary hospital, do not, by any means, meet the urgent requirements of the case. The penitentiary, its officers and inmates, must be entirely shut out from the desired hospital, and no prison warden or keeper of criminals must have any jurisdiction within its walls or over its grounds. Inmates of hospitals have too long endured the stupid interference of non-medical men, and it is time that medical law exclusively was considered in the direction and management of buildings devoted to medical purposes. This is especially necessary in a syphilitic hospital, on account of the character of its patients. No amount of imprisonment as a punishment ever yet reformed a prostitute, and it never will. All intercourse with prisoners, be it ever so transient, has but confirmed women in vice. The tendency of imprisonment is directly contrary to any reformation, confirming previous habits instead of rooting them out. The instinctive dread of incarceration has prevented many from availing themselves of the medical advantages offered them, particularly among the better and higher grades of frail women. We want a hospital exclusively for the treatment of syphilis, with the power to place and keep there all women so diseased until cured. Matters of detail can be arranged in such a manner as to admit of a proper classification, based upon the degree of moral turpitude belonging to each. Payment could and should be required from all who possess the means, for expenses actually incurred, and this would contribute a considerable sum to meet the expenditures of the institution. Among these women, as a body, there exists an excessive amount of pride. Those of the upper class will not associate with any of a lower rank, and in fact look upon them in very much the same manner that moralists regard the whole body. To be enabled to reach them at all, a liberal management must be adopted. But will not this be deferring to vice because it is dressed in silks or satins? Ask someone. Most decidedly not. Let the arrangements be what they might. 
such a hospital as described would afford no encouragement to vice, for in it all must submit to the same course of treatment, varied only in the minor accessories which surround it. Even if the arrangements were exposed to an objection like the above, the end would justify the means. The city of New York contains, at this day, venereal infections sufficient to contaminate all the male population of the United States in a very short space of time. It has been proved from official and medical statistics that this malady is rapidly on the increase, and a paramount question is how to be relieved of the incubus. Rigorous prohibitory measures will not effect this, they only make the matter worse. Punitive hospitals will not effect this, they have been tried and found wanting. Free institutions would, in all probability, succeed in accomplishing far more than any other measure our citizens have ever tried. The question is one, if not absolutely of life, certainly of healthy existence, and its inestimable importance must override all doubts and difficulties. In view of the dangers surrounding our rising generation, even supposing the men and women of the present day exempt from them, it would be perfectly inexcusable to refuse any available plan because some one of its features might not please all tastes. Adopt an arrangement similar to that suggested, and if any crudities are discovered, they can be readily cured as experience points them out. The plan is not presented as a perfect one, but merely as an outline sketch of what is necessary. A regular medical visitation of all prostitutes is an essential part of the scheme, and its organization should be a matter of serious consideration. The Parisian plan already submitted might form a very good basis, and an arrangement which throws the whole system of prostitution open to an effective police supervision and the establishment of a medical bureau in connection therewith for professional purposes is suggested as most desirable. This medical visitation, conducted by physicians to be connected with the police department and sustained by the power of that body, should be confided to men of recognized skill and known integrity. To ensure public confidence, so essentially necessary in the inception of any social innovation, it would be necessary that the agents upon whom its execution devolved should be men of tried probity and acknowledged reputation, both professional and personal. The slightest symptom of disease should be sufficient evidence to warrant the immediate removal of any woman to the syphilitic hospital. The residence of any woman be it temporary or permanent, in a known house of prostitution must subject her to a medical examination, as it would afford a very strong presumption that she was there for immoral purposes. The propriety of a medical examination of prostitutes at certain intervals cannot be doubted, and, in fact, it is practically admitted at the present time by some few of the brothel keepers in the city. These pay a physician a liberal salary to visit their boarders every few days for the express purpose of carrying out the plan suggested now, resorting to treatment whenever he finds it necessary. Some of the most aristocratic houses of prostitution are thus attended, but the system is in use especially among the natives of continental Europe, who are now keeping houses of ill fame in New York, and who, in bringing to the new world many of the customs of the old, have thus testified to the benefit of the regulations enforced there. But although such visiting physician may pronounce a girl infected, the world has no security that she will not continue her avocation, and in order to remove all doubt upon this question she should be instantly removed to an institution where she cannot possibly propagate the malady. This must be done under conjoint medical and police authority. Among prostitutes of the lower grades, systematic visitation is more imperatively necessary. They will not place themselves under medical treatment unless they are compelled, but until their disease assumes a character that prevents the possibility of farther concealment from their visitors, they continue to ply their loathsome and destructive trade. The summit of ambition with them is to keep their liberty. So long as they can earn enough to provide themselves a shelter and feed their ravenous appetite for intoxicating liquor, they are content to submit to the pains and ravages of syphilis, alike heedless of their own sufferings and the injuries they inflict on others. We have had cases under our own professional treatment where women have actually persevered in this course for many weeks after they had become aware they were diseased, solely for the reasons indicated. It may be objected that such a plan would offer a premium to lewdness by circumscribing the dangers of infection, but this argument can have little weight as it is scarcely possible that promiscuous sexual intercourse can be carried on much more extensively than it is at present. 
the vice seems to have reached its culminating point. Experience proves that in all ages of the world there have been many men whose passions were so violent and ill-regulated that they would attain their gratification at any risk, even though that risk included the probability of venereal infection. As in games of hazard, every player hopes to be a winner, so in carnal indulgences every man flatters himself that, because some gratify their lusts unscathed for a long series of years, so may he. That as hitherto he has escaped disease in his unhallowed amours, he may continue equally fortunate to the end of his career. This is confessedly a poor dependence, but it is the reliance of hundreds and thousands of the followers of her whose house is the way to hell. Diseases of a syphilitic nature are viewed by some persons as special punishments for special sins, and hence they argue that it would be an interference with the order of providence to attempt to eradicate them. The discussion of a theological question would be altogether out of place in these pages, but the supposition may be met by a parallel case. Delirium tremens is the result of an excessive use of intoxicating liquors, and may justly be considered a special punishment for that offense. But did anybody ever know a case in which those who object to the treatment of syphilis extended a single obstacle to the case of a drunkard? If it is right to adopt curative measures in one case, why exclude them in the other? But even supposing that the treatment of syphilis is open to this objection so far as the guilty parties are concerned, shall their descendants be involved in suffering because the parents sinned? If a rigorous medical examination offers additional inducements to prostitution by reducing the probabilities of disease, it also guarantees that helpless wives and unborn children shall not be included in its list of victims. Go to the thousands of married women now childless or suffering from abortion. Ask their opinion. Go to the thousands of disappointed husbands whose hopes of offspring have been blighted in consequence of their own youthful dissipation. Ask their opinion, and see what the answers would be. Go and ask the diseased children on Randall's Island, and in their emaciated frames read their testimony. The evidence thus obtained would prove unanswerable arguments in favor of the plan proposed. It cannot be imagined that forcing diseased women to submit to a specific routine of treatment in a special hospital involves any undue interference with their personal liberty. The right to commit a wrong, be it social, moral, or physical, never can exist. The slightest reflection upon such a proposition will at once prove it untenable. The spread of venereal disease is a positive wrong, and therefore a woman who is suffering from it, and is certain or likely to propagate it, is as legitimate an object for compulsory treatment as would be a maniac whom we should find roaming through the streets of the city, or a person afflicted with smallpox, yellow fever, or any other contagious or infectious malady. If either of these cases were to come before any member of the community, he would not for one moment regard it an infringement of personal liberty to place the subject under proper care and restraint. On the contrary, he would think of the danger to which he and his family were exposed, and, flinging theory to the winds, would immediately urge prompt and practical measures. This is all that is asked respecting prostitution. Let the public be once thoroughly convinced of the extent and danger of syphilitic infection, and there would be but few objectors to these suggestions. Among that few, the principal portion doubtless would be the advertising empirics, whose disgusting announcements occupy so much space in the columns of our daily journals. That they derive a large income from this source is indisputable, and it is equally certain that if the recommendations now made were adopted, they would find their occupation gone. Speaking in all candor, the health, decency, and good morals of the city would be better cared for in their absence than it now is, with all the combinations of their extraordinary success, unequaled experience, and unparalleled facilities. In a financial view, the money they extort, we refrain from using a harsher term, from their credulous patients, could be far better applied than in contributing to their wealth. Farther, such an institution and organization as has been described would be useless did it not possess the absolute power to retain every patient under treatment until cured. Whatever modification of principle or mode of action may be ultimately adopted, and sooner or later something must be done, this is an indispensable requisite. One half the danger of venereal infection arises from imperfectly cured cases. Under the existing system, as already explained, 
writs can be issued at an almost nominal cost to remove any or all of the prostitutes now under medical treatment on Blackwell's Island, and such an abuse of a valuable privilege on account of mere technical errors must be fatal to the success of any remedial project. It would be as reasonable for a lawyer to petition the courts to order a vessel detained in quarantine by the Board of Health because she was infected with yellow fever to be brought to her wharf in the city, and there to have permission to disseminate the disease on board, as it is for the same individual to apply for a writ of certiorari, the effect of which is to take an abandoned woman reeking with disease from an institution where she is under treatment, and allow her to extend the venereal poison to every one who may have intercourse with her. This must not be understood as indicating a wish to curtail the constitutional privileges attached to writs of habeas corpus or certiorari, but merely their applicability to cases like the supposed one. How can the evil be prevented? Simply by making any legislative enactment on the subject so plain that it cannot be misunderstood or evaded. No lawyer would find any difficulty in drafting a short act giving the police department the power based upon an affidavit made by a member of their own medical bureau, to remove any diseased woman to a proper hospital, and retain her there until cured. It may appear to a casual observer that this detention would be of the same nature as the imprisonment required by the existing mode, but a little thought will point out a wide difference. Now we force a woman to become an inmate of a penitentiary, and add disgrace to her disease by assuming her to have been guilty of crime. Then we should require her to become an inmate of the hospital, with no additional disgrace but that arising from the fact that she had contracted syphilis by vicious habits. In the one case, we make her the companion of some of the vilest wretches on the face of the earth. In the other, she would have no associates but those of her own class. The medical bureau to whom these reforms should be entrusted, although connected with the police department, would require to be an independent body so far as professional duties are concerned. Its connection would be necessary because there would be many cases requiring the intervention of the civil power, and its isolation would be equally important because much would depend on the discretion of the examiners, and many contingencies might arise where a strict line of routine duty would defeat the object in view. They would be literally a detective corps, and with a known amount of duty before them must be left to choose their own method of performing it. Any definite arrangements or positive orders from a non-medical board would only embarrass their action, for medical and non-medical executives always clash when they aim at one common object. Of course, a leading requirement in their instructions must be that their examinations be rigid and thorough. No halfway measures in this respect could meet the absolute demands of the case, or satisfy the expectations of the community. It must be plainly understood by the world that the Medical Bureau was required to perform its whole duty, uncompromisingly and fearlessly, and that its members were men who would not evade the responsibility. In their investigations, many cases would occur where their services would be valuable to society, beyond the pale of professional duty. It is not to be expected that they would become evangelists, but they could be the willing and efficient coadjutors of those who delight to bear the gospel to these poor degraded beings, and even while listening to a recital of bodily sufferings, instances would arise where the acts of the Good Samaritan would be required at their hands. They would be the depositaries of many a narrative of wrong and outrage, of sorrow and suffering, and it is not unreasonable to believe that of the histories poured into their ears, some would indicate a channel by which the lost one might be restored to home and friends and virtue, or point to some chord in the mind which would give a responsive sound when touched by the hand of pity. The adoption of these suggestions would be, at least, a step in the right direction, and lay the foundation of a system which can be gradually enlarged until it embraces regulations as to registry, management of houses of ill fame, etc., to the same extent as is now done in Europe. And here a few words relative to the licensing system may not be inappropriate. The propriety of granting licenses, and thus making vice a sort of revenue, is open to grave objections. But on the other hand acknowledged social evils have, ere this, been made to contribute to the public funds. Witness the dealing in ardent spirits. The city does now, and has for years, derived a considerable income from licenses to sell liquors. 
a great number of wise and good men contend that the sale or use of intoxicating beverages is not only an unmitigated evil, but even criminal. They have entertained and publicly declared these sentiments for years, but still the license system is continued. It may be a question for decision whether prostitution is not as liable for taxation as drunkenness, and if both were equally taxed, whether, as a body, we should not be more responsible for the results of one or the other. En passant, it may be noticed that an annual tax of 1% upon the property engaged in the business of prostitution, and a similar assessment upon the revenue of houses of ill fame, would amount to over $100,000. The plan here shadowed forth would not be likely to extend prostitution, but on the contrary there is very little doubt but it would check it. Even if it did not, the community would reap an advantage in the sanitary reform it would enforce. In low neighborhoods, many of the brothels are as dangerous to public health on account of their crowded and excessively filthy state as are the syphilized inmates themselves. Such places would legitimately come within the province of the medical inspectors, and their reports thereon to the police executive would ensure immediate attention. Public morals would be advanced by such visitations. These houses, or a great number of them, are the result of all species of dishonest characters, who would unquestionably abandon them, at least as places of residence, if they knew they were at any moment liable to a domiciliary visit. Again, almost every person has in his remembrance some female who left home and could not be found, because securely secreted in some one of these houses of prostitution. At least it is not uncommon to read of such cases in the daily papers, accompanied with an account of the unsuccessful search of her friends and the police. Occurrences like this could not take place if all known houses of bad repute were under the surveillance of the medical police department nor is it unreasonable to hope that prostitution would be diminished. It has flourished of late years in seclusion, but our plan would render privacy impossible. Seclusion has attracted many unfortunate women, whom shame or a dread of exposure would have deterred had they known that houses of ill fame were always open to the visits of the police, or that every few days a physician would make a tour of inspection and a personal examination to which they must submit. Generally speaking, these women have a dread of falling into the hands of a doctor, and in present circumstances they know that a medical examination is optional with themselves, until they become so sick as to render it unavoidable. But if their miserable life were burdened with the additional annoyance of a compulsory medical treatment, it is probable that a considerable check might be imposed thereon. Public decency would be advanced by such visitations. To effectually perform their duties, the medical bureau and the general police department would find it necessary to make themselves personally acquainted with these women, and to keep a register of all houses where prostitution was carried on. Now, the prohibition which has driven it into secrecy has also rendered it difficult to determine who are frail. Prostitutes are found in hotels, fashionable restaurants, steamboat excursions, watering places, and suburban retreats. They visit balls and other public entertainments, sometimes by sufferance, but more frequently because they are not known. It is needless to say how virtuous women can be annoyed and insulted by such companionship, or to what extent prostitutes can use their influence in miscellaneous society. If the police were personally acquainted with these women, they could act in the same manner as on the continent of Europe, namely, touch them upon the shoulder and quietly give them a hint to leave. Or another reform could easily be introduced, the confinement of all prostitutes to particular localities in the city so as to limit their influence. This would be tantamount to the ancient regulations prescribing their dress or some distinctive mark, and to the present arrangements in Europe, where the houses are distinguished by some specified peculiarity. It would also prevent the depreciation of property which takes place in any neighborhood where a brothel is established. End of section 60 Recording by Ramon Escamilla, Conway, Arkansas. R a m o n e s c a m i l l a. dot wordpress. dot com. Section sixty one of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ramon Escamilla The History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 61 Chapter 37 New York Remedial Measures Part 3 Public decency would be served in another manner. It is a most humiliating admission that New York is fast approaching to the condition of certain foreign cities, where unnatural practices first led to the contemplation and adoption of these or similar remedial measures. In our case, they are known to the authorities, but are so revolting that they never have been, and never can be, made public. Of course, such an organization would take special cognizance of these detestable abominations. Objections to the expense of the plan may be raised, and it cannot be denied that it will be large, yet it will be a matter of economy to incur it, even at the risk of increasing taxation, which it will not do. Recollect that every year, as the virulence of syphilis was abated, the cause of the expense would diminish, and that, in a direct ratio to the energy displayed in the examination, would be the progressive reduction of expenditure. It has already been indicated how some of the inmates of a syphilitic hospital, from whom hitherto nothing has been received, could be made to contribute their quota of the cost. Now the public bear all the expenses, either as assessments or as private payments in individual attacks. The magnitude of the latter item has been already estimated, and were it possible to calculate in addition the value of lost time, the injury to business, and the deterioration of the Constitution, the total in one year would be far more than sufficient to carry out the whole of this plan for double the time. It would also be economy to incur the outlay on account of the benefits to succeeding generations. Syphilis is not confined in its effects to the lifetime of the men or women who contract it, but is entailed on their descendants. These, provided they survive its baneful effects during infancy, are mentally and physically unfitted for business or the active pursuits of life, and consequently are frequently indebted for the means of sustenance to their friends or to public institutions. If the liability to that disease among parents can be removed, no fears need be entertained about their children. We are not so sanguine as to imagine that all the good efforts above enumerated could be accomplished instanter. It would be a work of time, but the sooner it is commenced, the better for all the interests involved. Many persons will say, Oh, these evils do not concern us. These diseases will never injure us or ours. Why should we trouble ourselves and give our money, time, and attention to such matters? Stop, reader. While human passion exists, and while the means of gratifying it can be obtained, you and yours can and will, nay, do now, suffer from it, directly or indirectly. The first question for any citizen to ask himself is, can prostitution be abolished? Can it be crushed out? If this be answered in the negative, as it must be, then the next question brings him to the point sought to be attained in these pages, namely, the means that shall be taken to circumscribe and diminish its consequent diseases and evils. This question has latterly been attracting some attention in England, and plans to mitigate the evil have been publicly discussed. The chief grounds of complaint, or at least those brought most prominently forward, were the assembling of prostitutes in the streets, the annoyance they caused to passengers, and the disorderly character of night-houses. This term is applied in London to those public houses, supper-rooms, wine-and-cigar saloons, etc., which are situated near the theatres and places of public entertainment, and, being permitted to remain open all night, become resorts for prostitutes. A public meeting for consultation upon these evils was held in London in January last, 1858, and the remarks made by some of the speakers are so much in accordance with the general tenor of this work as to be worth extracting. In justice to the writer, it must be premised that the preceding part of this chapter was penned twelve months before the report of this meeting was made public. The chairman observed, quote, that he was glad to see so general an interest elicited on this subject, and that he hoped it would lead to some practical result. It would, in fact, be impossible to aggravate the evil, 
for neither in Paris, Berlin, New York, nor even in the cities of Asia was there such a public exhibition of profligacy. End quote. The following resolutions were submitted and adopted. Quote, Resolved that a deputation do wait as early as possible upon Sir George Grey for the purpose of most respectfully but earnestly representing to Her Majesty's Government the necessity of effectual measures being taken to put down the open exhibition of street prostitution, which in various parts of the metropolis, particularly in the important thoroughfares of the Haymarket, Coventry Street, Regent Street, Portland Place, and other adjacent localities, is carried on with a disregard of public decency, and to an extent tolerated in no other capital or city of the civilized world. That such deputation be instructed to urge upon Her Majesty's government the following measures, whereby it is believed that the evil complained of may be effectually controlled. Firstly, the enforcement upon a systematic plan and by means of a department of the police specially appointed and instructed for that purpose, of the provisions of the second and third of Victoria, Capitulus 47, in reference to street prostitution, which provisions have in certain localities been heretofore carried out with the best effect, and in others have been ineffectual only because acted upon partially, and not upon any uniform system. And secondly, the passing an act for licensing and placing under proper regulations, as to supervision and hours of closing, all houses of entertainment, or for the supply of refreshments, intended to be open to the public after a certain fixed hour, it being a matter of public notoriety that the houses of this description, popularly known as night houses, have, by becoming the places of resort of crowds of prostitutes, and other idle and disorderly persons at all hours of the night, greatly contributed to the present disgraceful exhibition of street prostitution. That the attention of the government be also directed to the number of foreign prostitutes systematically imported into this country, and to the means of controlling this evil. End quote. The substance of one of the addresses made on the subject was as follows. The speaker, quote, begged to remind the meeting that a change had already been effected through the action of the police in the aspect of the Haymarket and Regent Street, heretofore so much complained of. The sense that the public eye was upon their class had caused a corresponding amendment in the dress and demeanor of the females frequenting those streets, and the objects of this association were, so far, in good train strongly oppressive or as some delicately said repressive measures could only be carried out by an extent of police interference inconsistent with the prejudices of english people who were indisposed to deny a large extent of personal freedom to persons of even the most disorderly classes who had not absolutely forfeited their civil rights if the association went the length of advocating that the act of prostitution should involve such forfeiture and the entire riddance of London streets from the presence of prostitutes, they would soon find their hands over full. Unless they thought it possible to exterminate the vice altogether, they would find that its wholesale clearance from the streets would necessitate registration, licensing, and confinement in certain authorized quarters or streets, as prevailed abroad. But such restrictions would entail a more ample recognition and legalization than had hitherto obtained and so ample indeed as to be very distasteful to what was called the religious public. It would be obviously unjust to exempt from pressure the ladylike prosperous harlot, while a miserable vulgar painted outcast was consignable, because she stood out from the picture somewhat broadly, to the police cell and the bridewell. The meeting must be aware that there was already abroad among the lower half-million of Londoners an impression that the police was already strict enough, and that this opinion was shared by numbers of intelligent men, neither paupers nor criminals. They must remember that many a gentleman of character had passed a night in a police cell for interfering in the defense of prostitutes against the police. And this sentiment would deepen very dangerously if the police pressure were put on double, or, as some would have it, tenfold. The very policemen, too, men sprung from the same class of society as those female offenders, were as likely as any one else to be faint-hearted in the work of relieving the eyes and ears of gentility from the presence of those whose situation they were not slow to trace to the schemes and desires of the genteel class. He did not think that the power of discrimination could be safely entrusted to the ill-paid constables of the Metropolitan Police, 
and the association of certain ratepayers with the police as witnesses, as hinted at by one of the delegates, would soon, if established, fall into desuetude. With the view of checking the evil in a satisfactory manner, he would recommend the institution of a special service of street orderlies or regulators in uniform, a well-paid, superior, temperate, and discreet class of men, if possible, whose function should be to observe, not to spy upon, all prostitutes, especially those of the street-walking order, and whose circulation, as opposed to loitering and haunting particular spots, they should insist upon. They should work not by threats, but by entreaty, advice, suggestion, but in the case of contumacy, should have the right to call in the regular force. He believed that the right of entry and inspection of all places of ill fame should be vested in the Home Secretary and his delegates, and this would be attained least oppressively by a proper system of licensing. Forced concentration would not be tolerated here, but concentration was valuable, as bringing immorality under more control. Parochial crusades, though prima facie a public blessing, had often the effect of spreading corruption. It was recollected at Cambridge that when a certain proctor made very frequent descents upon the hamlet of Barnwell, where much of the parasitical vices of that university had taken root, the people in question, far from cure or conversion, merely extended their radius into more rural villages. These were so soon corrupted that representations were addressed to the university by the parochial clergy, praying that the plague of Barnwell should be confined to its old bounds, and not let loose upon their simpler parishes. It was notorious that the same kind of thing followed on a very large scale the expulsion of prostitutes from Brussels, and it could not be supposed that the attempt to strangle the growth of immorality by broadcasting its seeds which was found impracticable under the powerful discipline of the English university and the Belgian capital, could answer among this enormous, and when roused, unmanageable population. The evicted of Norton Street, in the parish of All Souls, had settled quietly down in the next parish. Incompressible as water, the vice had but shifted its ground, and from a really moral point of view, more harm than good had accrued from the change. End quote. These remarks do not call for any amplification. A few days after the meeting, a leading article appeared in the London Times. It must be remembered that for many years the settled policy of the conductors of that journal has been to make it rather the exponent than the leader of public opinion, and the importance generally attached to it arises from a knowledge of this fact. We give the article almost entire. Quote, there is a very disagreeable subject which we are compelled to bring although most reluctantly, before the notice of the public, because it has become necessary to bring public opinion to bear upon it. Many clergymen and gentlemen are now associating themselves together for the purpose of dealing in some degree with the notorious evil of street prostitution. It is our earnest desire to give them all the support in our power, so long as they confine themselves to reasonable measures of discouragement and repression. Let us not nourish any visionary expectations. It would be simply idle to suppose that the evil against which we are now directing our efforts can be put down by the strong hand of power. It is with moral as with physical disease. There is no use in looking for an entirely satisfactory result from the treatment of symptoms. There may be alleviation, there may be diminution of the disorder, but there will be no perfect cure. Whatever tends to raise the standard of public morality will also tend to diminish prostitution. In such a case, we are dealing with two parties, the tempter, let us say, and the tempted, with the man and with the woman. It is probably with the first of the two that we should principally concern ourselves if we would bring about any serious result. It is on the sacred action of family life, with the thousand influences it brings to bear upon the minds and conduct of men, that we must chiefly depend if we would see any notable diminution in the numbers of those unfortunate creatures who now parade our streets. Let it be once understood that even among a man's fellows and associates immorality is a thing to be ashamed of, and at least we should get rid of the contagion of vice. Time was, and the time is not a very remote one, when a British gentleman, we speak of all three home divisions of the empire, would nightly stagger or be carried up to his bed fuddled, if not absolutely drunk. 
A man who should thus expose himself in our own days would be set down as a beast, and his society would be avoided by all who set store on their own good name. In this respect there has been a palpable improvement in the manners of the age. Surely public opinion can be brought to bear against one vice as well as another. The time may come when a man may shrink from presenting himself in the sacred circle of his mother, his sisters, and his other female relatives, reeking from secret immorality. Conscience can turn on a bull's-eye as well as a policeman, and the culprit may stand self-convicted, although no one has been there to convict him save himself. The influences, however, of which we speak are of slow growth, and cannot much be quickened by the hand of power. It has become necessary to deal at once with certain results. Now we say it with much shame that in no capital city of Europe is there daily and nightly such a shameless display of prostitution as in London. At Paris, at Vienna, at Berlin, as everyone knows, there is plenty of vice. But at least it is not allowed to parade the streets, to tempt the weak, to offend and disgust all rightly thinking persons. If any one would see the evil of which we speak in its full development, let him pass along the haymarket and its neighborhood at night, when the night houses and the oyster shops are open. It is not an easy matter to make your way along without molestation. In Regent Street, in the Strand, in Fleet Street, the same nuisance, but in a less degree, prevails. Now we are well aware that if all the unfortunate creatures who parade these localities were swept away tomorrow, if the night houses and oyster shops were closed by the police, we should not have really suppressed immorality. We should, however, have removed the evil from the sight of those who are disgusted and annoyed by its display, and still more, we should have removed it from the sight of those who, probably, had they not been tempted by the sight of these opportunities, would not have fallen. Now, as one practical measure for the discouragement of prostitution, all these night houses and others might be placed under the surveillance of the police. Licenses for opening them and keeping them open might be given only in the cases of persons who offered some guarantees of their respectability. They might be compelled to close at certain hours. In point of fact, the community could tolerate well nigh any degree of inconvenience inflicted upon their frequenters. In two other analogous cases, similar evils have been dealt with in this way, and with the happiest results. We speak of gaming houses and betting offices. It is quite certain that persons who are firmly resolved to play and to bet will affect their purpose even now but at least the sum of the evils resulting from these two vices has been greatly diminished since the community has resolved to withdraw from them its recognition. England should not grant her ex-equator to prostitution. This is one thing which might be tried. Another would be to give increased force to clauses which, as we believe, already exist in police acts, by which the police are empowered to stop the solicitation and gathering together of prostitutes in the public streets. In such a case, we must trample down definitions and exceptional cases with an elephant's foot, and go straight for results. The rule in all such cases is to give the power, and to leave it in the discretion of the authorities, only to employ it on the proper occasions. We have ample guarantees nowadays that such discretion cannot be abused. Here, then, are two things which may be done without opening any visionary trenches the police may be directed to deal with prostitutes as they do with mendicants, and the centers of pollution may be brought under proper regulation. We know well enough that in such a capital as London, it is hopeless to expect that vice of this description can be expunged altogether from the catalogue of our national sins, but at least let as many difficulties as possible be thrown in its way. Again, the benevolent persons who have taken it in hand to deal with this monstrous evil assert that the introduction of foreign prostitutes, or, what is still worse, of girls yet uncontaminated, for the purposes of prostitution, might be discouraged much more than it is, perhaps well nigh totally prevented. Undoubtedly, England does not desire free trade in prostitution. Preventive measures upon this subject are surrounded with difficulties, but that is no reason for despair, but for one additional exertion. Very numerous and influential meetings have been held upon this subject, and we augur well of their success. 
There was no display of ultra-puritanic rigor, no attempt to deal with impossibilities. The speakers in the main contended that the public exhibition of prostitution might be successfully dealt with, even if the vice were beyond their reach. Our streets, at least, can be purged of the public scandal, the disgraceful night-houses may be deprived of their powers of corruption, the keepers of brothels may be brought under the lash of the law, and the importation of foreign prostitutes may be diminished, if not put down altogether, if the public will take the subject up in earnest. Such were the principal points on which the speakers insisted. At least their views deserve a trial. End quote. This plan is calculated to restrict prostitution by placing it under surveillance. It requires no additional licensing system, as every public house, wine shop, or cigar shop in London, whether kept open at day or night, whether of a respectable or immoral class, requires a license under the excise laws. The proposals just quoted urge that the permission to keep these places of entertainment should be limited, and, quote, given only in the cases of persons who offered some guarantees of their respectability, end quote. It will be necessary for the reader to bear in mind that night houses are not houses of prostitution, but merely resorts for prostitutes, as already mentioned, as, in default of this, a natural construction would be that the Times proposed to license brothels. The two are as distinct as possible, and it would be as consistent to style some of the fashionable oyster saloons and restaurants of New York houses of ill fame because abandoned women resort to them, as to class the night houses of London in that catalogue. They are simply places for public refreshment in the neighborhoods of theaters, markets, etc., which are permitted to continue open all night in deference to a supposed public requirement, and though, from the character of their visitants, they cannot be considered schools of morality or decency, yet no prostitution takes place in them. The interests of the proprietors guard against this, as it would immediately cause the licenses to be revoked, and consequently close the place entirely. By placing the resorts of London prostitutes under this restriction, much would be gained, so far as the public decency of the streets and the transit of passengers are concerned but no possible check would be imposed on the ravages of disease. The proposition at the meeting to license the brothels would do this, but, as was anticipated by the speaker, quote, it would be very distasteful to the religious public, end quote, and the act of recognition would be immediately construed as an act of approval, or at least of sanction. That it would not merit the censure must be evident. The only approval or sanction given to the vice would, in fact, consist in saying to the keepers of houses of ill fame, We shall not attempt to close your doors, for we know that would be impossible, but we shall claim the right of entry at any moment to watch your proceedings. It has ever been an unquestioned policy to choose the least of two evils when you must take one, and if the British government should ever license brothels, they will certainly adopt the theory. To the population of London, less danger would inure from this toleration than from the unknown, unwatched courtesans who haunt their streets. Many an apparently respectable man will follow a woman into a house of prostitution when it is conducted quietly and furtively, who would hesitate before he accompanied her into a known and licensed brothel. While many a stranger who may date his physical ruin, and possibly the loss of character and honor, from the hour when he entered a private house of prostitution, would be saved many a bitter memory had an official recognition of its true character met him on its threshold, and intimated that it was the resort of the abandoned and vicious. In London, as in New York, we do not believe that illicit sexual intercourse can be carried to any greater extent than it is now, so no danger of an increase of vice need be apprehended there from any measures calculated to remove some of the ulterior and fatal effects of dissipation. In contrast to the public display of immorality in the streets of London is the following description of prostitution in Paris. It is extracted from the foreign correspondence of a New York journal. Quote, Paris, Thursday, May 27, 1858. In a late letter on the subject of the turning boxes of the foundling hospitals, I spoke of the repugnance of Protestant communities to any official compromise with one sin in order even to destroy a greater. 
for that the secret reception of illegitimate children by the state does contribute enormously to the extinction of the crime of infanticide while it does not generally increase the number of these unfortunate children is too well shown by statistics to remain longer a question for discussion but we have another and a more striking example of this repugnance to a collusion with one evil in order to smother out another and a greater in the want of legislation in protestant countries on the subject of prostitution for many months as you know the municipality officers the church wardens and the journals of london have been excited over this very question of prostitution and no wonder one need but to leave paris and fall suddenly in the streets of london at an advanced hour of the evening to comprehend the excitement of its citizens on this subject to the frenchman crossing the channel is like crossing the river styx he falls suddenly into a pandemonium of street disorder and drunken licentiousness for which he is not prepared he recalls mary's terrible picture in nazim and does not find it overdrawn he sees nothing like this in his own city and he is surprised beyond measure for he has been taught to believe in the puritanism of protestant countries when an american or an englishman habituated to the revolting night scenes of new york or london first arrives in paris he is astonished at the absolute absence of similar scenes in our streets he has perhaps arrived here with the impression most foreigners do that prostitution and revelry and drunken debauchery stalk forth in the day and render hideous the night but he forgets that he has arrived in a city where there are laws and a police to execute them in a city where refinement and the proprieties of life are carried to their extreme perfection and where such license and debauchery as prevails in english and american cities would be an absolute contradiction to the spirit and habits of the people the reader will please observe that i do not speak of the morals of the people but of their ideas of decorum and the proprieties of life of what is due to decency and an ordinary respect for appearances this extreme attention to appearances is in fact one of the principal attractions of a residence in paris the city is not only maintained free of inanimate filth but of animate filth as well at least you are not forced to see it if you do not wish to in london no lady dare walk out unattended after eight o'clock in the evening and after eleven o'clock she will have her eyes and ears insulted no matter how well attended while in paris she may remain in the streets to any hour of the night and neither have her eyes offended nor her ears insulted how is this happy result accomplished in eighteen fifty one the official register of the police of paris showed forty three hundred public girls on its books the number now may be stated at five thousand these girls and the houses in which they live are subjected to a series of stringent laws which renders them innoxious and inoffensive to the community the police adopting the principle that since it is impossible to suppress the evil it should be rendered as inoffensive to the public eye and to the public salubrity as possible all these houses are obliged to be closed at eleven o'clock precisely the girls are obliged to remain in the house and the windows are always covered with blinds night and day a few girls are permitted here and there to walk up and down in front of their door from seven to eleven o'clock precisely but it is against the law to accost the passers-by the houses are visited once a week by a medical and an ordinary inspector real inspectors appointed by government and not humbugging ward politicians another class of girls and much the larger class are those who frequent the public balls concerts and theatres girls who live alone in public lodging houses and who for the most part are not enrolled on the police books nor submitted to the ordinary sanitary regulations but this class are no more permitted than the rest either in the street or at their favorite evening resorts to accost people for the purposes of commerce the streets and the public balls are full of policemen and citizens dress whose business it is to detect such girls as violate the law in regard to addressing people and to put their names on the police books thus requiring them to take out a license and to submit to all the police regulations on the new class to which they have entered as a girl regards herself as forever lost when her name is once placed on the police book and as she never knows when an officer's eye may be upon her 
she takes good care to violate as rarely as possible this law prohibiting solicitations in public. This class are always elegantly dressed. It is notorious, even, that they are the first to initiate and to propagate those very fashions which make the tour of the world as the latest Paris modes. Many of them are reserved and elegant in their manners, and require a punctiliousness of etiquette which would not be out of place in the most aristocratic saloon. But one of the great aids to the Paris police in the maintenance of public decency in this class is the fact that they do not use strong drinks. A drunken public woman is never seen. As liquor is the greatest debaser of mankind, this one fact strikes out a marked line of distinction between this class here and in England and the United States. The great majority do not lose their self-respect, and they take good care of their health, hoping later on to reform and get married. This is here the rule, whereas in England and the United States they throw themselves away as rapidly as possible. It is thus that the fashionable promenades of Paris, the public balls, and the gardens even, may be frequented by ladies and children at all hours of the evening and night without once seeing any of those offensive movements of public women so common in the streets of English and American cities. Contrast this state of things with that of London. Let the reader, if he has ever lived there, recall to the mind the Strand, the Haymarket, Piccadilly, Leicester Square, and Regent Street, the fashionable business quarters of the city. One hesitates to enter upon a description of such a scene. It refreshes his historical recollections of the decadence of Rome. His name should be Plato to look upon such sights. The streets swarm with drunken and foul-spoken young girls, often mere children, and when I say swarm, I mean that you have to push your way to get through them. Is it then strange that the citizens of London should feel scandalized at this state of things, or that its journals or its church wardens should seek to find a remedy for the nuisance? They will think of everything else before they arrive at the simple, effective, and beautifully working Paris system, because they are a Protestant people and must not compromise with a sin. It must be left to find its own level. Honorable citizens must consent to allow their sons, often their families, to come in contact with these demoralizing, stony-hearted horrors of the streets. They must suffer individually and as a community from the vile tendencies of street prostitution, because they hesitate to legalize it and to give it over to the care of the police. To see the finest evening promenades of a Protestant and Christian city given up exclusively to the unutterable shames and horrors of street prostitution is a problem in the catalogue of inconsistencies which Catholic and infidel France cannot fathom. In France, the law acts on the principle that for a public woman to be seen in the street is an insult to public taste, and hence, when it is necessary for these girls to be conveyed to prison, to the hospital, or to the dispensary of the prefecture of police, they are mounted in closed carriages constructed for the purpose, or when by hazard they are obliged to take a public fiacre, they are required to keep the blinds down. You may say what you please about the surface morality of the French, but their respect for the public eye does honor to their civilization, and their law on this evil would be well adopted elsewhere. There is no truer principle in civil government than that the moral sores of society should be hidden as much as possible from the public view, for it is now too late in the day to combat the maxim long ago put in print by Pope, that vice is propagated by a familiarity with it. The French law may be culpable in permitting masked balls and the keeping of concubines, but these are affairs that belong to the interior, which the public need not see if they do not wish to. The important distinction is that the French law does not compel an honest father of a family, in returning from church or theatre, to push his way through mobs of drunken lewd women who salute his children's ears with language they ought never to hear. In one of its last articles on the general subject of prostitution, the London Times makes some judicious remarks which are completely verified in the same class as Paris. Thus the Times declares that the proper method of diminishing the number of these unfortunates, for to think of eradicating the evil is an illusion, is not by missionary efforts directed to them, but rather to their poor parents. For these poor girls were raised in sin, and never made a fall. The same thing holds good here. Ninety-five hundredths of all the public women of Paris are born and raised in filthiness of mind and body. At the age of ten, 
twelve and fourteen years, they are already prostitutes and thieves, and when they get their first silk dress, their first fine toilette, earned in their shameful profession, they take a step higher in the scale of morality. For then they cease to steal, they acquire a certain degree of pride in their conduct, they are more respectful and decently behaved. So that, paradoxical as it may seem, the immense majority of the public women of Paris, instead of making a fall, have actually been promoted in the scale of morality. But all these women know nothing else than the life in which they have been raised. They are fit for nothing else. They are incorrigibly averse to all the moral suasion that can be addressed to them, and the real remedy is an enlightenment of the parents of such children, a general improvement in the moral tone of the lowest classes. In fine, if it is an evil which cannot be eradicated, if the children of beggars and rag-pickers and concierge will fall into evil-doing, it is right to protect society at least from the public demonstration of their vile occupation by the passage of effective police laws. End of section 61 Recording by Ramon Escamilla Conway, Arkansas R-A-M-O-N E-S-C-A-M-I-L-L-A dot wordpress dot com Section 62 of The History of Prostitution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ramon Escamilla The History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 62 Chapter 37 New York Remedial Measures, Part 4. As an indication that the sentiments advanced in this chapter are entertained by others of the medical profession, and as endorsing our views to a considerable extent, the reader's attention is requested to the annexed report adopted at a special meeting of the Medical Board of Bellevue Hospital, New York, in reply to interrogatories addressed to them by Isaac Townsend, Esquire, President of the Board of Governors of the Almshouse, by whose direction they are embodied in this work, and also to a report from H. N. Whittlesey, M.D., resident physician of the nursery hospital, Randall's Island, on the same subject. Copy. Quote, report of the Medical Board of Bellevue Hospital in reply to interrogatories of Isaac Townsend, Esquire, President of the Board of Governors of the Almshouse upon Constitutional Syphilis. Office of the Governors of the Almshouse, Rotunda, Park, New York, August 24th, 1855. To the Medical Board, Bellevue Hospital. Gentlemen, I am led to believe that a large number of the inmates of Bellevue Hospital are affected with syphilis in some of its many forms, and believing that the governors of the almshouse are called upon to take measures to remove, as far as possible, the cause of this great malady, to dry up the sources of an evil which prevails so extensively, saps the health and taxes the wealth of the city, etc., largely, and believing farther that if the vice cannot be stayed, humanity, as well as policy, would suggest that the dangers which surround it can be lessened. I propose a few interrogatories tending toward the accomplishment of this great object, desiring your views upon them in reply as early as 1st of October. 1. What percentage of the total number of patients admitted to Bellevue Hospital suffer directly or indirectly from syphilis? 2. Are there not patients admitted to Bellevue Hospital whose diseases are attributable to the taint of syphilis, and have not many of the inmates been forced to place themselves under treatment therein, and thus become dependent on the city from being unfitted in body and mind for the ordinary duties of life in consequence of syphilitic diseases? 3. Are not the children of parents thus affected unhealthy? 4. What means, in your opinion, could be adopted to eradicate or lessen the disease in the city? By giving the above queries your earliest attention, you will greatly oblige your very obedient servant. Isaac Townsend, President. End quote. At a special meeting of the Medical Board of Bellevue Hospital, held December 18, 1855, the following report, 
in answer to a letter from Isaac Townsend, Esquire, President of the Board of Governors of the Alms House, dated August 24, 1855, touching the subjects of syphilis and prostitution, was read by Dr. Alonzo Clark, Chairman of the Committee appointed by the Medical Board to consider and reply to said letter. On motion, the report was accepted and ordered for transmission to the President of the Board of Governors, after having received the signatures of the President and Secretary. John T. Metcalf, M.D., Secretary Pro Tem to the Medical Board of Bellevue Hospital. New York, December 1855. Report on Prostitution and Syphilis. To Isaac Townsend, Esquire, President of the Board of Governors of the Alms House. In answer to your inquiries, the Medical Board of Bellevue Hospital respectfully reply that they caused a census of the hospital to be taken on the 24th October last for the purpose of ascertaining what proportion of the patients had suffered from venereal diseases. From that enumeration, they learned that out of 477 persons then under medical and surgical treatment, 142, or about one-third, had been so affected. In the several divisions of the house, the numbers are as follows. Videla said, of 72 females on the surgical side, 17, or 1 in 4.24. Of 130 females on the medical side, 17, or 1 in 8, nearly. Of 118 males on the medical side, 45, or 1 in 2.6. Of 127 males on the surgical side, 63, or 1 in 2 so that out of 245 males then under treatment, 108, or 1 in 2.27, had had some form of venereal disease, and among 202 females, 34, or 1 in 6, had been similarly affected. Of the whole number who confessed that they had had afflictions of this class, 106 had had syphilis, and 36 had had gonorrhea. Of the 106 who had had syphilis, Fifty-three, or just one-half, were still laboring under the influence of the poison with which they had been inoculated, in many instances, years before. As almost all these patients were admitted for other diseases, or with affections which the physician alone would recognize as the remote effects of syphilis, it is perhaps fair to assume that they represent, with some exaggeration, the class of society from which they come. The board has been favored with the census of the New York Hospital, Broadway, taken for the purpose of ascertaining the proportion of syphilitic cases among the patients of that institution, from which it appears that the whole number of patients on the 8th of December was 233, and that 99 of that number had had venereal disease, and 37 were then under treatment for the same affections recently contracted. Counting the old cases alone, most of which were admitted, probably, for other diseases, this proportion considerably exceeds that above recorded for Bellevue Hospital, it being as high as 1 in 2.35. It is proper, however, in this connection, to state that the returns for Bellevue Hospital are believed to be incomplete. They are based in a considerable degree on the confessions of the patients, and it is known that many, especially among the women, have denied any contamination when facts, subsequently developed, have shown that their statements were not true. Is it to be believed, then, that one in three, or even one in four, of that large class of our population, whose circumstances compel them to seek the occasional aid of medical charities, are tainted with venereal poison? This the medical board do not think they are authorized to state. But the facts here cited, and others within their reach, justify them in saying that venereal diseases prevail to an alarming extent among the poor of the city. The large number of women sent by the police courts to be treated for these diseases at the penitentiary hospital would alone be sufficient evidence of this. Yet such persons constitute but a small proportion of those who, even among the poor, suffer from these disorders. Dispensary physicians, and those in private practice, can show a much longer list of victims of impure intercourse. But the disease is not confined to this class. The advertisements which crowd the newspapers, introduced by men who confine their practice to one class of disease, 
in which they have treated twenty thousand cases, more or less, demonstrate how large is the company of irregulars who live and grow rich on the harvest of these grapes of Sodom. And yet their long list of unfortunates would disclose but a fraction of the evil among those who are able to pay for medical services. The medical board are unable to state what proportion of the income of regular and qualified physicians in this city is derived from the treatment of venereal diseases, but they know it is large, and that many who never advertise their skill receive more from this source than from all other sources together. They believe that there is no one among the avoidable diseases, however prevalent, for the treatment of which the well-to-do citizens of New York pay one-half so much as they pay to be relieved from the consequences of their illicit pleasures. The city bills of mortality give little information regarding the frequency of venereal affections. Louis Venaria keeps its place in the tables, and counts its score or two of deaths annually. Although this class of disorders is not frequently fatal, except among children, it is credited with only a fraction of the work it actually performs. The physician does not feel called upon, in his return of the causes of death, to brand his patient's memory with disgrace, or to record an accusation against near relatives. During infancy, the real disease is buried under such terms as marasmus, atrophia, infantile debility, or inflammation, while in adults, inflammation of the throat, phagedina, ulceration, scrofula, and the like take responsibility of the death. These affections are strictly what the advertised denominate them, private diseases. A leprosy which the unfortunate always strives to conceal, and, so long as it spares his speech and countenance, usually succeeds in concealing. The physician is his only confidant, and the physician refers all to the class of innocent secrets, which are not to be revealed. The public, therefore, know little of the prevalence of such diseases, and still less of the fearful ravages they are capable of making. Still, as has been just said, syphilis is not often the immediate cause of death in adults. After its first local effects are over, and these, though generally mild, are sometimes frightful, the poison lingers in the system, ready to break out on any provocation in some one of its many disgusting manifestations, often deforming and branding its victim threatening life and making it a burden, and yet refusing the poor consolation of a grave. Like the vulture which fed on the entrails of the too amorous Titius, it tortures and consumes, but is slow to destroy, and often its visible brand, like the scarlet badge once worn by the adulteress, proclaims a lasting disgrace. The protracted suffering of mind and body produced by this class of distempers the ever-changing and often loathsome form of their secondary accidents, and the almost eradicable character of the poison seem almost to justify an old opinion, sanctioned by a papal bull as late as 1826, that these diseases are an avenging plague, appointed by heaven as a special punishment for a special sin. The relentless character of syphilitic diseases stands out in painful relief in its transmission from parent to offspring. Here it is, indeed, that the children's teeth are set on edge, because the fathers have eaten sour grapes. The contaminated husband or wife is left through years of childlessness or of successive bereavements to mourn over early follies, and to repent when repentance is fruitless. The syphilitic man or woman can hardly become the parent of a healthy child. A young man has imbibed the contagion. It has become constitutional. After a few weeks, or months perhaps, of treatment, the visible signs of the disease no longer torment him. He has contracted a matrimonial alliance, and soon marries a healthy and virtuous woman. He flatters himself that he is cured. A few months suffice to give him painful proof of his error, for then his growing hopes of paternity are suddenly blasted. Instead of the child of his hopes, he sees a shriveled and leprous corpse. This is but the first in a series of similar misfortunes. He has poisoned the fruit of his loins, and again and again, and still again, it falls withered and dead. At length, 
nature seems to have triumphed over this foe to domestic happiness and the parents hearts are gladdened by the sight of a living child their joy is short-lived the child is feeble and sickly and in a few days or weeks another death is added to the penance list of the humbled and grieving father this mournful story will need no essential changes in the narration should the poison of impure intercourse legitimate or illicit linger in the veins of the mother a child of such a connection may be born in apparent health but before six months have passed some one of the numerous forms of infantile syphilis will be likely to appear and threaten its life in the contest which follows between disease and treatment the physician is commonly victorious but the contest is in many cases protracted and often it is to be renewed again and again and after all it is not believed that children thus tainted at their birth often grow up and acquire that degree of health and vigor which is properly ascribed to a good constitution these are facts familiar to physicians practicing in large towns but the history of inherited syphilis is not complete if in the case just recited the wife escaped contamination from her husband and her unborn child yet the sad consequences of that husband's folly are not yet exhausted that tainted child now a sickly nursling at her breast has a venom in its ulcerated lips which can inoculate the mother with its own loathsome poison while it draws its sustenance from the sacred fountain of infantile life but this is not all these little innocents sometimes spread their disease through the whole circle of those who bestow on them their care and kindness the contagion spreads through the use of the same spoon the same linen and even by that highest token of affection a kiss it has been known that a single diseased child has contaminated its mother a hired nurse and through that nurse the nurse's child and in addition to these the husband's mother and the mother's sister such are sometimes the weighty consequences of a single error prevention that the great source of the venereal poison is prostitution requires no argument the first question then to be answered is can prostitution be prevented in answering this question it is necessary to remember that the history of the world demonstrates the existence of this vice in all ages and among all nations since the day its first pages were written the appetite which incites it has always been stronger than moral restraints stronger than the law no rigor of punishment no violence of public denunciation neither exile nor the dungeon nor yet the disgusting malady with which nature punishes the practice has ever effected its extermination even for a single year great as this evil has always been it cannot be denied that in our own time some of the accidents of what is called the progress of society tend at least in large towns greatly to increase it the expenses of living are everywhere the great obstacle to early marriages whether such expenses be positively necessary or be demanded by the social position of the individual the fashion of his class and therefore become relatively necessary wherever these expenses increase more rapidly than the rewards of labor marriage becomes impossible for a constantly increasing number or can only be purchased at the price of social position but abstinence from marriage does not abolish or moderate the natural appetites the great law of nature on which the existence of the race depends is not abrogated by any artificial state of society moral or religious principles will restrain its operation in some human laws in some the fear of consequences in some yet there always have been and probably always will be many of both sexes who are not restrained by any of these considerations these have sustained and probably will continue to sustain not only prostitution but houses of prostitution in the face of every human law suppressed in one form it immediately assumes another again pursued it retreats to hiding places where darkness and secrecy protect it from the pursuer severe penalties have heretofore only increased the evils of prostitution if a hundred women are consigned to prison for this vice today before a month has elapsed a hundred more have taken their places and the hundred though punished are not reformed impelled by a love of their profession 
or some by the passion to emulate the more fortunate of their sex in the finery of dress, a passion which first occasioned their fall, many by want, and all by a sense that they are outcasts, they are no sooner liberated than they return with new zeal to the life from which they have been detained only by force. Severe laws compel secrecy, they can do no more. When prostitution is criminal, disease, if known to others, is a practical conviction. Under such circumstances, the contaminated will be slow to confess disease, and so subject themselves to punishment. Yet their passions and their necessities alike forbid even temporary abstinence. They spread disease without limit. Under this fact lies an important thought. Were it no more disgraceful to contract syphilis than it is to have fever and ague, the diseased would seek early relief, which is nearly equivalent to certain relief, and the disorder would soon be confined to the pitiable few who have lost in drunkenness and misery the instinctive dread of all that is foul and disgusting in personal disease. Prostitution, it is true, would then be restored to its old Roman dignity, yet venereal disease could then be reached and all but eradicated. But a respectable syphilis does not belong to our age and nation. It lost caste in the beginning, and its exploits in modern times have not been of a character to win it friends. The supposition aims only to show, by contrast, the evils of well-intended but probably injudicious legislation. Regarding pains and penalties, if the whip, confiscation, and banishment in the hands of Charlemagne and St. Louis, aided by a right good will and all the powers of a military despotism, could not suppress prostitution, or even prevent the opening of houses of prostitution, if penal laws in Europe, from the days of these earnest princes until now, have utterly failed of their object, as they notoriously have, it is fair to ask how much more can prohibitory laws accomplish in a country where the right of private judgment and personal liberty in speech and action are the very foundation of the body politic. They have hitherto been ineffectual. In spite of such laws, the vice is increasing. In consequence of such laws, its most enormous physical evil is extending its baleful influence through every rank and circle of society. It is still emphatically the plague of the poor. It still brings sorrow and misery to the firesides of the affluent and the title. A utopian view of the perfectibility of man might look for the remedy to this evil in universal early marriages, in domestic happiness, and in a universal moral sense which will compel men and women to keep their marriage vows. But taking man as he is, we find the tides of society set with constantly increasing strength against early marriages, that domestic happiness is not synonymous with marriage, whether early or late, and that the moral sense which should teach all men to observe even their solemn promises would be miraculous. For these things the law has done all that has been thought wise to attempt, probably all that it can do. But it may be asked, if government has the power to relieve society of the vice of drunkenness, why despair of its power regarding prostitution? In reply, it may be asked if the drunkard himself is ever cured of his vicious appetite by penalties. The statute despairs of this. It even recognizes its inability to prevent the sale of intoxicating drinks while they exist. It therefore claims the right to seize and destroy them. Can it seize on and destroy the inborn passion which fills and supports houses of prostitution? Then it cannot do for the one what it hopes to do for the other. Again, the suppression of slavery and the slave trade have been cited in this connection as illustrating the power of law. In trespass, theft, violence, or fraud, someone is wronged, and those who have been injured seek to bring the offender to justice. Here there is no aggrieved person. All who are in interest are so in interest that they deprecate the interference of all law, except what they claim to believe is the law of nature. But is there no hope in the societies of moral reform? For the suppression, or even checking, of the general vice, none whatever. The association in New York deserves much praise for its zealous benevolence. They have brought back some of these erring women to the paths of virtue, 
but they have done no more to stop the current of prostitution than he could do to dry up the current of the Hudson, who dips water with a bucket. In truth, it may be said that the paths of virtue have been found to be slippery places for some that would be thought converts. Wisdom's ways have been found too peaceful for these daughters of excitement. This is said in no spirit of disparagement to the efforts of the society. They may well be proud of what they have done. But it is said to show how little the kindest and the best can do to reclaim those who have once fallen from virtue and honor. Let the great fact, then, be well understood, that prohibitory measures have always failed, and, from the nature of the case, must forever fail to suppress prostitution. Let this additional fact, illustrated in the foregoing remark, be well considered, that penalties do not reform the offender, but that they enforce secrecy in the offense, and silence regarding its consequences, which is a chief cause of the present wide diffusion of the venereal poison. What, then, is the proper province of legislation in this important matter? The wise lawgiver does not attempt impossibilities. He knows that laws which experience has demonstrated cannot be enforced teach disrespect and disobedience to all law. He knows that human passions cannot be changed by human legislation. He knows that, if he attempt the impossible greater in the control of vice, he is certain to neglect the possible and important less. He knows that the river will not cease to flow at his command. If it overflows and desolates, he raises its banks and dikes in the flood to prevent a general inundation. For hundreds of years the governments of Europe have tried in vain to dry up the sources of prostitution. With the opening of the present century, they began to dike in the river and prevent avoidable mischief. For a long time, we too have had laws against prostitution, which, with every proper effort on the part of those in authority, have proved as useless as those who live by this illicit traffic could desire, as mischievous and spreading disease as the quack advertiser could wish. Is it not time, then, to inquire whether we have not attempted too much, whether, if we attempt less, we shall not accomplish more? May we not be able to limit and control what we have not the power to prevent? If we cannot do all that a large benevolence might wish to accomplish, in the name of humanity, is it not our duty to do what is useful and practicable, all that is possible? While the medical board are persuaded that by a change of policy, such as is suggested by the facts and reasons herewith submitted, much can be done to limit and control prostitution, and much more toward the eradication of venereal diseases, they are not yet prepared to offer the details of a plan by which they hope these important ends can be attained. With the assistance of the Board of Governors, they are now in correspondence with the medical officers of many of the larger cities of Europe, where restrictive measures have replaced prohibitory. When they have obtained the information which they hope this correspondence will furnish, they will ask leave to submit a supplementary report. John W. Francis, M.D., President. John T. Metcalf, M.D., Secretary Pro Tem. Note, it is believed that not far from 10% of the inmates of Bellevue Hospital are admitted for affections, which have their origin remotely in venereal disease. A certain form of rheumatism, certain inflammations of the throat, eyes, bones and joints, stricture and cutaneous eruptions are the most common diseases of this class. What proportion, if any, of those who suffer from scrofula and scrofulous inflammations, from consumption and other chronic diseases, owe their present illness to a constitutional syphilitic vice, inherited or acquired, there are no means of determining satisfactorily. Medical Board, Bellevue Hospital, New York. John W. Francis, M.D., President. Isaac Wood, M.D. John T. Metcalf, M.D. Alonzo Clark, M.D. Benjamin W. McCready, M.D. Isaac B. Taylor, M.D. George T. Elliott, M.D. B. Fordyce Barker, M.D. Valentine Mott, M.D. 
Alexander H. Stevens, M.D. James R. Wood, M.D. Willard Parker, M.D. Charles D. Smith, M.D. Louis A. Sayer, M.D. John J. Crane, M.D. John A. Liddell, M.D. Stephen Smith, M.D. Copy. Quote. Report of Dr. H. N. Whittlesey, resident physician of Randall's Island, in answer to certain queries of Isaac Townsend, Esquire, Governor of the Alms House, upon constitutional syphilis. New York, November 28, 1855. Dear Sir, From repeated conversations with you, I am led to believe that many diseases incidental to the children on Randall's Island may properly be traced to parents who are affected with constitutional syphilis. Please give me your views as to the following questions as early as 10th December. 1. Among the children under your care, to what extent does inherited syphilis exist? 2. Under what form does constitutional syphilis present itself? and what diseases are attributable to its taint. 3. Are not the children of parents thus affected unhealthy, scrofulous, subject to diseases of the eye, joints, etc.? Very respectfully, Isaac Townsend, Governor, A.H. Dr. H. N. Whittlesey, Resident Physician, R.I. Randall's Island, December 24, 1855. Isaac Townsend, Esquire, President of the Board of Governors of the Almshouse. Dear Sir, in regard to the interrogatories contained in your note of a recent date on the subject of hereditary syphilis, I have the honor to reply. 1. Regarding its prevalence. It is a matter of record that nine-tenths of all diseases treated in this hospital during the past five years have been of constitutional origin and for the most part hereditary. These diseases assume a variety of forms, and involve nearly every structure of the body, terminating in cachexia, marasmus, phagedina, etc., etc. The exact proportion which hereditary syphilis bears to this sum of constitutional depravity cannot be stated with accuracy for the following reasons. Children are admitted to this institution between two and fifteen years of age, thus throwing out of the category infantile syphilis in all its forms, and except in few cases, showing none of its specific characteristics, having been modified by appropriate treatment, but manifests itself by general constitutional depravity, and determines a great variety of diseases, embracing nearly every form of skin disease, affection of the mucous membranes and their dependencies, diseases of the eye and ear, of the bones, especially of joints, etc., proving the prolific and lamentable source of many of the diseases incident to children of the class presented in this institution. Making, then, due allowance for its masked form, in which the consequences of inherited syphilis appear in this institution, together with the absence of the previous history both of patients and parents, it is believed an approximate estimate may be made of the part which this malady bears to the sum of constitutional disease. From the foregoing facts, and from careful observation during the past few years in this branch of the almshouse department, it appears that human degradation is the source of the stream of pollution supplying this hospital with disease, and farther, that of all of the vices which make up the sum total of depravity, both moral and physical, prostitution and its consequences furnish the larger proportion. Here we have the sad picture presented of a large number of children doomed to an early grave, or to breathe out their miserable existence bearing a loathsome disease, carrying the penalties of vice of which they themselves are innocent, being a generation contaminated, and capable only of contaminating in turn. In the above sketch, I have confined my statement to syphilis as manifested in the nursery hospital, where the average number of cases of disease treated is about 2,000. From this field is excluded every variety of the disease except the one, viz., constitutional syphilis affecting children, after having been modified by treatment in the infant. H. N. Whittlesey, M.D. End quote. 
It has been stated already that the information obtained in the course of this investigation is, to a very great degree, undoubtedly reliable, but a few words more in reference to the same subject will not be out of place, if we consider the importance such information assumes when it is made the basis of serious deduction. These women were examined singly and alone, and a person who has been engaged for a number of years in any particular inquiry is able, by his experience, to judge whether his informants are speaking the truth in their replies. For this, among other reasons, we are satisfied that in almost every case there was no deception practiced, but that the answers obtained were true in all essential points. Another evidence of correctness is the degree of congruity that characterized the greater part of the replies. Farther than this, a reference to the questions themselves, as reprinted in Chapter 32 will show that they were so arranged that falsehoods would be easily detected unless very carefully contrived before the time of examination, of which those examined had no notice, and consequently no opportunity for fraud or deception could possibly exist. It is not denied that there were many difficulties to be encountered, although the mode of operation was simple. It may be briefly described as follows. The captain of each police district, and oftentimes the writer with him, explained his object to the keeper of the house, assuring her that there was no intention to annoy, harass, or expose her, and particularly that no prosecution should be based upon any information thus collected. This latter promise was supported by a letter from a high legal functionary, addressed to the mayor and police department, assuring them that the particulars they collected should not be used in any manner prejudicial to the women themselves as it was believed that a collection of the necessary information, required by such a work as the present, would be productive of good to the city. When satisfied upon the subject of prosecution, they were told that the real motive was to obtain correct particulars of prostitution without exposing individual cases, so as to enable the public to judge of its extent, and assist them in forming an opinion as to the necessity of arrangements which would ultimately become protective to our citizens at large as well as to housekeepers and courtesans, and many of the housekeepers expressed a hope that the design might be accomplished. Their interests, therefore, led them to speak the truth. In short, from the precautions taken, and from the result itself, very little doubt can be entertained as to the authenticity of the principal part of the replies on all essential points and upon this consideration these replies have been made the basis of the description and remarks upon prostitution in New York. The task is completed, and the reader's attention may be invited to the various facts substantiated, as embodied in the following. Recapitulation There are 6,000 public prostitutes in New York. The majority of these are from 15 to 25 years old, Three-eighths of them were born in the United States. Many of those born abroad came here poor, to improve their condition. Education is at a very low standard with them. One-fifth of them are married women. One-half of them have given birth to children, and more than one-half of these children are illegitimate. The ratio of mortality among children of prostitutes is four times greater than the ordinary ratio among children in New York. Many of these children are living in the abodes of vice and obscenity. The majority of these women have been prostitutes for less than four years. The average duration of a prostitute's life is only four years. Nearly one half of the prostitutes in New York admit that they are or have been sufferers from syphilis. Seduction, destitution, ill-treatment by parents, husbands, or relatives, intemperance, and bad company are the main causes of prostitution. Women in this city have not sufficient means of employment. Their employment is inadequately remunerated. The associations of many employments are prejudicial to morality. Six-sevenths of the prostitutes drink intoxicating liquors to a greater or less extent. Parental influences induced habits of intoxication. A professed respect for religion is common among them. 
A capital of nearly four millions of dollars is invested in the business of prostitution. The annual expenditure on account of prostitution is more than seven millions of dollars. Prohibitory measures have signally failed to suppress or check prostitution. A necessity exists for some action. Motives of policy require a change in the mode of procedure. End of section 62 End of The History of Prostitution by William Sanger